the boss. A Keeper at Heart Romance, Book 3. Written by Melissa McClone. Text copyright 2020 by Melissa McClone. Production copyright 2023 by Melissa McClone. For my blog readers, especially Amy, Brandy, Cat's Lady, Drew, Jane, Limecello, Natalie, Roddy underscore Mom, Sarita, Tori, and Virginia, whose daily comments kept me smiling while I finished writing this book. Special thanks to Robin Barrett, MD, Roxanne, and Brian Coyne, Greg Taylor, Virginia Cantra, Terry Reed, and my family. Prologue I knew this internship was the chance of a lifetime, but I never thought I'd make so many wonderful friends. As the scents of beer and grease wafted in the air at the Hare and Stag pub, Cheney Sullivan raised a pint of ale in honor of the twelve co-workers sitting around the table for her going-away party. Her chest tightened, knowing she was leaving London and these people. I'll miss you all so much. Just wait until we show up on your doorstep, wanting to go sightseeing. Gemma, who rented a room to Cheney, tossed her mane of blonde hair behind her shoulder. You won't miss us then. Disneyland, Universal Studios, Beverly Hills, Venice Beach. The thought of seeing these people sooner rather than later brought a ball of warmth to the center of Cheney's chest. She set her glass on the table. If any of you visit Los Angeles, I'm happy to play tour guide. Does that include me? A deep male voice said from behind her. The familiar Welsh accent filled her stomach with butterflies. The flapping of their wings matched the speed of her pulse. She stood, turned, and faced Drake Lulin, CEO of Dragon Lulin Limited. The top of her head came to his chin, and she stared up at him. His glossy magazine model good looks and athletic build, hidden beneath an expensive tailored suit, always brought oohs and aahs from females. His way of making each employee feel as if they were the key to his company's success had earned him the gratitude of all who worked for him, regardless of gender. But in Cheney's opinion, his can-do attitude and work ethic made the man. Only 30, 8 years older than her, he'd built Dragon Lulin into a successful multinational corporation with a global portfolio of media and telecommunications businesses using a combination of raw sweat and street smarts. Her smile widened with admiration. She couldn't help herself. He looked every inch a power broker, except for his hair. In the past three months, his neatly trimmed, corporate style had grown into dark wavy locks, nearly brushing his collar, making him look more rakish than respectable. She'd imagined running her fingers through his hair more than once. She'd imagined herself doing a lot of things with him none of which had anything to do with her internship responsibilities. He raised a brow as if waiting for an answer. Which he was, she realized. Drake Lulin didn't like waiting for anything or anyone. During her four-month internship in the mergers and acquisitions department, she'd learned that much about him. Cheney lifted her chin, acting bolder than she felt. The beer, she wondered, or maybe the realization she would be an ocean and continent away from him tomorrow night. Of course, it includes you, Mr. Lulin. Drake, he corrected. As of an hour ago, your internship ended. You no longer work for me. His warm brown eyes with golden flecks gazed into hers, making Cheney feel as if she were the next special project he wanted to tackle. Her insides quivered. Not that he would, given the bevy of beautiful women he dated and the supermodel deemed his girlfriend du jour by the media. But the thought raised Cheney's temperature 10 degrees. If this were a birthday celebration instead of a going-away party, she knew what she'd wish for when blowing out the candles. Drake. She forced the name from her parched throat, feeling more like a tweener with her first crush than a 22-year-old woman. Okay, she had a massive crush on him, as did every other female who worked at the company and most women who breathed, no matter what age or marital status. The man was a catch. His chiseled cheekbones and jaw tempted a woman to reach out and touch them. His full lips hinted at long, hot kisses. And his bank account promised a life free from financial worry. Prince Charming had nothing on Drake Lulin. He was King Midas and Adonis rolled into one. Who wouldn't want to be the woman who captured his heart? 
Make a note of our new travel guide in Southern California, Jim, he said in that half-teasing, half-serious tone Cheney had come to know and love. With a new cable channel in our portfolio, we may spend more time there. Adoration filled Gemma's gaze. She, too, had fallen under the spell of the dragon, Drake's nickname in the office. She batted her lashes and flashed a smile. Already noted, sir. Very good. His easy grin crinkled the corners of his eyes. Cheney bit back a sigh. She'd been longing for the unattainable, okay, her boss, since she met him on the third day of her internship. Gemma scooted an empty chair to the table, right between hers and Cheney's. Everyone else seemed more interested in filling their pints than staring at their gorgeous boss. But we're not here to watch football on the telly. Drake motioned to the half-filled glasses and plates of French fries. A bon voyage party needs more than beer and chips. I'll be right back. He strode away and spoke to the bartender. Soon appetizers, champagne bottles, and glasses arrived. The table resembled a buffet. Leave it to Mr. Lulin, make that Drake. Now we can send Cheney home to the States in style, he said with a satisfied smile. A barmaid handed her a glass of champagne. This is so, Cheney felt as light and carefree as the bubbles floating to the top of her glass, but she didn't want to sound starstruck even if she felt that way inside. Thoughtful of you, sir. Thank you. It's the least I can do after the hard work and long hours you've put in these past months, especially with the acquisition of the cable channel. Drake raised his glass. To Cheney, who will be missed. Her co-workers held up their champagne flutes and repeated the cheer. The party was more of a send-off than she could imagine. Tears stung Cheney's eyes, and her tongue felt two sizes too big. She muttered her gratitude and sipped the bubbly. He handed her a white handkerchief, the kind her grandfather had kept in his back pocket. She never thought a younger man would carry one, too. The chivalrous, old-fashioned gesture brought another well of tears. Drake Llewellyn was almost too good to be true. As Cheney dabbed her eyes with the cloth, her friends attacked the food like a pack of starving hyenas. She didn't blame them. Everything looked delicious and smelled tasty, too. Aren't you going to eat? Drake asked. She nodded. I'm trying to figure out what to try first. I know what I want. The shrimp? As he moved closer, his warm breath fanned her neck, and the male scent of him tickled her nose. Too much garlic. Cheney shivered, a combination of excitement and fear. She was used to swooning from afar, not up close and personal. Though they worked on the same floor, meetings, and conversations in the hallway were their only interactions. Still, she mustered her courage. So what appeals to you, Drake? You. The air whooshed from her lungs. She clenched her fists, digging her fingernails into her palms. Ouch. At least she wasn't dreaming. I, um. I've been watching you. He spoke softly, regarding her over his champagne glass. You're smart, hardworking, and beautiful. Don't go back to the States, Cheney. Stay here in London with me. Her heart beat in triple time. Who was she kidding? The hammering of that vital organ would take years off her life, but she didn't care. Drake Llewellyn wanted her to stay in London. He must have broken up with that supermodel. Anticipation danced through Cheney. Excitement, too. All the time she'd been dreaming about him, she had no idea he'd noticed her as more than just another in turn. Why didn't you say anything? You work for me. Or did, he corrected himself. I'm not in the habit of dating employees. None of her daydreams had been this good. Nothing in her life had made her feel so special. Cheney wiggled her toes but she'd better not get too far ahead of herself. You really want me to stay? Absolutely. Oh, well. She wanted to stay in London. With him. Mrs. Drake Llewellyn. She inhaled deeply and exhaled slowly. For how long? His brow slanted. For as long as we're both having fun. 
fun. She thought about his answer, repeated the words in her head. For as long as we're both having fun. Drake didn't want forever, he wanted to have fun. What he really wanted, she realized, was sex. And then, he would move on to the next woman who caught his eye, the same way he had in the month she'd worked for him, the same way he did with the companies he bought, restructured, and sold for a mega profit once the newness wore off. Disappointment ripped through Cheney. The legs of the pedestal she'd placed him on crumbled. She straightened. No more getting carried away where Drake was concerned. She pressed her toes firmly to the bottom of her boots. No more crush, either. She wasn't any man's plaything. What had she been thinking? Forget the guy being a catch. He might be gorgeous. He might be rich. But he probably still had a girlfriend, too. That would make him a cheater. Disgust slithered down her spine. Drake Llewellyn was nothing but a player, a man who went through a slew of women in the name of having fun. Sorry, Mr. Llewellyn. Cheney squared her shoulders. You're targeting the wrong girl. Short-term investments, however appealing, are too risky for me. I'm only interested in a long-term investment strategy. Chapter 1 Five years later Damsel in distress, here. Struggling to carry a heavy box, Cheney eyed the row of antique armor on display in the Great Hall of Abbotsford Castle. Hey, knights in shining armor. Can I get some help, please? The polished suits stood at attention, weapons in hand as if ready for battle, but not one moved. The story of her life. She laughed. Okay, Cheney didn't have the happily ever after she once thought she'd have, but she couldn't complain. Few people got to fly to London for three days and stay at a luxurious castle with all expenses paid while working as the associate producer on a highly rated cable channel show. This temporary position was the hands-on production experience her boss, Justin, said she needed if she wanted to have a shot at the promotion she'd been eyeing. Okay, dreaming about since the job notice appeared and she'd submitted an application. Knowing finance was one thing, but understanding how projects got made and being in the trenches on a set was another. That was why he'd allowed her to use personal time off to come to England this week. And she had one person to thank for the opportunity. Gemma. Her former roommate was counting on Cheney to make sure the taping of The Billionaire's Playground, a travel show profiling the vacation spots of the uber-wealthy, went off without a hitch. Gemma's job required her to look out for the cable channel's interest, to put out fires, and make sure the show stayed on budget and schedule. Cheney wouldn't let her friend down. The container full of electrical gear slipped in her sweaty hands. Her arm muscles strained against the weight. Her eyeglasses slid down her nose. Dropping the hefty box on the gleaming wood floor would be an expensive no-no, one that could have historical implications given the medieval age of the castle. She tightened her grip. May I help you, my lady? A male voice asked from behind her. The Welsh accent reminded her of her former boss, but Gemma thought another billionaire would host this episode because Drake had a previous engagement. Cheney had been relieved to know she wouldn't see him again. But plans could change at the last minute. Thank you. She rested the container against her bended knee. I should have borrowed a baggage cart or dolly. Allow me. She glanced back at her rescuer. A man wearing chain mail, black leather and armor plates on his shoulders, chest, and legs approached. And not just any man. Drake Lulin. Her breath caught in her throat. He looked like a knight from King Arthur's Round Table, not a billionaire businessman whose latest pet project had led him to host a travel show for his successful cable channel. She had to admit the costume suited him. Awareness fluttered through her, but she shut that down immediately. Too bad Drake Llewellyn wasn't a noble knight. He didn't follow any code of chivalry. His armor might be polished, but underneath was a tarnished partier. He walked toward her with the grace and agility of an athlete. His armor didn't slow him down one bit. Oh. She stiffened with apprehension. The costume must mean he was hosting this episode. 
which meant she would have to work with him for the next three days. Hello, Cheney. The warm sound of his voice seeped through her. He took the box out of her arms as if it weighed no more than a container of laundry detergent. She pushed her glasses back into place. Her tired and dry eyes from the long flight meant she'd taken out her contact lenses hours ago. Thanks. Thank you for coming at such short notice and filling in for Jem. He sounded sincere. Are you up to speed on this episode? Her heart thudded. Yes. Though at the moment, the show was the last thing on her mind. Of course, you are. Two familiar brown eyes, with gold flecks flickering like flames, stared into hers and sent Cheney's temperature soaring. His must hair made him look as if he'd just returned to the castle after a crusade and was ready to bed the first female who caught his eye. And that beard. She did a double take. You grew a beard. For the taping. Drake tilted his chin to provide a better view. Not as full as I'd hoped, but I thought a beard would look more knightly. It does. She usually preferred men without facial hair, but the mustache and beard, combined with the costume, made Drake look dark and dangerous. A black knight from an Arthurian tale who had his pick of maidens, courtesans, and queens. Cheney swallowed around the crown jewel-sized lump in her throat. Where would you like the box? he asked. The deep rumble, coupled with his accent, sent her stomach into doing cartwheels and a series of backflips like a gymnast during a floor exercise routine. The unexpected reaction put every nerve ending on alert. By the lights. Her voice sounded low, almost husky, and totally unnatural. The same odd way it felt to give Drake Lul in orders or feel the bolt of unwelcome attraction. She cleared her dry throat. Please place the box next to the lights. As he carefully set the box where one of tonight's scenes would be taped, chain mail clinked. The sound echoed through the cavernous hall until swallowed up by the tapestry-covered walls. Drake stood, looking taller than she remembered. She hadn't recalled his eyelashes being so thick and long, either. He seemed more handsome, if that were possible. Maybe she was more tired than she realized. Exhaustion could easily explain her reaction to him. His gaze raked over her. She crossed her arms over her chest. If I'd known we were supposed to dress up, I would have brought my beer wench costume. Drake laughed. It's been too long, Cheney. Five years, one month, and, she did a quick calculation, about five days. Not long enough, in her opinion. I'm only here as a favor for Gemma. It's still good to see you again. No way would she be charmed by him. Being enticed by his night get-up was bad enough. She straightened. I doubt you missed me. But I have. Not according to the tabloids. He adjusted a chainmail sleeve as if the leather pants, tunic, and armor were his daily attire, not a designer suit. You've been following me in the magazines? Not really. Just, when I'm in line at the grocery store. And drawn to the stories of Drake dating women as if they were library books to be checked out and returned before their due date. A leopard didn't change its spots, and so it seemed, neither did a dragon. Grocery shopping. For your family? Her chest tightened. Myself. Gemma told me you were engaged. He glanced at Cheney's left hand, at her bare ring finger, to be exact. I thought you'd be married by now. She did, too. Nope. Let me guess. You found the long-term investment strategy lacking. Her cheeks burned when she remembered what she'd said to him five years ago. If she'd known then. Who was she kidding? She wouldn't have done anything differently. No, Cheney admitted. He did. Drake reached his hand toward her, but she stepped away from him. Cheney. I'm not looking for sympathy, she interrupted. I got enough of that when Tyler, my ex-fiancé, broke up with me. I wasn't going to say I'm sorry because I'm not. The man is obviously an idiot. She bit back a smile. She'd forgotten how Drake could put things into perspective with only a few words. He married my sister. 
then your brother-in-law is an idiot. Cheney laughed. He is. You're too young to settle down. Well, I don't plan on settling down anytime soon. We have something in common. That makes two things, she said. Drake gave her a puzzled look. Gemma. Cheney picked up her clipboard from the top of the box. We have her in common. His eyes darkened. Yes, we do. We don't get together often, but thank goodness for the internet. I don't know what I would do without her. Me, neither. The emotion in the two words and the concern in his eyes caught her off guard. You know, Gemma will be fine. Her baby, too. I spoke with her after I arrived. She believes the bed rest is temporary, and with the way Oliver is spoiling her, she'll be good to go for the remainder of this season's tapings. Let's hope so, but until then, a smile touched Drake's lips. I have you. The approval in his gaze let Cheney know he liked what he saw. She wouldn't allow herself to care. Only on the set, she said crisply. Of course. His eyes laughed at her. Flustered, she clutched her clipboard. I'll keep things on schedule so you can catch your flight out of Heathrow. Gemma said that was important to the host, which appears to be you. Still the same industrious, competent Cheney. This arrangement should work out well. She lifted her chin. I think so. His lips curved into a full smile, showing two rows of straight, white teeth. He had a charming smile. I knew you'd go far, but I thought you would work with your father, not take your financial skills and go into show business. Well, my parents named me after Lon Chaney, she admitted. Lon Chaney, that old actor? They were diehard horror fans, but preferred the older black and white flicks to the newer slasher movies. She remembered how Drake had kept their conversations focused on business when she was an intern. Well, except for her going away party. I once called my mom mummy, and she gave me a cookie. That's weird, I know, but Cheney's better than Karloff or Lori. Though Bella might not have been too bad, she admitted. But despite my name, I got my first taste of television during my internship when you acquired the Dragon Network. That experience led me to the job at the studio where I work. It's amazing how an internship can change a career path. He had no idea. She nodded. And now you're in England working on the show we brainstormed. Her mouth gaped. She closed it. You remember? Your name is in the credits. That was a nice gesture, but it's not the same show we'd talked about. Maybe not, but the billionaire's playground wouldn't exist if not for that meeting you attended. His words meant a lot to her and echoed what Gemma had said. Thank you. So, how does it feel? Pretty cool. Cheney wiggled her toes. I remember watching the premiere episode and thinking, wow, our ideas turned into this. Though I never thought you'd host the show. Me, neither, he admitted. But I had a free weekend when they filmed the pilot. We hadn't found the right talent to host, and Jem said I should do it. I had fun, so I made it a regular gig. Lately, we've started using a few guest hosts, because my schedule has been full. Gemma told me you'd been growing your empire. That's what billionaires do. He winked. Do you have a favorite episode? The one with kite surfing on the coast of Greenland. That was an exciting one to tape. A few of the Silicon Forest billionaires took a vacation there and gave us the idea. Oh, right. The six tech billionaires from Portland, Oregon. Cheney had read about them. Who decided to use a medieval castle this weekend? Jem, after she nixed my idea of base, jumping in Norway. Good call, Cheney said. Previews of you in your night costume will bring in viewers and increase ratings more than you doing a crazy stunt. He raised a brow. You sound confident. It's my job to understand viewers and translate ratings into advertising revenue, she explained. All you have to do is look at yourself in one of the gilded mirrors around here. The night costume will be huge with female viewers. You may spawn a whole new following with Sir Dragon Knight. He laughed. 
and I thought women were only after my bank account. I'm sure there are those, too, but many are susceptible to the archetype of a knight. Even if they'd never admit it. Do you admit it? Well, I had a thing for knights when I was younger. Galahad was my favorite, but the whole fairy tale with a happy ending seems a bit outdated now. I don't need anyone to rescue me. I can do it myself. Even if she still dreamed of a happily ever after of her own someday. Very modern. Very practical. I am practical. She'd had to be. Anything wrong with that? Nothing at all. The devilish look in his brown eyes matched the grin on his face. I'm curious about how your practicality has affected your current investment strategy philosophy. Do you prefer short-term, long-term, or day trading? None of the above. She met his inquisitive gaze. I'm on hiatus from, investing. Chapter 2. Talk about a marathon shoot tonight. Drake had almost been grateful when the clock struck midnight and the chimes interrupted the taping. Of course, he was the executive producer as well as the host, or talent as the crew called it. He could have shut down production except he had a helicopter to catch on Sunday afternoon so he could make a flight at Heathrow. He didn't want to cause any delays. Hot lights shone on him. Sweat dripped down his armor-clad body. Even though Drake was wearing a costume, it was metal, not plastic. He would need a shower, and maybe a massage, when they finished. He knew who he wanted to help him with both. At the moment, Drake couldn't see Cheney Sullivan. He surveyed the drawing room looking for her, but with two cameras in front of him and the crew milling about behind them, he couldn't find her or even catch a glimpse of her caramel-colored hair. Maybe she stood in the back. The antique clock continued to chime. 10, 11, 12. Quiet. Finally. Okay, people. Milt, the director and producer, clapped his hands. Let's get this final scene wrapped up so we can call it a night. Drake was all for that. One second. Liz, the hair and makeup stylist who preferred soda to wine and pretzels to caviar, ran up to him. She fluffed, finger curled, and sprayed his hair, making him feel like a fancy show dog. She smiled, satisfaction filling her eyes. That's better. For her, maybe. At least the wardrobe stylist, Russell, didn't spit shine the armor. Instead, he buffed it with a soft, white cloth. We only need the last line, Milt said. Drake stretched his neck. No problem. That's what I like to hear. Milt's gaze narrowed. I only want you to do one thing differently this time. When you smile at the camera, make it count. Do what it takes so female viewers' ovaries explode. Drake grimaced. I'm a businessman, not an actor. You're neither of those things tonight. As Milt patted Drake's shoulder, his wedding ring clanged against the armor. You're Lancelot, knight and lover extraordinaire. Guinevere, your queen, is alone in the castle, wearing a tiny piece of lingerie, and watching you. Make her wish you were there with her. Drake fought the urge to roll his eyes. And laugh. He would never understand this part of the entertainment business. Still, doing the show was good publicity and PR for the channel and his company. He trusted his gut, and his instinct said to do what the director wanted. That was what Drake had done for the past two seasons and saw no need to change now. You're in charge, but let's hope Gwen's covered herself with a blanket. Castles can be drafty this time of year. The crew laughed. Even Milt cracked a smile. Liz came after Drake with the eyelash curler. I forgot something. Is that necessary again? he asked. She winked. Absolutely, Sir Lachalot. He grimaced, allowing her to do the deed while he readied himself for the scene. Holding a gold goblet precariously with his gauntlet-covered hand, he stood in front of an elaborately carved fireplace complete with an ornate coat of arms held by two lion-faced cherubim. Ready, Sir Lancelot? Milt asked. Drake nodded once. Milt looked at Tony, one of two cameramen on the crew. Let me know when you have speed. Are the mics working? Tony asked the audio person, who
who gave him the thumbs up. Speed. A few seconds later, Drake saw his cue. Showtime. Once he nailed this line, he would be free to do whatever he wanted. And he knew what, make that who, he wanted. Forget Guinevere. The adulterous queen had nothing on his new associate producer. An image of Cheney wearing her smart girl glasses flashed in his mind. He raised the goblet and smiled at the camera. And that's why Abbotsford Castle is one of this billionaire's favorite playgrounds. Luxurious and romantic, the castle would be the perfect place to play with Cheney. Five years hadn't changed the smart, pretty American's appeal. Drake still wanted to taste those full, pink lips of hers that had tempted him during her internship. He wanted to see how deep the adorable dimple on her left cheek went. He wanted a long, hard look at how her jeans cupped her bottom like a glove. Most of all, he wanted to know if she would turn him down again. Sorry, Mr. Lulin. You're targeting the wrong girl. He'd been sorry all right, because he'd imagine himself dating her. For real. Unlike the outings invented by the press each time they saw him talking to a supermodel or actress, but dinners and movies and trips to Paris kind of dating. But Cheney hadn't wanted him. Drake had thought about that night, about her, over the years. Now that he'd seen her again, and found out she wasn't married as he'd believed, he would try again. Before the weekend was over, he wanted to hear the word yes fall from Cheney's lips. A forgive me for rejecting you five years ago wouldn't be so bad either. He wanted to prove to himself he hadn't targeted the wrong girl. Far from it. Given the antics and partying that accompanied the production crew during their two and a half months on the road, he had high hopes. His smile widened. Milt counted down with his fingers. Five, four, three, two, one. Cut. That's a wrap, people. Milt adjusted his Dodgers baseball cap. Perfect, Drake. Keep smiling like that, and you'll be guaranteed a spot on this year's sexiest man alive list. Drake handed the goblet to Jesse, and in turn working on the show, and took a bottle of water from her. Thanks, but I'd rather top the richest man alive list. As he downed the water, the crew, including a few locals hired to help because of the castle's size and the amount of work involved in this episode, moved gear to prepare for tomorrow's shoot. The show had exclusive use of the grounds and interior for the next two days, so they didn't have to worry about tourists getting in the way. The castle staff had experience with film crews, so they would be no trouble. He handed his empty bottle to Jesse, who scurried away to who knew where. Funny, but Drake couldn't remember the last time he'd had to find a garbage can himself. Years ago, he'd dug through trash cans out of necessity for him and his dad. They'd had so little, each day more of a struggle than the last, yet his father kept them going, even though Drake wondered if his dad ever thought it might be futile. Not once, however, had his father complained. Even now, the man looked at his past with fondness, as if the darker times were best forgotten. Drake hadn't learned how to do that. If anything, the past spurred him to do better, so his future would never resemble the difficult times of his childhood. He would do whatever it took to give his dad a good life, one without financial worry or care, where he could have whatever his heart desired. Being able to do that for the man who loved him unconditionally, who'd suffered to raise him on his own, was worth more than any accolade, award, or media coverage. As he made his way past the lights and cameras being dealt with by Tony and Kyle, the other cameraman, Drake searched for Cheney. He found her standing in the doorway with her clipboard in hand and talking to the production coordinator. As he crossed the drawing room in her direction, desire rocketed through him. He'd appreciated Cheney's athletic figure before, but now her clothes accentuated fuller curves. Her long hair worn in braids or a ponytail had been charming on the college co-ed but the new sophisticated shoulder-length cut suited her face better. The most significant and intriguing change, though, was to her eyes. Not the glasses, but the maturity in the hazel-green depths. Cheney Sullivan was no longer a girl. She'd become a woman. A woman who was hard-working, confident, and, most importantly, smart. Her intelligence had always been the draw for him, even if he liked the package it came in, too. He slowed his approach until the production coordinator walked away. 
By then, most of the crew had left. Hello there. Hi. Cheney held her clipboard in front of her like a barrier between them. One he had every intention of breaking down. Great job tonight. Thank you. She stifled a yawn. Cheney should be in bed. That wouldn't stop him. Join me for a drink? I thought you didn't date employees. I don't. Ah. Uh -huh. She was considered an independent contractor, and her paycheck came from the cable channel, as did Gemma's, not his corporate office. So Cheney was fair game. You don't work for me. Not officially, but I'm... Tired? Exhausted. I'll let you go, then. But could you do a little something for me first, please? She readied her pen over her clipboard. Sure, what do you need? Staring into her eyes, he smiled. I need your help to get out of this costume. Chapter 3 Undress him? Cheney's heart pounded in her ears. Surely she misunderstood. You want me to? Help me out of this armor, Drake finished for her. I don't know where Russell ran off to, and you're the only one left. She glanced around the drawing room, now deserted. Where had everyone gone? The place had been bustling with activity a few minutes ago. An expectant look in his brown eyes, Drake stared at her. Face it. Gemma wouldn't think twice about helping him. Neither should Cheney. He'd made a reasonable request, and she was acting as if he'd asked her to spend the night. Sure, the man oozed sensuality, but just because he'd wanted her once didn't mean he wanted her now. Time to stop overreacting and do her job. She straightened. What do you want me to do first? Come with me. She fell in step with him, noticing he shortened his stride to match hers. He had lovely, rather old-world manners. She remembered the handkerchief he'd once offered her. Of course, that had been right before he propositioned her. Where are we going? she asked. To my room. Her heart bumped. Okay, Drake was inviting her to his room, but she didn't have to worry. Nothing besides ridding himself of the costume was on the agenda, hers and, she hoped, his. No worries. She'd heard he was staying in the king's bedchamber, and only a staircase led to the suite, not an elevator. He probably didn't feel like stripping out of the armor and carrying it upstairs. She wouldn't, either. Going up there with Drake was no big deal. She would help him out of the costume and then head to her room for some much-needed and well-earned sleep. She yawned. The jet lag had finally caught up with her. Will this take long? It shouldn't. Relieved, Cheney stepped through an arched doorway into a hallway of stone. Stone walls, floor, and ceiling surrounded her. Electric torches illuminated a circular staircase in front of her. She shivered. Those stone steps led to one place, Drake's room. Stop being melodramatic. No big deal, remember? She wouldn't be locked away in a tower cell with him. She was only there to help him undress. Cheney gulped. Drake gestured up the narrow stairs. After you. Thanks, but I don't know the way, she demurred. My flight was delayed, so I missed the taping of the guest rooms this morning. Is it true Henry VIII slept in the king's bedchamber? That's what they say. As Drake ascended, his armor and chain mail clanked. The sound echoed through the stairwell. He seemed to have slept his way across England. She followed him up. He did have six wives. Six too many. Divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived, Cheney repeated the rhyme she'd memorized in school. I'm sure at least half of them would agree with you. All of them should. The disdain in his voice surprised her. She remembered what he'd said earlier today in the Great Hall. So, you're not interested in marriage? Beheadings, divorces, and deaths sound about right with matrimony. Don't forget one of Henry's wives survived those fates. Sheer luck. He glanced over his shoulder at Cheney. I prefer better odds. His take on marriage brought a twinge of disappointment, but she didn't know why. Don't you want a family? He shrugged. 
I have no time for one. Someday, then? Drake continued up the stairs, all armor and broad shoulders. Perhaps, but I don't see myself settling down. You never know what might happen. The torches flickered like candles, casting shadows through the stairwell. She touched the wall. The stone was cold and rough beneath her palm. It feels as if we've traveled back in time. Except this castle has electricity, heating, indoor plumbing, and Wi-Fi. My kind of place. Mine, too, he admitted. Though there is something to be said for a time when men were men. That isn't always the case today. Armor aside, Drake was as manly as men came. Many of those men didn't live to see middle age, let alone old age. True, but there were rules and codes to battles and relationships. That had to make things easier. Easier doesn't sound romantic. Let me guess. His light-hearted tone teased. You're a romantic who enjoys hearts, flowers, and violins. Well, I'm not all that into hearts and violins, but I like flowers. If that makes me a romantic, so be it. She climbed the stairs, behind him. I believe true love exists. Love may exist, he admitted. But I don't believe it lasts or offers much in the real world. My parents have been married for 32 years, Cheney countered. I doubt they made it that far, by liking each other. Like can go a long way. As can habit. Drake reached the top of the stairs. But I hope for your parents' sake and also Gemma and Oliver's, theirs lasts. Maybe Drake wasn't all that bad. He cared about Gemma's happiness and future, but his words bothered Cheney. So, you're not a full-blown cynic about love. As if he were the king of the castle, he stood in front of a massive wood door. I prefer to think of myself as a realist. We should agree to disagree, because I feel removed from reality right now. Smiling, he pushed down on the handle. Then enjoy the fantasy with me. The words Drake and fantasy did not belong in the same sentence. Okay, the guy might be a total hottie and physically appealing, but Cheney disagreed with everything he said about love and marriage. Even though she didn't want to settle down now, that didn't mean she wanted to be single forever. One day Cheney hoped to experience a love that lasted. She would never want to date a man who had such different views on relationships from her. Not that he wanted to date her. Drake opened the door. You don't lock your room? she asked. Can't. No place to put the key. You could have asked someone to hold it. The castle is secure. The production crew, top rate. Even the locals we've hired appear to be excellent workers. He held the door for her. Besides, everything I have can be replaced. Cheney tried to understand his way of thinking. Tried and failed. A perk of being wealthy, I'd imagine. For me, yes. He didn't sound boastful, merely honest. Others might disagree. Several others. Yourself. It wasn't a question. I don't have expensive jewelry or electronics with me, but what I have I'd like to keep. If I were yours, I'd want to be kept. Her cheeks warmed. Cheney crossed the threshold so he wouldn't see her blush. Drake didn't appear to be a man who allowed any woman to keep him. Especially her. Wow. Now I know what the production coordinator meant when she called this room opulent. No expense had been spared in decorating the suite, a series of rooms, each larger than Cheney's one-bedroom apartment in Los Angeles. She stood in the sitting area, where a fire burned in the hand-carved fireplace. The golden flames added warmth and a romantic atmosphere. Not romantic, she corrected. Nothing about her presence could be construed as romantic. She was here to do a job, nothing else. Still, she glimpsed the bedroom off to her right. Golden Wedgwood blue silk curtains hung from a large canopy bed fit for royalty, heads of state, or a corporate raider. Coordinating pillows made a pair of overstuffed chairs placed beneath an arched window look more luxurious. This suite is so lavish, Cheney said. It is rather regal looking. He removed his gauntlets and set them on a round table. 
If you like it so much, we can trade rooms. Thanks, but I'm happy where I am. Coming back to England had been a good move, even with seeing Drake again. This job had provided her a golden excuse to miss the housewarming party at her sister's new place this weekend. No having to tell friends and family she still didn't have a boyfriend, and that she wasn't jealous of her sister who now lived in a beautiful place in Malibu with a view, a guest house, and Cheney's former fiancé. Nope, this was much better than that. You belong in the king's bedchamber. Drake bowed. I am but a mere knight, my lady. A king in knight's clothing. And with a kingly bed. The bedding had been turned down. The sheets must be at least 400 count Egyptian cotton. You shouldn't sleep anywhere, but here. It's a comfortable room. Comfortable? It's so spectacular I'm afraid to touch anything. I bet that table and chair set is worth more than I am. She pointed the clipboard toward a four-foot-high vase on her left. That vase probably costs more than my annual salary. Don't worry, he said. The estate required us to take out a large insurance writer to use the castle and grounds for the show. You're safe. She didn't feel safe. Her gaze strayed to the bed. Hers would look as comfortable. It's late. Cheney's heavy eyelids kept wanting to close. The sooner she made it to her room, the better. She set her clipboard on the table. Let me help you out of your costume so we can get to bed. Mine or yours? Heat flamed her cheeks. You know what I meant. I like to make sure and remove any doubt. It saves me from misunderstandings and missed opportunities. You're not missing anything with me. The words tumbled from her mouth. I mean. Amusement gleamed in his eyes. What do you mean, Cheney? He sounded so calm and collected as if having a woman in his room after midnight was no big deal. Okay, it probably wasn't to him. Still, the way he stood there looking more gorgeous than anyone had a right to look dressed like a character from a summer blockbuster movie irritated Cheney. No, he irritated her. And that was when she realized. She was angry with him for what happened five years ago, for shattering her illusion of who she'd wanted Drake Llewellyn to be. She'd wanted to find her Prince Charming back then. She'd wanted him to be Drake. Instead, she'd returned home and met Tyler, a man opposite from Drake. A man she thought had loved her. At least, he'd claimed to love her until he fell for Simone. Cheney tucked her hair behind her ears. How do you remove the costume? He lifted his left arm and pointed with his right hand. Buckles are hidden underneath. They attach the armor pieces. You have to undo them. Okay, that didn't sound difficult. As she walked toward him, a wall of heat hit her. Not from the fireplace, but from Drake. She knew he was hot, but not literally. Warmth emanated from him. His scent, sweaty, musky, and male, surrounded her. I'm looking forward to getting out of this costume and into a shower, he said. No thinking about him doing that. She glanced at the bed again. Thinking about him there wasn't a good idea, either. Cheney pulled apart the armor plates to find the buckles. All I want to do is sleep. That bed looks, inviting. The staff left chocolate on the pillows. He stared down at her. Two pieces. Oh. She undid a buckle. The staff may have assumed you'd have a guest. I do. Are you interested? Her fingers fumbled. What? His eyes danced with laughter. In chocolate. I'm not a guest. I work for you, your company. As she unfastened another buckle, her fingertips brushed the chain mail underneath. How many layers are you wearing? A few, but once the chain mail is off, I can handle the rest. Unless you'd rather help with that, too. Her fingers trembled. No way would she respond to him. Anything she said would come out wrong and might sound as if she were interested in helping with, more. She pressed her lips together. Cheney focused on the armor, not the man underneath it. 
she caught glimpses of chain mail, a quilted shirt, dark hair. Intriguing images. Tempting impressions. One she ignored. She unbuckled the pieces on his chest and shoulders before placing each in its container on the floor. She knelt at his feet to remove the lower half of the armor. Reaching around his thigh, she found her hands between his legs and her head much too close to his, um, codpiece. I appreciate this, Cheney, he said as if she were tying his shoes, not practically fondling him as she reached for a buckle. I know you're tired. Cheney kept her eyes focused on the buckle, not allowing herself to look anywhere else. Or touch any part of him. Almost done. Please, oh, please let me be almost done. She hurriedly undid the buckle. Unfortunately, three more needed her attention and kept her in an uncomfortable, embarrassing position. Finished, she said finally, laying the last piece of leg armor into its spot in the container. Thank you. Cheney turned. The words you're welcome died on her parted lips. Chain mail molded to his muscular shoulders, arms, and chest. The metal shirt fell to his hips. Talk about hot. She swallowed. He was every woman's fantasy and her worst nightmare. But that didn't stop her knees from going weak and her blood from boiling. The chain mail attaches in the back, he said. Cheney forced herself into action. She fumbled with the first hook. Her fingers wouldn't do what she wanted them to do. She blew out a frustrated breath. Ugh. His soft-looking hair tempted her to touch it, to see if the strands would curl around her finger. Having trouble? Drake asked. He had no idea. I'm getting there. Or would. As soon as she reminded her traitorous body, she wasn't interested in Drake Lulin. He couldn't give her what she wanted, a forever kind of love. Not to mention she was on a break from dating men. An almost two-year break, a voice, maybe her heart, mocked. Shut up. Excuse me, he asked. Oh, no. She hadn't meant to say that out loud. Sorry, I was trying to quiet the voices in my head. What were they saying? That it's past my bedtime, but don't worry. I won't leave until I finish the job. I knew I could count on you. Cheney didn't understand his confidence in her when she wasn't sure she could count on herself in this situation. Finally, the snap came undone. Slowly, much too slowly for her liking, she opened each of the remaining ones. They're all unsnapped. Can you help me out of it? Sure. Her voice sounded stronger than she felt. Open the back. As she did as he asked, Cheney realized how much the chain mail weighed. He shrugged out of the shirt, so it rested on his upper arms. Now come around in front of me, he said. Be careful, it's heavy. Cheney held on as he pulled one arm out and then the other, never once leaving her to hold the entire weight. He placed the chain mail in the container. His damp, quilted shirt clung to him. He pulled out the tails from the waistband of his pants. Much better and cooler. Maybe for him. I should go. Stay. One soft word in that delicious, accented voice. She sucked in a breath. We're finished. His eyes lit again with that wicked laughter. Darling, we're just getting started. He walked, no, strutted, her way, the set of his jaw full of purpose. Drawn to his strength and heat, Cheney leaned toward him. She tilted her chin. His gaze smoldered. His lips parted. Cheney stood transfixed. Drake stopped in front of her. She could barely breathe, let alone think. As she stared up at him, confused, afraid, attracted, he lowered his mouth to hers. He was going to kiss her. The realization ricocheted through her brain. She wanted Drake to kiss her. Badly. Except. She ducked and stepped away, so the only thing his lips touched was air. I should so not be surprised by this. Her voice sounded shrill. She didn't care. He drew back. Excuse me? I probably shouldn't ask, given your reputation, but why would you make a move on me now, when you know I'm so tired? 
I thought you wanted me to kiss you. She placed her hands on her hips. Why would you think that? The way you leaned toward me. The tilt of your head. The look in your eyes that said kiss me. Oh, boy. Shame flooded her. She'd done all those things and probably more. I'm sorry if I misled you. Don't be sorry. His smile could have charmed a starving mouse out of its last nibble of cheddar. We can try again. Let me show you what you missed out on five years ago. Sex. That was all he'd ever wanted from her. Anger surged. Disappointment, too. Cheney glanced at the bed and then at him. In case you haven't figured it out, I'm not about to be another notch on your bedpost or wherever else you keep track of your conquests. If that's all I felt about you, I wouldn't be here. Even though she was upset at him, his words piqued her curiosity. What are you talking about? I'm hosting this episode so I could see you again. Chapter 4 The air in Drake's room sizzled. A mix of hope and disbelief filled Cheney's eyes. If hope won, he would win, too. He enjoyed winning, and she would be a magnificent prize. She stared at him with an incredulous expression. You thought I was married, and you still wanted to see me? See you, yes. Nothing else. She didn't appear convinced. If I hadn't agreed to fill in for Gemma. But you did, and you're here. Not to mention unmarried. Drake moved closer to Cheney, taking his time to allow her to respond or step away. He slowed further as he drew nearer. We've been given a second chance. Let's make the most of this opportunity. She put her hands on his chest to stop him. Why don't you park yourself at the round table and cool down? Her anger confused him. He hadn't expected that reaction. She walked away from him. You can't expect me to believe you. What I said is true. Cheney rolled her eyes. I only agreed to fill in for Gemma a few days ago. You have enough money to commission a custom suit of armor at the last minute, but unless you've found a miracle formula to grow facial hair overnight, I'd say you spent well over a week on your beard. Probably longer than that. Guilty. Most women would have pretended not to see through his words and play along, but not Cheney. Drake didn't know whether to be annoyed or amused by the turn of events. You may have misunderstood my intentions. Oh, no. Your intentions are clear, and I want to make sure you don't misinterpret mine. Forget annoyed. But the way she easily dismissed him, and the strength she exhibited, were total turn-ons. She stared down her nose. Whatever lines you use on women must work well, or you wouldn't be so confident. But just so you know, nothing's happening here tonight, tomorrow, or any other day we're in the same place. No one ever challenged him like this. Maybe he should try a different tack or perhaps cut his losses and send Cheney on her way. The truth was, he didn't want her to leave. Would you believe your presence gave me a reason to look forward to this weekend? She said nothing. But her bright, sharp eyes suggested empty words or careless compliments wouldn't sway her. Guilt lodged in his throat. I'm sorry I've dragged you up here. The tightness around her mouth told him he should be sorry. She picked up her clipboard from the table and headed toward the door. I'll walk you to your room, he offered. And tuck me in? She pursed her lips. No, thanks. I don't want you getting lost. I'm fine on my own. You said you hadn't been to this part of the castle before. I can find my way down a lit stairwell. The set of her jaw told him she wouldn't give in. At a young age, he'd learned what battles were worth fighting. This one wasn't. Okay, you win. For now. Her tired eyes widened behind her glasses. I didn't know it was a competition. Life is a competition. Only if you turn it into one. Cheney might be exhausted, but her mind was fully functional. Still, he'd taken up enough of her time. Drake opened the door. Thanks for your help. Get some sleep. Not looking back, she fled down the staircase into the shadows. Once she was out of sight, Drake closed the door. Frustration nodded him. 
he hadn't been this off his game since Cheney's going away party in London. That experience, however, hadn't left him feeling so guilty. Regret swept over him. He'd taken advantage of her helpful nature to get her to his room. Not that she'd allowed him to exploit the situation. He hadn't liked how she turned him down the last time, given her near hero worship of him five years ago, but he'd understood she wanted more than he was offering. Tonight, however, stung. Drake rubbed his chin, still not used to the hair against his fingers. She'd been angry and dismissive toward him. Something had changed. She'd changed. I'm on hiatus from investing. He knew who to blame. Her stupid jerk of an ex fiance turned brother in law. The guy must have hurt her badly. Her sister, too. Drake grimaced, and he knew what he needed to do. He grabbed his cell phone and sent a text. Drake, find out information on Cheney Sullivan's sister and brother in law. I don't have names. Little dots appeared on his screen. Not surprising. He not only paid for a quick reply, but also expected one, especially from a security team he often hired. Jackson, right away? Drake, now. Whatever it takes. Jackson, on it. Having too much information was never an issue. It was when Drake didn't have enough that he ran into problems. The more he learned about Cheney, the better shot he would have with her. But he discovered something about her tonight. Cheney might be a romantic, but she was a wounded one who'd forgotten how to have fun. That explained her reaction to his overtures. He would show her that she needed some fun in her life, that she needed him. Not an impossible task. He'd done it by showing the companies he purchased or did business with that he had something they needed. He would do the same thing with Cheney. A win-win situation for both of them. And he knew exactly where to start. Drake picked up the telephone and pressed the button for the staff line. Good evening, Mr. Lulin, a proper-sounding male voice said. What may I do for you? Please deliver flowers to Miss Sullivan's room tomorrow. In the morning, if possible. Roses? No, he answered quickly, not wanting her to interpret roses the wrong way. A mixed bouquet will be fine. What would you like written on the card, sir? He thought for a moment. Friends with a question mark. The man repeated the phrase. That's correct. I'll take care of this straight away, sir. Thank you. Drake hung up the phone. Friends would be the perfect starting point with Cheney. Friends could have fun together. Staring at the armor she'd neatly put away for him, he smiled. And if things worked out the way he planned, he and Cheney would be more than friends very, very soon. Chapter 5 Cheney stood on the castle's manicured lawn, her boots sinking into the sodden grass. A touch of foreboding in the air made it easy to forget the crew running around as they prepared for this morning's first scene. She stared at the castle wall, rising to meet the overcast sky. The ancient stones, battered by weather and war, had remained impenetrable, inviolate, over the centuries. Shivering, she clutched her cup of Earl Grey. She'd forgotten how chilly English mornings could be. Cheney had never been strong like the castle's wall. She'd crumbled in the past, allowing people to break through her weak defenses and take what had been hers, a fiancé, a promised job, the dream of a happily ever after. Afterward, she never said a word. Always the quiet one, forever the peacekeeper, bendable to a ridiculous degree, a proverbial doormat. Being that way made those in her life, those who loved her, happy. But the truth was she wanted to be more like the wall, solid and sure. That would make her happy. The only person she'd stood up to was Drake Lulin. And only twice. Five years ago, and last night. Having him hit on her, as if she were still his naive in turn infuriated her. She'd been madder at herself, for being in a position where that could happen. Her anger had hardened her, protected her from his charm. Thank goodness. Standing up to him, she'd felt strong, and she'd enjoyed that. Cheney resolved to be unbending, unconquerable, and, for the rest of the taping, immune to Drake. The scent of green, from the carpet of grass and rows of neatly clipped hedges, filled the air. 
She thought about the floral arrangement delivered to her room this morning with the one-word note, friends? She couldn't imagine it was from Drake. The only friend he would want to be was a friend with benefits. Gemma hadn't sent them. She would have had something edible, most likely chocolate, delivered, as she always did. Cheney's parents wouldn't have done it. They weren't happy with her after she cancelled on attending her sister's housewarming party. Besides, they'd never sent her flowers before. Why start now? She'd asked the castle desk about the flowers, and they promised the delivery hadn't been a mistake. But who would have sent them? And why? A breeze rustled through a nearby tree. The branches swayed, sending leaves floating to the ground as the sky darkened on the horizon. Cheney eyed the heavy skies with misgiving, hoping it didn't rain. Her hands curled around her cup for warmth. A delay in the shooting schedule would force her to spend more time with Drake. She wanted to do her job and avoid him as much as possible for the remainder of the shoot. Milt motioned he was ready for the first take. The crew took their places and quieted. She didn't know where this morning's scene would fit in the episode, a host shot or a wraparound. Maybe a teaser of some sort. A camera panned the landscape from the formal gardens to the acres of grass to a grove of trees. Something moved in the distance. A white horse decked in armor. And Drake, in his night costume, on its back. Despite what he'd said and the way he'd acted last night, Cheney's breath caught in her throat. She'd thought he'd been knightly yesterday, but today. He's Lancelot. Okay, not Lancelot. But he sure looked the part. Her heart thudded in her chest. A helmet covered the sides of his jaw, but most of his face showed. Not that Cheney could see any details from this distance. Still, she had no trouble imagining his lips with a right curve to them and his dark eyes full of excitement. He sat tall in the saddle, holding the reins in his left hand and a battle standard in his right. A long pennant-shaped banner flapped behind him. Animal and rider in perfect rhythm, the horse cantered through the trees to the lawn. She stood mesmerized. The air crackled. The impending storm or some sort of magic. Cheney didn't know which. But once again, she felt as if she'd time-traveled. As he sat back hard in the saddle, his gauntlet hand tightened on the reins. The horse tossed its head, armor jingling. The knight raised the battle standard, a black dragon on a field of gold, before plunging the pole into the ground. The flag fluttered in the breeze. The horse arched its neck, dancing in place. The whole scene was something from a movie or fairy tale, as far removed from Cheney's real life as it could be. And yet this man had tried to kiss her, had invited her to stay in his room last night. Hot blood flooded her face and flowed through her veins. My good blade carves the casks of men. His deep voice resonated, his words pure poetry, Tennyson's poem about Sir Galahad. Cheney had recognized the lines from the script. The horse looked to the left and then pranced to the right. My tough lance thrust us sure. My strength is as the strength of ten. Because my heart is pure. Pure. Right. This rider wasn't the Dragon Knight, a man who lived hundreds of years ago. He was Drake Lulin, a man from the 21st century. He unsheathed a sword and held out the shiny weapon to the camera. His lips curved into the same come hither I want you smile he'd used in the drawing room and his suite. Drake was sexy, but he practically smoldered now. A good thing the noble knight stuff was an act, but even so, tingles filled her stomach. As if on cue, a flock of birds flew overhead, their dark wings a stark contrast against the gray clouds. The horse stamped its front hooves, ready to rear or run away if given a chance but Drake was in complete control. As usual. Whether on horseback or sitting at a table negotiating his next deal, he was comfortable in any environment. Sure of himself and strong. That was how she wanted to be. Milt gave a signal. Drake allowed the horse to rear. The majestic animal stood nearly perpendicular on its hind legs. Cheney's heart pounded in her ears. Drake didn't mind taking risks, 
but she couldn't imagine him doing anything to endanger himself or the horse. Still, every muscle tensed. She held her breath. He didn't fall. Drake barely shifted in his saddle. Amazing. Nothing he did should impress her, but she was. Anyone would be. The horse lowered its front legs to the grass. Cut. A smattering of applause from the crew filled the air. The urge to clap, too, was strong, but Cheney tightened her hands around her tea instead. She didn't want him to know she'd been watching him that closely or admired him. Because she was, and she did. But neither would make her reconsider his offer from last night. She couldn't, wouldn't. Cheney wasn't the fling type. Even if Drake wanted a relationship, which he didn't, a man like him could crush her heart. And would. Avoiding another heartbreak was her priority, her goal. She stared into her almost empty cup. I never understood the appeal of a knight in shining armor before. Liz buttoned her long wool coat and raised the faux fur collar. But I believe I have a new crush. Mine isn't so new, an intern named Jessie admitted in a crisp English accent. She'd taken a semester off from college to work on the show. I'm not sure if it's the costume or the beard. Liz pursed her sparkling with gloss lips. But I'm ready to ride off into the sunset with him. Jessie muttered her agreement, never taking her eyes off Drake. She combed her gloved fingers through her long, blonde hair. As Cheney listened to the women, she remembered talking to Gemma like that about Drake during her internship. They'd been so young and clueless then. What about you, Cheney? Liz asked. She shrugged. Well, Drake makes a striking night, but nope. Not my type. What is your type? Jessie asked. I'm not so sure anymore, Cheney admitted. The last guy who I thought was my type let me down big time and cost me my job. And he married my younger sister. Drawing her brows together, Jessie frowned. That's awful. It was. Tyler had gone to work for her father right before he proposed to Cheney and quickly moved up the ranks. She'd worked there, too, after finishing up her master's degree. But once Tyler and Simone became engaged, her parents suggested Cheney find a position at a different company because they were concerned for her mental well-being. Tyler had been in charge of an important acquisition, so they couldn't afford to lose him. She'd gone along with the request to make them happy, even though she'd dreamed about working for her dad since she was a little girl and loved her job. Cheney sighed. But that was a couple of years ago. It's over now. Liz eyed her with curiosity. You used to work at Dragon Lulin, right? Cheney nodded. I did an internship there five years ago. Could it be the Dragon Knight has already rescued you? The curiosity in Liz's voice matched the gleam in her eyes. Cheney nearly laughed because she'd had to rescue herself from Drake. No, I try to avoid having to be rescued. What fun is that? Jessie kept her blue-eyed gaze locked on Drake. Maybe we should take a fall on the grass and have Mr. Lulin help us up. Oh, to be wide-eyed and naive again, believing Drake could do no wrong. No, Cheney wouldn't want to return to that time, not for all the money in the world. That might be a little obvious. Liz nodded, her long bangs falling over her right eye. Just a bit. I wonder if he likes women who play hard to get. Jesse stared at Drake. Some guys prefer a challenge, Cheney offered. Not Drake, Liz said. At least not when we taped an episode in Tuscany last year. That tidbit left Cheney unsettled and more curious than she had a right to be about him. His business was none of hers. But that taping was a total party. Things are more proper here, Liz continued. Still, I bet late-night intrigues and midnight rendezvous are occurring in the castle. Jessie sighed. Could you imagine? Cheney could. In hot, living color. She didn't want to and downed the rest of her tea. I'm off to refill my cup. Oh, oh, oh. Jessie rose on her tiptoes. He's coming toward us. Liz glanced his way, but not Cheney. 
she wanted to keep her distance. She stared at her empty cup, wishing she hadn't left her clipboard inside. That would have given her something to concentrate on and not appear, rude. Hello there, Jesse. Liz. Cheney, Drake said. After he said her name, Cheney looked at him. He focused on each of them, but his gaze lingered on her a moment longer than the other two. She hated that she noticed. Or cared. Hi. Pink tinged Jesse's cheeks. You were brilliant, Mr. Lulin. Really, really brilliant. Thank you, Jesse. He smiled at her. Would you mind getting me a cup of tea? Right away, sir. Jesse scurried toward the craft service featuring coffee, tea, juice, fruit, and pastries for the crew. Liz helped Drake remove his helmet. Excellent take, sir. Sweat dampened his hair, making him look even more attractive. Thank you. Liz took the helmet. Have you ridden long? A few years. He glanced at Cheney and then back at Liz. Please take the helmet to Russell. I'm happy to. Liz walked away. What did you think about the scene? Drake asked Cheney. You nailed it. Filling in for Gemma meant giving him honest feedback even if the words would only feed his ego. I doubt anyone could have performed it better. Thank you. As he bowed his head, the wind ruffled his hair, making him look, oh, so tempting. Not that she was tempted. The breeze sent her hair every which way. She tucked the flying strands behind her ears. I've enjoyed the night scenes, he said. I'm almost sorry, that was my last one in full armor. Halloween is coming up. She focused on his armor rather than his handsome face. You'd be the hit at any costume party in that outfit. I'd need to find a willing Guinevere to accompany me. Cheney glanced up and read the invitation in his eyes. Her mouth went dry. Don't look at me. I don't have a costume. He pushed a swatch of hair off her face. The intimate gesture quickened her pulse. Nor are you willing, he said. I. His gaze lingered on her as if she were a prized statue to add to his collection. Still, he made her feel important and cherished, a way she hadn't felt in a long time. She relished the moment. Of course, the adoration would never last, because he'd soon replace her with a new woman, someone who could give him what he needed better than her. Cheney straightened. Sorry, no. Find somebody else to play with. Her cheeks burned. Play your queen, I mean. No one else has the qualifications I'm looking for. You mean costume. I've always considered a woman's costume to be optional. Especially when we're playing. As her cheeks grew even hotter, amusement filled his eyes. I meant, no other woman is you. You don't even know me. The right grin she remembered so well from five years ago appeared. Not for my lack of trying. Kissing isn't how you get to know someone. It's an excellent way to start, so long as both parties are, what's the word, oh, yes, willing. The man could be so annoying sometimes. Strike that. All of the time. Cheney gritted her teeth. I don't want to get into this right now. Later, then. Never. She remembered her resolve to be strong. I'm here to help Gemma. Your help is much appreciated. I'd still like us to be friends. Friends? Drake nodded. Her shoulders sagged. You sent the flowers. Another nod. Thanks. She spoke automatically. They are lovely, but you didn't have to do that. No, but I wanted to, he said without missing a beat. What do you have to say about our being friends? Being friends sounded harmless enough. She appreciated he hadn't sent long-stemmed roses, yet Cheney hesitated. Drake was about as harmless as a man-eating tiger. His watchful gaze never left hers. Interesting. Drake seemed to have gained some patience over the years. He'd never enjoyed waiting before. As long as being friends means things remain professional between us, she said finally. Professional? 
work-related, Cheney added to make sure he understood. Fine. Okay, then. We can be friends. She showed him her empty cup. If we're finished, I'd like to get another cup of tea. Before you run off, Milt wants to see you. He's changing tonight's banquet scene. Her muscles tensed. Changes could affect the taping schedule and the budget. With his dual role, Milt appeared to enjoy directing more and didn't worry as much about money as most producers. That meant the budget concerns fell to the associate producer, or during this episode, her. Do you know what changes he has in mind? she asked. Drake's eyes gleamed with mischief. Milt likes the period feel of the episode, so he wants extras to dress up and take part in tonight's medieval feast. She pictured the long table in the dining room covered with the medieval-inspired meal the castle chef was preparing. Good idea. That's a big table for only one person. Milt said the same thing. Except, the extras will cost us. It's worth it. And the costumes. The castle has them. The feast is a popular request, so the castle provides costumes to make the experience more realistic for guests. Drake glanced toward the garden where the cameraman was taping. Russell's on it. That makes things easier. The calculator in her head, however, wanted to know the additional expense of this scene change. I'll find out what Milt needs from me. He wants your dress size. My size, her heart plummeted to her feet. I can't dress up. Can't or won't. I'm a behind-the-scenes person. Milt wants you at the table. Cheney raised a brow. Only Milt? He's in charge. She narrowed her gaze. You're the executive producer. Yes, but I had no say in this. Drake's words made her feel only slightly better. She'd never known him not to have a say in something business-related. You'll have fun, he added. Fun. She hated that word, especially coming from him. I doubt it. Dressing up like a medieval maiden with a dark and dangerous knight sitting nearby would not be fun. She bit her lower lip, worried. Seeing Drake in his knight costume and looking so gorgeous had blurred the line between reality and fantasy. She didn't want to become a part of that confusion herself. She needed to set professional boundaries with him. Not be wooed or courted or pulled onto his lap while a camera captured every minute. Come on, he urged. Think about sitting at the table and eating gourmet food prepared by the castle chef, with minstrels, troubadours, jesters, mummers, and jugglers to entertain you. Sounds crowded. He laughed. Where's your sense of adventure? I have none. She remembered how Tyler had wanted her to be something she wasn't. She'd tried, but that hadn't been enough for him. I've never been the adventurous type. Anticipation sparkled in his eyes. Then, my friend, tonight will be good for you. You can take a step outside of your comfort zone in a controlled environment and see how you feel. You might enjoy it. No, Cheney wouldn't. And nothing her friends said or did would change her mind. She only hoped to convince Milt that he had enough damsels or wenches or whatever the director was calling the female extras for the scene. That way, she could stay behind the scenes where she belonged and far, far away from Drake. Chapter 6 As the tape rolled, Drake sat at the banquet table, enjoying the medieval feast with members of the crew and a few extras hired from the nearby village. The smell of the gourmet cuisine, spices, meat, fresh-baked bread, wafted in the air. Smiles, light-hearted conversation, and laughter surrounded him. The dinner was his favorite kind of shoot. No lines or staging to memorize. Milt's only direction had been to act like a knight home from war. Drake was happy to do that. All he needed was a willing damsel to ravish. One damsel in particular. He glanced at the opposite end of the table. Not that he planned on ravishing Cheney. The guilt from last night remained. He'd acted like an invader ready to carry her off like a spoil of war instead of a man proposing a pleasant and consensual evening. Now that she'd agreed to be friends, he wouldn't push and ruin everything because she seemed less tense, 
not as angry this morning. I'd prefer to keep our conversations professional. Work-related. Despite her words, he believed she was more interested in him than she let on, given the way her gaze kept straying to his end of the banquet table. A minstrel strummed his lute, playing a cheerful melody. Drake caught Cheney looking at him again. He raised his goblet toward her and smiled. As her cheeks reddened, she stared at the table. He would bet once her fiancé took up with her sister, Cheney shut herself off from blokes like a princess locked in a tower. That would explain her hiatus. All she needed was the right encouragement to unlock the door and venture outside. He was just the man, make that friend, to help her do that. Being friends with Cheney was the first step in his plan. She would see him as a good guy, and fun was a necessary part of life. Fun with him would follow. Drake glanced her way again. Brocade-like ribbons decorated the sleeves and the bodice on the stunning hunter green and gold velvet gown. A ruby necklace complemented her graceful neck. Talk about gorgeous. Her, but the dress, too. As a goblet tipped over, she caught it. Her move was barely noticeable, so slight no one on her end of the table, including the duke or baron who elbowed the glass, noticed. But her actions impressed him. Even while acting, she performed her job as competently as ever. If she hadn't managed the deft move, Juice would have ruined one of the chef's elaborate creations and affected the taping. Drake sipped the sparkling apple cider in his goblet. The wine and mead would arrive once the cameras stopped rolling. A jester offered Cheney a single flower. She took the blossom with a quiet word of thanks and stuck it into the wreath of greenery she wore on her head. The man broke out into a silly dance. Her glossed lips curved into a wide smile, though her dimple didn't appear. Drake lowered his goblet, careful he didn't slam it against the table. What's going on? He couldn't tease a slight grin from her to save his life, but the village idiot wearing colorful harlequin plaid with bells on his hat and toes could make her smile as if he were the funniest man on earth. A male extra, dressed as some titled royalty, leaned over and whispered into Cheney's ear. She nodded mysteriously. The guy smiled smugly. A little too smugly for Drake's liking. A duel or sword fight might be a fitting end to the evening. Cut. Milt yelled. Good job, everyone. Take ten while the staff clears the table for the next course. It's called a remove, not a course, someone corrected. Whatever, Milt said. Drake stood. He pulled out Jessie's chair so she could stand. She stared up at him with pure adoration. Thank you, Mr. Lulin. Make sure you stretch your legs, he advised. The final part of the shoot might take a while. Jessie beamed. I will, sir. The intern was pretty with a fresh-faced, girl-next-door look but so very young. Probably the same age as Cheney had been when she'd interned for him but she'd seemed older, smart for her age, insightful, and willing to voice her opinions. She'd intrigued him so much he'd been miserable her last day at the office. That was why he'd broken several of his own dating rules to ask her to stay in London longer. That hadn't worked out the way he'd expected. But he wouldn't dwell on what had happened. His father had told him to leave the past behind him. Drake should because Cheney was here now. Nothing else mattered. As the extras milled about, a mummer practiced his dance steps, and a juggler searched for a stray ball. The wait staff cleared the dishes from the table. Liz fixed makeup and hair, and Russell adjusted costumes. Drake lost sight of Cheney in the crowded room. Three men, locals hired for the shoot and dressed in costume, stood near him. I like these costumes, one said. The guy had been seated next to Cheney at the banquet table. Another nodded. I like the low-cut necklines and, shall we say, ample bosoms pushed up out of the gowns. The third laughed. All we need is a wardrobe malfunction, and I'll be a happy man. I just want a piece of that sweet thing, the first one said, motioning across the room with his head. The other glanced in that direction. Me, too. I'd hit that, the third said. Drake turned to see what woman they were discussing. He moved closer and saw all three men staring at Cheney, her cheeks flushed and her eyes twinkling. 
totally and thankfully oblivious to what the men said and their leering. As anger surged through Drake's veins, he clenched his hands into fists. She hadn't asked to wear a revealing dress. She was only doing her job. Her job. Shame hit low and hard. He suddenly saw how last night must have appeared in her eyes. Drake was so used to women falling over themselves to be with him he'd presumed he could have Cheney, so he'd turn on the charm. Idiot. She deserved to be treated the way she'd asked him to treat her, professionally, with courtesy and respect, not as a sex object. Worse, she shouldn't have needed to request that treatment from him. He should have done that automatically. As the three men made a beeline toward her, Drake cut them off and reached her first. The others backed off. How's the taping going? He asked Cheney. You were right. It's been fun so far. Perhaps there's an ounce of adventure inside of you that you didn't know about. She pushed the hair off his forehead with her fingers. Perhaps there is. Her soft fingertips brushed his skin. He froze, unable to breathe, let alone speak. Though an ounce may be an exaggeration, she added. She lowered her hands to adjust his leather shirt. Cheney's palms on his chest sent his heart pounding like the battle drums of the Saxons. You don't have to help me with my costume. It was wrong of me to ask you before, and I agreed to honor your request to keep things professional. I didn't mean, she jerked her hands off him. Her cheeks deepened to a cherry red. Liz and Russell don't think they have enough time during the break to get around to everyone. Drake took in Cheney's flushed face. She wasn't the only one embarrassed. He'd acted like a boy who'd never been touched by a girl. No worries. Nice of you to lend a hand. Back in place, people, Milt ordered. She wanted to say something to him, but Drake needed to get away from her. Once again, his reaction had been less than professional. Yet, he couldn't leave her so confused. We can talk later. Later? The vulnerability in her eyes made him want to take her in his arms and hold her. Kiss her. Not exactly workplace behavior or something a friend would do. Still, he wanted to make her feel better. Drake nodded. Her features relaxed. Okay. He watched her return to her seat. She was too helpful, too sweet too beautiful. If he weren't careful. But he was careful, especially with matters of the heart. Not that his heart ever got involved or would. He knew better than to make that mistake. Drake took his spot next to Jesse, keeping his eyes focused on the people sitting at his end of the banquet table. But doing so wasn't easy. His gaze wanted to stray toward Cheney. He wouldn't allow it, he couldn't. Everything about her, from her looks to her actions, unnerved him tonight. Women never did that to him. No woman until Cheney Sullivan. When she was around, Drake acted brutish and sexist. A rush of unfamiliar feelings like jealousy, possessiveness, and protectiveness kept him off balance. He was used to being in charge, but with her, he didn't feel that way at all. Instead, he was at the mercy of his emotions the instincts he'd honed over the years had short-circuited. Drake didn't like it. Forget about what happened five years ago. Forget about what he wanted to happen with Cheney now. Being just friends would be enough, more than enough. The sound of her laughter traveled from her end of the table and smacked him in the gut. Maybe even too much. Chapter 7 Cheney stood in front of the Great Hall's open fireplace. The glowing embers of a single log were the only remnants of tonight's banquet and the only light in the otherwise dark room. A chill curled through her. Not from the cold, but from anticipation. Later. She didn't know if Drake had meant later tomorrow or tonight. She hoped the latter even though it was past midnight. Cheney wanted, no, needed, to see him. She owed him an apology for sending mixed signals again. Sure, he'd looked handsome at the banquet, but he usually did. With the medieval costume, his beard, and the mysterious smile on his face, she'd stared at him, practically mesmerized. The line between reality and fantasy had blurred. She crossed her arms, her hand brushing over the luxurious fabric of her gown. 
The memory of his leather shirt and his soft hair against her skin burned. She closed her eyes, remembering the feel of both beneath her fingertips. She'd been helping the stylists during the break, but for a second or two, okay, maybe longer, Cheney hadn't been 100% professional. Not in her actions or her thoughts. She might have continued touching him and enjoying it had he not said something. Her eyes sprung open. Idiot. I hope you're talking to the voices in your head again and not about someone else. Like me, Drake said, sounding amused. She turned away from the fireplace. He strode toward her. Larger than life. He was an imposing figure. An attractive one, too. With his long, confident gait and his costume, he appeared to be more like a king than a businessman from London. Cheney wished a light was on. I was talking about myself. That's a relief. Uncertainty slinked through her. Maybe for you. If it's any consolation, you're not an idiot. Not usually, but that had been before seeing him again. Cheney's brain and memory malfunctioned whenever he was around. She recalled her resolve from this morning. Unbending, unconquerable, and, for the remainder of the taping, immune to Drake. Squaring her shoulders, she crossed the room, the hem of her heavy gown, brushing the tops of her feet, and met him halfway. I want to apologize for earlier. I should have told you I was trying to help Liz and Russell before, assisting you. I'm sorry. I don't want you to think I was sending mixed signals after our talk this morning. No worries. I enjoyed your assistance, Drake said with no hesitation. A man doesn't get fussed over by a lovely maiden every night. His flattery heated the blood flowing through her veins. He handed out compliments like candy on Halloween, but his words pleased her. I'm sure you have your pick of maidens. I'm here with the one of my choice. His wide smile curled her toes. So much for being immune to him. Cheney prayed she survived tonight in one piece. Drake's gaze ran the length of her. You're still in costume. You, too. I had to return calls. I was checking on a few details for tomorrow. And waiting for him. She touched the large gemstone hanging around her neck. Plus, I kind of enjoy wearing the jewelry. His smile reached his eyes and sent her pulse racing. We're all dressed up. And no place to go, she finished for him. On the contrary. He held out his arm to her. Care to join me? Cheney narrowed her gaze suspiciously. Where? The library. Her muscles tensed. I don't think. The chef made chocolate chip cookies. He set up a midnight snack in there. Cookies, she repeated, not quite believing his invitation. It's on the level and professional. A thank you for the hotel staff and crew who helped with the banquet. That included her. A cookie sounds good. Let's go. As she exited the great hall, her eyes adjusted to the light in the corridor. With Drake at her side, she could imagine a couple from the Middle Ages doing the same thing. I wonder what kings and queens walked this hallway. We could find out when we get to the library. Glowing lights illuminated the tapestries. The scent of fresh-baked cookies lingered in the warm air. Cheney breathed in the aroma. The smell reminds me of when I was a kid. I'd hop off the school bus, hurry into the house, and find my mom in the kitchen baking a snack. That must have been a nice homecoming. It was. Now going home was a chore. One she did with a smile on her face and her eyes on the clock. Ever since the Tyler fiasco, her relationship with her parents had suffered. They worried about her, which was weird given their complete support of Simone and her husband, but that didn't stop Cheney from feeling like she no longer belonged. Still, she tried to show them she was living her perfect life so they would stop bothering her, even if things in her world weren't exactly ideal. I love cookies. But not as much as chocolate. She glanced his way. I remember, he said in a matter-of-fact tone. That is, I remember how much you like chocolate. When you and Gemma got your heads together, 
I never knew if you were smiling over a man or a truffle. A truffle, no doubt. Though, in all honesty, he had probably brought a smile to their lips a time or two. Drake stopped at the entrance to the library. Our quest is over. Cheney stepped into the dark paneled room with its floor to ceiling bookcases full of hardcover books. Elegant furnishings provided seats for reading or, in their case, a place to enjoy the delicious looking late night snack set out on a nearby desk. In the fireplace, wood crackled as gold flames danced, the heat warming the air. This castle is so fairy tale worthy. She ran her fingertips along the spines of classic novels. I feel like Belle. I suppose that would make me the beast. If the fur fits, she teased. Drake laughed. Only you would say that to me. She lifted her chin and boldly met his gaze. Arrogance and pride are common traits of a beast. True. All men have a bit of a beast inside them. The question becomes, how is the beast tamed? Don't ask a beast. He strode to the cookies. If they knew the answer, they wouldn't behave so beastly. Perhaps, but even if the beast knew, he might do nothing about it. Don't forget the beast's flaw is arrogance. That and pride caused the curse. A handsome prince changed into a beast to show the world the ugliness that lies inside him, the beastly nature of his heart. Cheney joined Drake at the desk. He had to remake himself over on the inside to win Belle's love. He shrugged. Well, I don't want her love or anyone else's, so I don't have to do anything. Slackered. If the fur fits. She picked up a cookie from an ivory platter with platinum edges. Still warm. Perfect timing on our part. Nodding, she took a bite, a delicious combination of gooey, melted chocolate, and perfectly baked dough. As tasty as Drake's kiss? Warning bells blared in her head. Better not go there. So what if he'd done a 180 from last night's flirtations? He wasn't looking for love, didn't want it. No sense being stupid about him. Which meant. Time to say goodnight. She finished her cookie, picked up a napkin, and wiped her mouth. It's late. She'd done what she needed to do tonight, apologized to him. No reason to stick around longer especially with a tempting beast lurking nearby. I should call it a night with the early start tomorrow. Smart thinking. Drake motioned to his glass. But I'd like another cookie and milk first. She eyed the carafe sitting on ice in a silver bucket. That sounds good. Stay, then. Cheney glanced around as if someone would magically appear to give her permission or tell her to leave. No one did. She shouldn't stay, but heaven help her, she wanted to. I will, for a few minutes. He handed her a glass. Nothing beats milk and cookies. She sat on a love seat. When was the last time you had that? Three weeks ago. He set a small plate of cookies on a table within arm's reach of the sofa and took a seat next to her. With my father. Drake's nearness disturbed her. His thigh touching hers didn't help. Her skin practically burned despite the layers of clothing between them. She tried not to think about it, about him. Do you see your father often? It depends on my schedule. Drake held a glass of milk. But I try to see him as much as possible. That was more than she could say of herself. She lived in a different part of Los Angeles than her parents and she'd done that on purpose when she found a new apartment closer to the studio. Their worry over her appeared to be in direct proportion to the amount of free time she had on her hands. The busier she was, the happier they were, so she stayed away from them, even if it meant spending a lonely evening in her apartment instead of being with them. Though given family time included Simone and Tyler, Cheney was better off on her own. This week, we'll be in Scotland to celebrate his birthday. Drake sipped his milk. Golf has become my father's passion. He'll beat me handily every round. The affection in Drake's tone, his soft inflection, hinted at a deeper side of the billionaire player, one she hadn't known existed. 
I'm sure he's the one person you don't mind losing to. I will gladly lose to him any day. Drake placed his glass on the table. To tell you the truth, I've been looking forward to the holiday with him for weeks. The flight you need to catch tomorrow, she reached for a cookie off the small plate, is that to Scotland? He nodded. My father is meeting me at Heathrow. That's why Milt told me the taping must end on time. And also explained hiring locals to fill out the crew. Another nod. It'll take an act of God for me to miss that flight. I won't disappoint him. I'll make sure you don't. Thank you. You're welcome. This new sight of Drake intrigued her. She wanted to know more about him. What about your mom? Drake's eyes darkened to a deep chocolate brown. My mother left when I was two years old. I never saw her again. Cheney's heart ached for him. She couldn't imagine a mother deserting her toddler. She fought the urge to comfort him before giving in and touching his forearm. Through the fabric, his muscles bunched beneath her palm. I'm so sorry, Drake. The sentiment sounded trite, but she didn't know what else to say. She dragged her hand from him and placed it on her lap. He shrugged, but his mouth tightened. Don't be sorry. My mother had different priorities. His indifference surprised her. That's not something a child would understand. The intensity of his gaze took her breath away. Not then, but I do now. I also know how hard it was for my dad to raise me on his own. I owe him everything. He must be proud of you. A satisfied smile settled on Drake's lips. He is. The gratitude in his voice sent the warm fuzzies shooting through her. Oh. Five years ago, Cheney had fantasized about this man, family-oriented, generous, a gentleman. He was the kind of man she wanted to fall in love with someday. Yet this was only one part of Drake Lulin. She knew the other part all too well, flirt, player, and rake. Still, Cheney couldn't take her gaze off him. She sipped her milk but barely tasted the cold liquid. She could have been drinking cough syrup. His not wanting to settle down made sense now. A deep-rooted fear of abandonment kept Drake from getting too close to a woman. Recognizing that didn't change her mind about him. She wouldn't be the one to show him he was wrong. I've told you about my father. Drake placed his hand on the back of the sofa, close enough to send her leaning away from him. So far, I know your mother bakes. You told me years ago, your father owns his own financial company. Tell me about your sister. Simone is three years younger than me. My parents named her after an actress, Simone Simon. Let me guess, a horror actress. She starred in Cat People. Drake laughed. Simone and I are total opposites. In high school, I was president of the National Honor Society. She was the head cheerleader. Cheney kept her voice steady. Something difficult to do when talking about her sister. We never got along because we had nothing in common. Simone is the definition of competitive. I'm not. But there's been an odd competitiveness between us from the time we were little. I never understood it. I still don't. Some people are more competitive than others. Cheney nodded. It's all about winning for Simone. Coming out ahead. There's nothing wrong with wanting to win. I play to win. That didn't surprise Cheney. I'd rather not take part in the game. You can't win if you don't play. You can't lose if you don't play. What do you have to lose? Drake asked. Her self-respect. Her heart. Cheney shrugged. I guess I've already lost it all, and I don't want to go through the experience again. Not everyone is like your sister. Hurting people to win is unnecessary. Cheney reached for another cookie. More chocolate sounded good. I've probably painted a negative image of my sister. She's done that for herself. Simone loves Tyler. More than I ever did. Drake's mouth slanted. Yet, you agreed to marry him. His question echoed in Cheney's head. She tried to decide how to reply. 
She'd returned from her internship in London, disillusioned about love after Drake had propositioned her. She'd wanted to prove she wasn't a bad judge of men. She'd wanted to prove to herself Mr. Wright existed. I was ready to fall in love, she admitted. Tyler seemed like a safe choice. The safest choice to fit your long-range investment goals. Something along those lines. Cheney hadn't wanted to be disappointed by love, and Tyler appeared to be a sure bet. In retrospect, she might have been better off staying in London with Drake, even if that would have gone nowhere except his bedroom. At least he'd been honest about what he wanted from her. She couldn't say that about her ex-fiancé. The breakup bruised my pride and my heart, but everything worked out for the best. He wasn't my true love. Drake studied her with keen interest. You sound certain. I am, she said with confidence. My true love would never have looked twice at my sister, let alone dumped me for her. Touché. Drake's assessing gaze pierced right through her. She shifted her position on the couch. That kind of betrayal had to hurt, he added. Yes, but what could I do? Choose not to be a part of my family any longer? Seeing me hurt tore up my parents, but they couldn't pick one daughter over the other. Even if I was dying inside, I get why they supported my sister, too. Throwing a hissy fit would only make my mom and dad feel worse, so I sucked it up, agreed to be Simone's maid of honor, and the rest is history. Doormats are us. She ate a bite of her cookie. You are something else, Cheney Sullivan. His look of pride made her sit taller. She raised her chin. I'll take that as a compliment. You should. Good, because she wanted to. Being here with Drake felt more like a date than two friends sharing a late-night snack. There seemed to be a connection between them that grew stronger the more time she spent with him. That worried her. Having others join them might not be a bad thing. Cheney glanced at the library's entrance, hoping to catch someone in the hallway and invite them in. She saw no one. It's so quiet. I wonder where everyone else is. The chef set out cookies in the solarium, too. They have more than milk to drink, too, Drake explained. Maybe that's where the others are. She took another sip of her milk, wishing people would swing by the library on their way to their rooms. I have to admit, he continued. I enjoy having you to myself and getting to know you better. Me, too. Except, now that she'd seen a different side to him, Cheney wanted to know more about Drake. Questions swirled through her brain. Who else besides his father did he make time to see? How long would his mother's leaving affect him? Would he ever change his mind about committing to a woman he loved? Even though Cheney wanted to know the answers, she didn't dare ask the questions. She needed to stick to her resolve with Drake. He was not only trouble with a capital T, but also a temptation. She'd learned the hard way to avoid both at all costs. And that made it clear what she should do right now. Say goodnight. Chapter 8 On Sunday morning, a dim light filtered into the room through the open curtains. Drake rose on his elbows and stared out the arched window. The dark skies matched the storm brewing inside him. He hadn't slept well. Okay, he'd slept little, if at all. The reason, Cheney Sullivan. In less than 24 hours, she'd wormed her way under his skin. Something no other woman had managed to do in a very long time. If ever. Just friends. Yet, he couldn't stop thinking about her. She captivated him. He wanted to see her again. This morning, if possible. Another man should have staked a claim years ago. Not that Drake would. A relationship didn't interest him. Nor did he want a girlfriend. Cheney wouldn't settle for anything less. Well, I don't plan on settling down anytime soon. But she wanted to someday. I believe true love exists. That was all the information he needed to know. Pursuing Cheney would be a mistake. They held opposite views about love. He would never let a woman get close enough to hurt him the way his mother destroyed his father. In him. Besides, the last thing Drake wanted to do was hurt Cheney. 
others in her life had done that. Best to say goodbye and be done with it. Her. All he had to do was make it through today. Avoiding her seemed like his smartest option. As the day progressed, Drake didn't have to worry about seeing Cheney. She was too busy putting out fires on the set. A blown fuse had delayed taping, and she worked nonstop to get everything fixed and back on schedule. The shoot even finished early. She'd done her job beautifully, never allowing the relaxed atmosphere to become tense or anxious. Drake couldn't help but be impressed. And though his helicopter was waiting and he knew it was a bad idea, he wanted to thank Cheney for her hard work. He strode through the drizzling rain to the production office, a meeting room inside the castle, and found her sitting on the floor, packing a printer. Despite his damp hair and clothing, seeing her filled him with warmth. The sooner he said goodbye, the better. Cheney. She glanced up at him. Don't you have a helicopter to catch? In a few minutes, but I wanted to thank you before I left. You're welcome. I'm glad I could help. Her smile made his heart stumble over the next beat. He forced himself to breathe. You're all wet, she added. The rain. You English in your rain, she teased. Be careful you don't catch a cold. That would ruin your golf vacation. At the moment, Drake didn't care about his holiday, the clearest sign he should leave. But his feet remained firmly planted in place as if cemented to the floor. Getting out of there might be the smartest move, but he wasn't ready to walk away just yet. I have clothes to change into. The phone rang. She glanced at the screen. Her smile widened. It's Gemma. No doubt checking up on me. Cheney answered the call. Hey, no need to worry. We finished taping 40 minutes ago. A beat passed. And another. Her smile vanished. Her face paled. Oh, Gemma. The anguish in Cheney's voice nodded Drake's stomach. Is everything all right? He whispered. She shook her head. He took a step toward her. Drake is here. Cheney hit a button. You're on speakerphone. Hello, Jim. Drake tried to sound calm and unconcerned while his pulse raced with a mix of anxiety and forbearing. Tell me what's going on. I had an ultrasound. Gemma's voice cracked. I thought they'd be taking me off bed rest, but they saw, the placenta is separating. Drake had no idea what that meant, but it didn't sound good. The baby. The baby is fine. Gemma sniffled. At least right now. Relief flooded him. Good. It won't be easy, but you need to try not to worry, Cheney said. My doctor has restricted me to bed rest for the remainder of the pregnancy. Gemma sounded as if she had been crying. I'm so sorry, Drake. There are episodes left to tape and plans for the next season. Stop, Jim. His voice was firm but caring. The only thing that matters is you and the baby. Listen to Drake, Cheney said without a moment's hesitation, and he appreciated her backing him up. The show might need you, but your baby needs you more. But I hate leaving you and the show in the lurch, Drake. Emotion filled Gemma's already strained voice. You've done so much for Oliver and me. We'll muddle through. That's what the crew will do, Cheney encouraged. Don't worry about it, Gemma. Focus on you and the baby. If I knew things would be covered, I wouldn't worry so much, Gemma said. Otherwise, it might impact your golf holiday with your dad. Drake hadn't even considered that, but Gemma was right. A guest host, one they'd never used before, was scheduled to do the next two episodes, and another host was lined up after that. If Drake were there, they could get by without an associate producer, but problems sometimes cropped up with new hosts. Milt could only do so much on his own. You and the baby take precedent over my holiday, Jem. My father will understand if I have to cancel. As he always had in the past. If Cheney could stay on, Gemma suggested. That's a brilliant suggestion. Drake smiled. Cheney's presence would solve his dilemma. She knew what needed to be done, and she got along well with the crew. 
he wouldn't have to interact with her, as he'd be in Scotland on holiday. He looked at her. Please continue being the associate producer. I won't be at the tapings and need someone I trust to oversee things. Lines creased her forehead. I would be happy to help you out, but I need to talk to my boss before I can commit to anything. But if he said yes? Gemma asked. I could stay on for as long as he allows me to. Cheney must hear the same hope returning to Gemma's voice as he did. I'm crossing my fingers he says yes, Gemma said. I can bring you up to speed on things. Don't even think about work, Drake ordered. Talking to Cheney won't be like work, Gemma countered. More like chatting like old times. Call me once you speak to your boss. Will do, Cheney said. Oliver's here with a cup of tea and a scone. I'd better hang up. Make sure he keeps spoiling you, Cheney said. Stay off your feet and follow your doctor's orders, Drake added. I'll ring you from Scotland. On your holiday, no less. Gemma's suddenly light-hearted tone brought a smile to his face. You are the best boss in the world. I know, Drake said. Goodbye, Jim. Bye. The call disconnected. Concern clouded Cheney's hazel green eyes. You made her feel better, Drake said. Thank you. I don't want Gemma to worry, but I hope you don't feel roped into keeping me on. I understand if you'd rather find someone with more experience. After seeing you in action, I know you have what it takes for the job. And he did. The whole attraction thing, however, concerned him, but his priority was Gemma. But I hate to dump this all on you. I can delay my holiday if you'd rather return to your job. You can't delay your trip. Two lines formed above the bridge of her nose. It's your father's birthday. That wouldn't be right. No, but his dad was used to having their vacations and outings postponed. Unfortunately. It's happened before. That's one time too many, she said, voicing what Drake knew in his heart to be true. But I've got to warn you. I have no vacation time left. My boss will have to agree to a leave of absence without pay. Let's hope he agrees. That would solve the immediate situation, and his vacation would be unaffected. I'll see you're well compensated. Thanks, but this is about helping Gemma. He remembered what Cheney had said to him on Friday, I'm only here as a favor for Gemma. That was as clear as Baccarat Crystal now. Drake almost laughed at his arrogance and pride. The attraction was one-sided, his side. He'd wanted to avoid her, but he needn't worry about Cheney Sullivan. She might have gotten under his skin, but she hadn't meant to do it. She wasn't after his heart or him. She only wanted to help Gemma. Cheney had told him that more than once, but he hadn't listened. Which meant she was not only the perfect solution but also an incredible asset. All he had to do was control his attraction to her, and everything would work out fine. He could do that. Easily. She stared at the phone. It's too early to call LA, but I hope my boss says yes. The longing in her voice reaffirmed why she wanted to stay, to help out a friend, even if her staying appealed to him, too. He acquired valuable assets for his company when they became available, which gave him an idea. If he doesn't let you take a leave of absence, there's another option. What's that? You could quit. Cheney narrowed her eyes. Why would I quit my job? To take a permanent position at the Dragon Channel and enable Gemma to take as much time off as she wanted after the baby was born. It was a brilliant idea. Now all he needed was for Cheney to say yes. Her lips parted. You would hire me full-time? Yes. He had no doubt this would work to both Gemma's and his company's advantage. You proved yourself during your internship and then again during this taping. You're intelligent, conscientious, and hardworking. You've got a strong character and work ethic. You'd be a perfect fit for Dragon Lulin. And for him. If, Drake qualified with a big if, he was interested in pursuing a relationship. Which he wasn't. He stared at her earnest eyes and her pretty smile. Not the least bit interested. Work on your mind, son. 
Drake's dad asked on the seventh hole of the course they were playing. Not work. Cheney. The last person who should be in Drake's thoughts. Standing at the seventh hole, he realized he'd been staring at his club bag. He removed his eight iron. I was wondering how the taping was going. They are at the underwater resort and then we'll be moving on to Patagonia. His father studied the green. Call them. Drake had every confidence in Cheney's abilities. That was why he'd hired her. The only reason he'd hired her. He'd delegated responsibility so he could enjoy his vacation with his dad and help Gemma stop worrying about work. Drake placed his ball on the tee and took a practice swing. The iron swooshed through the air. But he had to admit he was curious how the current taping was going. No news meant good news. If there were any big problems, I would have heard something. You would rather be there. He would, Drake realized. But he needed to be here with his father. Even if Drake's mind went elsewhere on occasion, they were having a wonderful time. It's not that, Dad. I have a new associate producer. You don't think he can handle the job? She. He took another practice swing. I'm sure she's doing fine. She's competent and works hard. A curious gaze met Drake's. Pretty? That, too. His father grinned. No wonder you can't concentrate on your game. Drake frowned. He didn't want a woman to distract him. A perfect fantasy he'd created kept her front and center in his mind, but he didn't want her there. Maybe he needed to deal with Cheney differently. Instead of denying or ignoring his attraction, he should explore it. Once Drake did that, he would get her out of his system once and for all. Her appeal had to be the challenge she posed. The not knowing. The mystery. Stop thinking about work, and you'll play better, his dad said. True. Once Drake proved there wasn't anything between him and Cheney except some physical chemistry, he'd be back on his game. He swung his iron and sent the ball soaring into the air, a white dot against the steely gray sky. The ball landed on the green and rolled eight feet from the hole. His dad patted his shoulder. Outstanding shot. Now all Drake needed was a shot at Cheney, so then he could forget about her. Chapter 9 You'd be a perfect fit for Dragon Lulin. Those words had been echoing in Cheney's head for days. Yes, she might be perfect for the company, but not, it seemed, for Drake Lulin. It shouldn't bother her, right? She was doing this for Gemma, not him. And Justin had seen the benefit to the temporary position, agreeing to a leave of absence once Cheney had completed her outstanding projects. Now that she was at an underwater resort on a small island in the South Pacific to film an episode, she shouldn't even be thinking about Drake. He wasn't thinking of her since he hadn't been in touch. Granted, he was on the golfing vacation with his father, but a little interest from him would have been, well, nice. Instead, she was stuck with their guest talent, Foster Smalley, a 50-something billionaire with tanned skin, a diamond stud earring, and a buff body he enjoyed showing off by wearing a tiny swimsuit, one that appeared to shrink each day. Which probably explained why she missed Drake. Prima Donna didn't begin to describe Foster. Obsessively compulsive about working out, he demanded additional equipment be added to the resort's fully equipped gym. He only drank mineral water bottled in glass, something difficult to find on the remote island. He required approval on all his footage. And now? The temperature is too cold. Their guest host stared down his nose at Milt. I could become hypothermic. Putting my health at risk wasn't in the contract. It's a hot tub. Emphasis on hot. Milt rubbed the back of his neck no doubt, trying to ward off another headache. The entire crew had been having them since their host arrived. There's no way you'll come close to hypothermia. That water is too cold. Foster expected everyone to cater to his every desire, no matter how petty. And they'd tried. Within reason and their budget. I'm not taping this scene. Milt drew in a long breath. The tense lines around his mouth made him look as if he wanted to punch something. Or someone. Cheney knew how he felt. 
she couldn't believe Foster offered to be a guest host. Maybe he wanted to get back at Drake for something. Or maybe Foster was just a rude jerk. She could handle the temperamental talent. That was why Drake had hired her. What he wanted her to do. All she wanted was the random thoughts of him to stop popping into her mind. Soon, she hoped. Very soon. But right now, she had to rescue Milt. She squared her shoulders. Hey, Foster. She pasted on her sweetest smile. While Milt looks at different scenarios for the next scene, why don't you and I see what we can come up with ourselves? If they couldn't finish the shoot, someone would be fired. As the newest person on the crew, that would be her. Which meant she had to make the episode with Foster work. That, however, would require a full-blown miracle. Two weeks later, Cheney sat in Gemma's living room. On the table was breakfast, scones, clotted cream, fruit, and tea. I've lost track of the days. Everything has been such a blur. London, LA, the South Pacific, Patagonia. The jet lag is killing me. How do you handle it? The time changes are bad at first. Gemma lay on the couch. You eventually get used to the non-stop travel and odd hours. Drake goes out of his way to make things easier and fun, but after I got pregnant, I was always tired. No matter how much I slept at night. Well, better me than you. Cheney sunk lower in the overstuffed chair. But this is exactly the experience my boss told me I needed if I want that promotion. Gemma added sugar to her teacup. I'm sure you'll get the job now. When I resubmitted my application, my boss said the hands-on production responsibilities with the billionaire's playground would make me a strongly qualified applicant, she admitted. Of course to get the time off, I worked two 18-hour days to finish everything in my inbox so my leave wouldn't impact the department. But the effort was worth it. Not only did I get to work on more episodes, but I also get to see you again. The best part. Sure is. Cheney bit into a buttered scone. The pastry melted in her mouth and probably added an inch to her thighs. She didn't care. I haven't found scones like these at home. Gemma patted her round belly. I hope you'll come back after this little one is born and have more. You know I will. Cheney glanced at the clock. I wish I could stay longer, but I need to get to the office. A talent issue wreaked havoc with the budget, and I'm taking Milt's place at a meeting. Don't worry. You'll do great. Gemma spoke with unwavering confidence. Have a safe flight home tomorrow. Cheney stood and hugged her friend. Take care of yourself and the little one in your stomach. An hour later, she sat at a table with Drake and two bigwigs from the Dragon Channel, whom she nicknamed Salt and Pepper. Xander, a man with white hair, who couldn't have been older than 40, and Angelica, a 30-something woman with long, jet-black hair, who looked more like a beautiful actress on a weekly drama series than a television executive. The three discussed ratings, ad revenue, and the next season of The Billionaire's Playground. Cheney added her input as required, but she wished Milt hadn't asked her to step in for him. Yes, she understood his frustration over what had happened during the two tapings, but being here with Drake was messing with her and how they'd left things at the castle, namely, keep things professional and just be friends. He was her most gorgeous male friend. He still had a beard, but a tailored suit, dress shirt, and silk tie replaced his armor. Even dressed like a billionaire businessman, he had an edge to him, a dark, dangerous edge. Now Cheney was the frustrated one. She sipped her lukewarm tea. Not only did he look hot, but seeing Drake in action during the meeting increased her attraction for him. The way he answered questions, relying solely on the facts and figures stored in his brain, amazed her. He never referred to notes or a computer. To keep herself from staring, she concentrated on the financial statement. Was the talent a pain, Cheney? Xander asked. Yes. Toddlers behave better, she admitted. Everyone laughed. Drake ran his fingers over his beard. I heard you handled him well, Cheney. His compliment pleased her. 
I tried. What happened? Angelica asked. The talent's demands were excessive and expensive, as were his wife's. At least, I think she was his wife. We were never formally introduced, Cheney explained. The simplest stand-up took hours to tape because of his constant tantrums. We were more prepared in Patagonia, but he was still a problem. I documented everything in the episode summaries. You may rethink using him again. He's been taken off our list, Drake said in a matter-of-fact tone. I'm hosting the final episode of the season, so we don't run into this same problem. His gaze met hers, but then he looked away. Drake might have enjoyed his golfing holiday, but now he would have to clean up her mess. It was a good thing she was flying home tomorrow. She'd done what she could during the tapings, but it hadn't been enough. Her shoulders sagged. She disappointed him and let down Gemma. I'm sorry. It's not your fault, he said. I'd been thinking of hosting the last episode, anyway. That's true, Xander said. But no one thought you could fit it in. I switched a few things in my calendar. Drake picked up a pen from the table and twirled it with his fingers. It's not a problem. Not for her. Cheney would be back to work at the studio, a world away from a private island in the Bahamas, where they would tape the final episode. That was good because the distance would help her forget about him. He'd been on her mind too much lately. The advertisers will be pleased, Angelica said, confidently. You bring in higher ratings. Cheney nodded. We have another meeting to attend. Is there anything else? Xander asked. We've covered everything. Drake acknowledged each one of them. Thanks. As the others gathered their things, Cheney stood. She had paperwork to fill out and turn in before she left. With the way her attraction kept growing, she didn't want to be alone with him, even in a glass-walled room that reminded her of a fish tank on steroids. Wait, Cheney. The way he spoke her name sent a bevy of butterflies flapping. I want to speak to you for a minute. Her stomach nodded. Suddenly, that buttery scone she'd eaten at Gemma's seemed like a bad idea. While Drake escorted the other two people out, she sat and reviewed the notes she'd taken during the meeting. The writing on her notepad blurred. She refocused but had to read one sentence three times to make sense of the words. He sat next to her. As she tried not to notice the way he smelled, she toyed with a corner of her notepad, nervous about what he might say. Don't blame yourself for the budget overruns. I meant what I said. You did an excellent job on the episodes. You impressed everyone with your work. Milt said the situation would have been worse if you hadn't stepped in. Her tight shoulders relaxed a little. I was only doing my job, but I didn't endear myself to our guest host. You did well. And endeared yourself to the production crew and the Dragon Channel. She stifled a yawn. Thank you. You look tired. I'm a little jet-lagged. You get used to all the travel after a while. Well, I won't need to. That's right, he said. You're heading home tomorrow. She nodded. I plan on sleeping the entire eleven-hour flight. You'll need a nap today, to be ready for tonight. Tonight? Jem's surprise party. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. Cheney stared at him, confused. She was tired, but not that tired. Gemma's birthday was two months ago. Oliver and I thought a little party might cheer her up. She loves getting together with people. That's thoughtful of you, but don't you think it might overwhelm her? Jem doesn't have to do anything. Neither does Oliver, Drake said. I hired an event planner to handle the details. It will be a small Halloween party. So much for going to bed early. Cheney smiled. It'll be nice to spend more time with Gemma. Plus I can't wait to see her reaction to your surprise. I'll pick you up at your hotel. Cheney tensed. That's unnecessary. You're going to enough trouble with the party. Your hotel is on the way. A ride would be better than having to take the tube, given how tired she was. 
turning him down would be plain stupid. Okay, Cheney said. Thanks. I'll take care of everything. His watchful gaze studied her, clouded with worry. Go back to your hotel and sleep. I have to finish up a few things here, and then I will. You'd better. The concern in his voice sent a rush of warmth flowing through her. He was only being a caring boss and acting strictly professional, but she enjoyed the feeling, more than she probably should. I'll pick you up at 5.30, he said. We'll spring the surprise on Jem so the event planner can get everything set up before the other guests arrive. The thought of seeing him so soon curved Cheney's lips until she remembered she wanted distance. But she would keep away from him at Gemma's party. Tonight wasn't about Drake. It was for her longtime friend and former roommate. I'll be ready and more awake by then, Cheney said. I won't let Gemma down. Or, herself. Chapter 10 A few hours later, Drake stood in front of Cheney's hotel room door. He was anxious about tonight. About her. She was smart, hardworking, and beautiful. The party was his chance to prove nothing except physical attraction existed between them. Spending this final evening with Cheney would get her off his mind and out of his life forever. He could close this chapter and forget about it. Forget about her. The gold 323 on the door shone against the ivory-colored paint. The boutique hotel was a favorite among visiting employees. It boasted an attentive staff, nicely appointed rooms, and was within walking distance of the office and a tube station. Drake liked the place because he could walk through the lobby dressed in armor and not be noticed. He held the garment bag containing Cheney's costume in one hand and knocked with the other. The sound cracked the silence in the empty hallway like a gunshot at dawn. He shifted his weight between his feet. The door opened. Hey. Cheney wore black pants and a pink tunic. She'd pulled her hair back into a loose ponytail. Those smart girl glasses of hers were nowhere in sight, so he assumed she had put in contacts. The nap must have re-energized her. Her brows furrowed. Why are you wearing the night costume? It's a Halloween party. Those require fancy dress. Cheney's lips parted slightly. So, that's why you kept your beard. He rubbed his chin with his free hand. The whiskers brushed his fingers. Yes, and the ladies seemed to like it, too. Her mouth quirked. I'm sure they do. You don't like the beard. I didn't say that. She studied him like a piece of meat on display in the butcher's case. Normally, I don't like facial hair, but on you. Go on, he urged. The beard works. Relief rushed through him. But we have a problem, she continued. When you said Halloween party, I didn't think about needing a costume. I guess I was more tired than I realized. Never fear, my lady. I told you I would take care of everything, and I have. Drake handed her the garment bag. Your costume. Thank you. She eyed the bag warily as if it contained a poisonous snake instead of clothing. What am I going to be? Try it on, and you'll see. Okay, thanks. Cheney motioned Drake into her room. He walked inside and closed the door behind him. I'll go change, she said. I'll be quick. We've got 45 minutes until we meet the event planner in front of Gemma's house, he said. The party doesn't start until 8. Cheney disappeared into the bathroom. A zipper sounded. The garment bag? Would she like the outfit? Drake stepped farther into the room. A laptop and the notebook she'd had at the meeting earlier sat on a table. Three pens, all with caps on, lay in a neat row. He wondered if her office was as tidy and organized. Her home, too. The only thing not in perfect order was her bed. Drake touched the indention on the pillowcase where her head must have lain during her nap. He imagined the silky strands of her hair spread out over the white linen. Over him. His temperature spiraled. Unfortunately, he couldn't blame the reaction on the armor. He focused on the nightstand. Items sat on top of it, a lamp, the phone, 
a digital clock, and a small silver-framed photograph of a family with a large dog. Cheney looked like a teenager, her no longer present dimple apparent in the photograph. The other young woman was her sister. He recognized Simone from Jackson's report. She was shorter than Cheney with blonde hair. The women stood on either side of the dog, a German shepherd if Drake wasn't mistaken, and the two smiling adults were her horror movie-loving parents. They'd aged well given the recent photos of them he'd seen. The bathroom door opened. He returned the frame to its place and stepped into the center of the room. Cheney emerged. Her emerald gown brought out the green in her eyes. The tight bodice accentuated her waist. She wore her hair loose with a headpiece. She looked like a queen. He sucked in a breath. Stunning. Guinevere. As she placed her hands on her hips, her gaze narrowed. You want me to wear a Guinevere costume? He laughed at her outrage. I told you at the castle if I was going to be Lancelot, I needed her to accompany me. If I remember correctly, you wanted a willing Guinevere. Drake wouldn't let her get away with that. He knew something that might sway her. Tonight will be the perfect time for you to let go and have fun again. I don't know. Time to pull out the ace in his pocket. Does that mean you'd rather disappoint your friend by not dressing up when you have a costume? Cheney blew out a breath. Of course not, but I thought you were giving me a ride to the party, not having us attend as Guinevere and Lancelot. People may talk. I'm used to people talking about me. Unfortunately, I am, too. The last time co-workers gossiped about me, I had to find a new job. That must be when she left her father's company. Jackson's report had noted Cheney's change of employment but didn't provide a reason for her leaving. It's your last night in London. Even if someone talks, you won't be here to hear it. And as your boss, I guarantee your job is safe. And since it's your last night in town, your reputation is safe, too. I'm not worried about mine. Her concern surprised him. I appreciate the thought, but I'll be fine. Her mouth thinned. Do you always get your way? Usually. A flash of annoyance crossed her face. I figured as much. In my defense, only you would do as Guinevere. She pursed her glossed lips. I find that hard to believe. It's true. She was the only woman he wanted to be with right now. Be my queen at the party. She pressed her lips together. Drake recognized her hesitation. Tomorrow she could do whatever she wanted, but tonight he wanted her with him. Do it for Jem. A beat passed. And another. Something, loyalty, perhaps, flickered in Cheney's eyes. He had her. For Gemma, Cheney said finally. Thank you. He bowed. In return, I shall be your protector tonight. No, I'll be yours, she countered. You'll need someone to protect you from the women at the party who will want to see what you're wearing under the shining armor. He grinned, enjoying this. Her. Drake played to win. He wasn't about to lose tonight. You're welcome to borrow my sword if you need it. Thank you, sire. She curtsied. I'll do whatever it takes to ensure your safety and your virtue. Then she'd better stay far, far away from him. She was too lovely for his own good. But given she was leaving the country tomorrow, he needn't worry. He extended his arm. Our transport awaits us, my lady. She grabbed her purse. Transport? My limo. With a shake of her head, Cheney linked her arm with his. Why do I have a feeling tonight will be like an episode of The Billionaire's Playground? Perhaps because I'm a billionaire, and London is one of my playgrounds. She gave him a look. How many times have you used that line before? He grinned. It appears one time too many. She laughed. Let's go surprise Gemma. Chapter 11 Drake sure knew who to call when throwing a party. Outside Gemma's house, Cheney found an army of people, the event planner, caterer, florist, servers, bartenders, even a DJ. If a small gathering requires this much help, I can't imagine what your idea of a full-blown party would look like. 
He shrugged. I may have gone overboard. She studied the items waiting to go into Gemma's modest house. Two burly-looking men stood next to a gold, Cleopatra-style chaise. You think? Cheney teased. That night costume fits your deeds tonight. He bowed and then led her to the front door. Oliver answered with a finger at his lips, telling them to be quiet. The three of them went into the living room where Gemma lay and yelled, Surprise! Gemma's eyes widened, and her mouth hung open. What's with the fancy dress? Oliver kneeled next to her. Drake is throwing you a Halloween party. Her gaze traveled to each of them until settling on Cheney. Really? Cheney nodded. There's even a costume for you. A special one, Drake said. For the guest of honor. Gemma covered her mouth with her hands. Her eyes gleamed. I, she lowered her hands. Thank you. Wait until you see what Drake plans on bringing into your house, before you express your gratitude, Cheney teased. Gemma shimmied her shoulders. I can't wait to see it all. Forty-five minutes sped by. As people readied the house for the party, Cheney helped Gemma put on a Cleopatra costume and wig. Oliver situated the mother-to-be on her gold chaise throne, which was the only furniture except for chairs remaining in the living room. The burly guys had been busy like everyone else. The delicious scent of food drifted out from the kitchen. A buffet graced the dining room table. The DJ set up his equipment and put down a temporary dance floor. Gemma wore a white Egyptian gown, a gold collar, a black wig, and thick eyeliner. My house is now party central. I can't believe it. Believe it, Drake said. And enjoy your party. Cheney knew he cared about his employees, but this party went beyond what a typical boss would do for an employee. She didn't get it or him, but she appreciated how his efforts had put a big smile on Gemma's face. Gemma made herself comfortable on the chaise. I will. Less than an hour later, the party was in full swing. Waiters carried trays of hot appetizers and Halloween-themed drinks. The DJ played dance songs, including the Monster Mash and Thriller, and whatever other music guests requested. The top-notch dessert buffet was a huge hit. Gemma beamed. You are the best boss in the world, Drake. He winked. Told you so. He told me so, too. Oliver, dressed as Mark Antony, held his wife's hand and gazed lovingly into her eyes. I wasn't sure about a party at first, but Drake was right about it bringing your smile back. Oliver kissed Gemma. Seeing her friend with her adoring husband brought a taffy-sized lump to Cheney's throat. The two loved each other so much. She had never felt that way about anyone, not even Tyler. She hoped she would someday. Her gaze strayed to Drake. Once upon a time, she'd wanted him to be the love of her life. She'd been so young then, full of daydreams and unrealistic expectations. But now seeing him, so handsome and noble in the night costume, made her almost believe Drake could still be the one. He looked at her with an odd expression on his face. Embarrassed to be caught staring, she picked up Gemma's empty glass. I'll refill this with the sparkling cider. As time flew, the food and drink overflowed. Music played and people danced. From her throne, Gemma glowed. She was closer to her old self than she'd been in a while. Cheney wouldn't have wanted to miss tonight for the world, and Drake was the one to thank for that. Drake. Cheney had lost track of him. In the kitchen and dining room, she found a mummy, a construction worker, a French maid, but no knight. She glanced around the crowded living room. Something shiny and silver caught her eye. She peered closer. Definitely armor and... Oh. Three hungry-looking women surrounded him. One, a brunette, displayed her assets in a Playboy bunny suit. Another, a blonde, rocked a revealing pirate costume. The third, a redhead, wore a black cape around her shoulders, a leather corset, fishnet stockings, and sharp as her stiletto heels vampire teeth. All three women looked as if they wanted to take a bite of Drake. An unfamiliar possessiveness grabbed hold of Cheney. 
She might not be his official date, but they'd come as Lancelot and Guinevere. Cheney had also said she would be his queen tonight and promised to protect him. Time to put her words into action. Squaring her shoulders, she headed toward him. The flow of the gown made her feel strong and powerful, as if she were the legendary queen with the two bravest, hottest men in the kingdom in love with her. Excuse me, ladies, she laced her fingers with drakes, not easy to do with him wearing gauntlets, but the DJ is playing our song next. If looks could kill, Cheney would be a goner. She didn't care. Not with the pleased smile lighting up his face. Confidence shot through her. She pulled Drake onto the makeshift dance floor, joining a handful of couples. His warm gaze met hers. A little possessive tonight, darling. Not possessive, she faced him, protective. The faster beat gave way to a slow song. As his smile crinkled the corners of his eyes, he held her right hand with his left and assumed a dance position. She stood in between his feet, careful not to touch his thighs with her legs, feeling an odd mix of embarrassment and pleasure. His right hand rested on her hip. Some might call it territorial. A queen's prerogative. She placed her left hand on his shoulder. The armor was hard beneath her palm. Would you rather I send you back to the Piranhas? I'd rather dance to our song. What is it? She listened to the music. Can't Help Falling in Love by Elvis Presley. A good thing the song wasn't Hound Dog. Cheney laughed. As the romantic lyrics played, she followed Drake's lead. He spun her around with ease. She loved to dance, but she felt like a newbie compared to him. How did you become such a good dancer? My father. He never learned to dance, but thought I should. Drake shifted his hand to the small of her back. He bartered car repairs for dance lessons. That's resourceful. He had to be. Once again, pride sounded in his voice. The way it had the last time he'd talked about his dad. She thought that was sweet. I didn't know any guys who took dance lessons when I was growing up, she admitted. Well, if any did, they most likely kept the fact to themselves. Drake pulled her closer. Some boys teased me, and I got into a fight or two over the lessons. A fight? Cheney enjoyed hearing about his past. Especially now. She didn't have to think about how good dancing with him felt. That's awful. Not so awful. His smile lit up his eyes. I had the last laugh, because I learned how to sweep a girl off her feet. Drake spun her around again. Dancing with him was almost magical. Shivery pulses of pleasure shot through her. I bet you've only improved your techniques over the years. Perhaps, but I've never swept a queen off her feet. He gave her a smoldering stare. Are you game? Her pulse quickened, and she forced herself to breathe. It wasn't easy. I don't play, remember? There's always a first time. Don't forget, you found your adventurous side at the castle. He tempted Cheney, but the line between reality and fantasy was blurring once again. She couldn't allow that to happen. Dancing would have to be enough. I'm sure you could have your pick of any woman at the party, excluding Gemma, if you want to sweep someone off her feet. I have the one I want right here. Guinevere, you mean. Wicked mischief lit his eyes. No one else, but Gwen will do tonight. Cheney wanted to believe him. She wanted to pretend and live the fantasy for a while longer. Then, dance with your queen. As they danced, her heels tangled with the hem of her gown. Drake's hands tightened around her. She leaned forward. Her chest bumped against Drake's armored breastplate. Sorry, she mumbled. I've got you. That's what I'm afraid of. So much for fantasy. She'd just gotten doused with a bucket full of reality. Cheney straightened and then cleared her dry throat. Thanks. The pleasure is all mine. His gaze remained fixed on her, as if no one else was dancing or in the crowded room with them. My queen. Her heart thumpity thumped. Cheney didn't know what to make of Drake, Lulin. 
She wanted to pierce his ever-so-charming, sinfully handsome exterior and learn more about the man, about his past, his hopes, and his dreams. This is a first for me, he said as if reading her mind. Dancing in armor? Yes, but I was thinking of having a song. I've never had a song with anyone I've dated. We're not dating, she blurted. Friends, remember. This feels like a date, he countered. I picked you up. I'll take you home. Not home, she corrected. To my hotel. I'll take you wherever you desire to go, my lady. Cheney desired him. She wet her lips. I've never had a song with anyone, either. What about your fiancé? She didn't even have to think about that question. No, we didn't have a song. Well, then this is a first for both of us. Us? The word reverberated through her. With Drake's hands on her and hers on him, she felt like part of us, one half of a couple, but the song about falling in love could never be their song. He would never play the fool by rushing into a relationship. And forget about him falling in love with her. That would never happen. He wasn't looking for love, didn't want it. But wearing this costume and playing as queen for the evening made his words easy to ignore. She couldn't do that. Cheney squared her shoulders as if preparing for a battle, not finishing off a slow dance. This song can be Lancelot and Guinevere's. The lyrics fit them better than us. Drake tipped his head. Whatever you say, my queen. The song ended, but his hands remained on her waist. Their gazes stayed locked on each other. A new song began. Something faster, louder. Cheney was still touching him, and she jerked her hands away. Something about him made her forget her manners. Not to mention common sense and her resolve to be immune to him. She would need a vaccination for that to happen, but the least she could do was separate herself from him now. I'm warm in this gown, she said. I'm going to wander out to the garden where it's cooler. I'll go with you, he offered, removing his gauntlets. So much for time away from him. She bit back a sigh, trying to focus on the good things he'd done, like putting on this party. He wasn't making her feel all fluttery inside on purpose. Cheney wove her way through the crowd until she stepped out the back door. The sudden drop in temperature brought goose bumps to her arms, but the fresh air filled her lungs and cleared her mind. Cooler now? Drake asked, setting his gauntlets on a wooden bench. She nodded, but with him so close, her muscles tensed. At least they didn't have to shout to hear each other. The music and noise from the party were muted outside. Your armor must be hot. He raised a brow. Just my armor? I didn't know knights fished for compliments. Drake laughed. Knights fish for many things, but aren't always successful in catching them. Desire filled his dark eyes, making her feel as if she might be the next thing he wanted to hook and reel in. Better not go there. She took a deep breath. Thanks for throwing this party for Gemma and making it possible for me to attend. That's what friends are for. Friends. Gemma was his friend. And she was Cheney's, too. Was that what he meant? She hoped so, because thinking of him as only her friend would kill the fantasy growing in her head, a fantasy fueled by dancing together. He came closer, an imposing figure, a tall, dark knight in armor and a beard. I'm enjoying tonight. Me, too. He ran the edge of his finger along her jawline. His touch sent tingles skittering through her. I know something that would make tonight even more enjoyable, he said softly. What? she asked, sounding as breathless as she felt. A devilish heat flared in his eyes. A kiss. Cheney's heart slammed against her chest. Bad idea. Seems like a brilliant one to me. She shook her head. Not as long as I'm working for you. Drake arched a brow. I'm not your boss. Semantics. She struggled to hold on to a firm grasp of reality. But his finger, calloused, not smooth, lightly rubbing her face felt so good. You own the cable channel. You're the executive producer of the show. You don't report to me. 
He closed the space between them until his face was mere inches from hers. Cheney's heart felt as if it might explode from pounding so fast. But. You're leaving tomorrow. She was. I'm on the payroll until then. A kiss. Think about it. Heaven help her, but she was thinking about it. Just the thought heated the blood pulsing through her veins. What harm could come from one little kiss, he asked. Oh, she wanted to believe him, but practicality pushed its way through his hypnotic charm. Think Helen of Troy and Paris, Guinevere and Lancelot, Tristan and Isolde, Romeo and Juliet. That's a no, then? Cheney said nothing. She couldn't. A part of her wanted to run far, far away. But another part wanted to kiss him so she'd know, know that what she'd walked away from five years ago wasn't worth dwelling on, know he wasn't anything special now. Cheney. The affection in his voice made it difficult for her to remain immune from his charm. From him. Though she was flying home tomorrow and wouldn't see him again, she didn't want to give in to temptation. She was too afraid of being hurt. Still, her gaze kept returning to his lips. Lips she'd memorized years ago and dreamed about even now. If Guinevere were here, she would allow Lancelot to kiss her. Drake cupped Cheney's face lightly. You agreed to be my queen tonight. The desire in his eyes thrilled and frightened her. Her resolve weakened. She didn't want to give up so easily. For a noble knight, you're not playing fair. His warm breath fanned her cheek. One kiss is more than fair, my queen. Anticipation shot from her lips down to her toes. She swallowed. Just one? Only one. He lowered his hand. A goodbye kiss. Slowly, as if giving her the chance to say no or back away again, he brought his mouth toward hers. Every nerve ending twitched in hope. But a voice, common sense, perhaps, shouted a warning. Too late. She raised her chin and closed her eyes. His lips gently touched hers as if joining something delicate or fragile. Light, soft, tender. His mustache and beard brushed her skin. She was surprised at how soft the hair was. Not quite a ticklish feather, but not a scratchy whisker, either. He kept his lips on hers. Gentle yet firm. His kiss made her feel cherished and adored, and she enjoyed thinking he cared for her in that way. An inviting warmth, like a sunny day after a rainstorm, settled over her as if she'd finally reached the destination she'd been seeking. She soaked up the flavors of him, salt, wine, a hint of chocolate. He kept his hands at his sides and only touched her with his lips. Yet their closeness made it feel as if she were in his embrace. Not at all how she thought Drake Lulin would kiss, but it was enough to tell her what she'd known in her heart, what she'd feared. One kiss would never be enough. He brushed his hand through her hair, the strand sifting through his fingers. She leaned into the kiss. Into him. She touched his face, feeling the smoothness of his cheek, the texture of his beard, beneath her palm. Her touch seemed to be the invitation he needed. His hand circled her waist and pulled her against him. She went eagerly, almost impatiently, toward him, placing her hands over the armor, encasing his shoulders. He increased the pressure against her mouth. She did the same, rising on her tiptoes to get as close to him as his costume allowed. She wove her fingers through his wavy hair. The gentleness of his kiss changed, slowly at first, before spiraling into something more. Something hot. Sparks flared. Fire ignited. Passion grew. Hunger took over. She couldn't get enough of him, of his kisses. More, she wanted more. Kiss after kiss filled her with pleasure. She shivered, with want. Cheney took what he offered and gave back even more. As his lips moved expertly over hers, sensation crashed through her. Her knees went weak, and she clung to him to keep from sliding to the ground. His strong hands splayed against her back, drawing her closer. She longed to touch him, to feel the warmth of his skin, not the cool metal of his armor. Oh, Drake, she murmured. As he dragged his lips from hers, 
his ragged breathing matched her own. Surprise filled his dark eyes. Cheney struggled to clear her head so she could think, but she was still awash in sensation. Her brain felt as if cotton candy had replaced the gray matter. But she didn't mind. She smiled, in awe of the man who had kissed her as if his life depended upon one kiss. On her. Her lips throbbed. She fought the urge to touch them, to see if they were as swollen and bruised as they felt. Instead, she caressed Drake's face, stroking the soft beard, soaking up his strength. He inhaled deeply. She lowered her arm to her side. No one had ever kissed her like that. She couldn't imagine ever meeting someone else who could kiss her that way again. His kisses had stolen her breath and nearly captured her heart. She understood why Guinevere might have fallen for Lancelot if his kiss had made her feel half as special as Drake had made Cheney feel. All she wanted was to kiss him again. Hope flared. Maybe one kiss wouldn't be enough for Drake, either. Her smile widened, hoping he felt that way, too. A long-distance relationship might not be entirely impossible. If he wanted, she would try it. He stared at her, with his dark eyes framed by ridiculously long eyelashes. No man had a right to be so gorgeous. Not that she was complaining. Especially if he kissed her again. You were correct, he said. She wet her lips. About what? A vein flicked at his jaw. A kiss wasn't a very good idea at all. Chapter 12 What had he done? When Drake finished kissing Cheney, she'd stared up at him with hazel green eyes full of such wonder and hope he couldn't breathe. The way she touched his face so lovingly had squeezed his heart like a vice. The flash of hurt and confusion in her gaze now knifed him in the gut. He dragged his hand through his hair. I'm sorry, Cheney. Sorry? She pursed her swollen, thoroughly kissed lips. You're sorry you kissed me? Yes. He'd kissed other beautiful women, but none had responded like her, making him feel as if she were the air he needed to breathe. She'd wanted more. Drake, too. Kissing Cheney had been like finding a hidden treasure, one he wanted to keep all to himself. Only the sound of her voice, a murmur of his name, had made him realize how close he was to losing control. Everything Drake thought he understood, everything he thought he knew, had flipped upside down and inside out. With only a kiss. One kiss. His plan to get her out of his system had backfired. And now he needed her out of his life more than ever. He raised his chin. Yes. I see. Cheney pressed her lips together. And so did he. She had reason to be upset with him. He'd pursued her all evening, and the incredible kiss gave her the right to expect more, and that concerned him. Okay, it had him quaking in his boots. She was so much more than a pair of soft lips, so much more than a body pressed against him. She was so much more than he expected, so much more than he wanted. Drake couldn't wait for her to go home where she belonged. If he could, he'd send her back across the pond tonight. Kissing her had sent his world spinning off its axis. He wanted his world back where it should be, thank you very much. Cheney straightened. Why did you kiss me? I wanted to know. What? Know what kissing you would feel like. Now Drake wished he could turn back the clock. Forget about getting over her. Her kiss would linger with him for a long time. So would her memory. At least physically, she would be far away from him. Her steady gaze met his. Yet, you're sorry. I was selfish. And stupid. When Drake had kissed her, he'd wanted to get her out of his mind. He hadn't acknowledged the consequences, that he might want more kisses, more of Cheney. His reaction was outside his comfort zone, his experience. And his control. That made her dangerous. As Cheney returned his kiss, she'd seeped inside him and headed straight to his heart. The one place that was off limits. You're leaving town tomorrow. I don't want you to think. It's not like we'll see each other again. An excuse, Drake realized the moment the words left his mouth. He couldn't tell her the truth. 
he'd always been good at compartmentalizing, his work, his father, the women he dated. But Cheney opened up the doors and mixed things up. What belonged outside suddenly was inside. He didn't like that. Worse, he'd lost himself while kissing her. Nothing but Cheney had mattered. Making a woman the entire focus of his world would be a huge mistake. He'd learned his lesson from his father. Love faded, leaving broken hearts, unfulfilled promises, and dark loneliness. Drake wanted no part of that. If I overstepped my... It was one kiss, she interrupted. No big deal. A goodbye kiss, right? Her words bristled like the quills of a porcupine. No big deal. Maybe, or maybe not. He hadn't mistaken her response or hunger. He'd tasted her passion. Even her cheeks remained flushed. Yet self-preservation kept his ego in check, even if goodbye felt like a double-edged sword. What did you expect I would do, she continued. Beg you to take me to bed despite you thinking the kiss was a mistake? Or sue you for sexual harassment? Drake tried to imagine her doing either. He couldn't. I expected nothing. I just wanted to. Remove any doubt. Yes. You've done that. No worries. I know where things stand. Friends. Oh, I don't think so. A car alarm blared and then stopped. She glanced toward the house before her gaze returned pointedly to him. As you said, after tonight, we won't be seeing each other again. Drake swallowed around the unexpected lump of panic, even though he wanted Cheney out of his life. So, if we're not friends, what are we? Co-workers. A beat passed. Former co-workers. He winced. I can live with that. It wasn't as if he had another choice. Drake might be able to live with that, but could Cheney? She hadn't expected him to accept her suggestion to be former co-workers so easily. That hurt. More than she cared to admit. But what else could she have said to him? And now? The only thing she wanted was for the ground to open up and swallow her whole. She glanced around the garden, at the white birdbath near a tree, at a silly gnome figure under a bush, at anything that wasn't Drake. Cheney didn't know how long she stood there saying nothing. Not that it mattered. She was already a total fool for turning a kiss into something big enough to want to take a chance on a relationship. On love. With him. Pathetic. She'd been so close to blurting out her thoughts and feelings. She'd even considered a long-distance relationship. Cheney grimaced. Yet he'd called the entire episode a mistake as if he'd gotten off at the wrong tube stop or ordered his coffee incorrectly. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Cheney needed her head examined because she hadn't learned her lesson. She would this time. It wasn't that hard to remember. Not dating, good, kissing men like Drake, bad. Maybe someday she would meet a nice, regular guy and want to date him. But tonight proved she wasn't ready. Goosebumps prickled her skin. She crossed her arms over her chest. You're cold, Drake said finally, breaking the silence in the yard. She forced herself not to look at him. I came out here to cool off. You're almost shivering. She wished he hadn't noticed or sounded as if he cared. I'm going to see if Gemma needs anything. Good idea. Cheney hurried into the house. The warmer temperature did nothing to take away the deep chill. She wrapped her arms around herself. People surrounded her, but she felt so alone. The same way she felt when she was with her family. And like those times, she knew what to do, paste on a smile and pretend nothing was wrong. She squeezed past the partygoers. The volume of the music had increased, as had the noise level of conversations. The three women from earlier eyed her before disappearing. They must be in search of their prey. No doubt, the three would happily agree to be friends with Drake. Bitterness coated Cheney's mouth. The three could have him. He wasn't her problem. He wasn't her anything. She headed toward the chaise where Gemma lay. 
The sight of Oliver whispering into his wife's ear stopped Cheney in her tracks. The couple gazed at each other with a combination of affection and respect. Talk about hitting the romance jackpot. The two had found their perfect match. Would she ever find hers? Cheney touched her lips. At this rate, no. On that depressing note, she eyed the dessert buffet but thought better of eating more sweets. Instead, she waited for Oliver to walk away, and once he had, she knelt next to Gemma. Do you need anything? Cheney asked. I have more than I need, but thanks. Her friend's smile widened. Where have you been? The garden. This costume is lovely, but it's hot. Are you sure dancing with Drake didn't overheat you? Gemma teased, the way she had when they'd worked and lived together. That had been before Oliver, before Tyler, before so many things. You were right about him looking hot in that armor. He's practically scorching. The ratings will soar when that episode airs. Thank goodness for the low lighting. Remembering what she'd told Gemma about the taping at the castle must be turning Cheney's cheeks red. He makes a dashing night. He's a good dancer, too. I only danced with him to save him from the circling sharks. I saw the hungry trio, Gemma said. They didn't like how cozy the two of you looked. It was just a dance. Nothing more? Gemma sounded curious. Cheney thought about the kiss in the garden, about the way her lips still throbbed, about what he'd said to her afterward. No. Drake entered the living room. His gaze met Cheney's, before he looked away. The trio of women closed in on him. A heavy weight pressed down on her. She forced a smile. See, nothing. I do see, Gemma said. And I'm relieved. You're one of my best friends, and Drake's the best boss in the world, but he's also a heartbreaker. I don't want to see you hurt again. Too late. Cheney had been hurt. Okay, more embarrassed than hurt after he'd dashed her hopes by saying the kiss had been a mistake. Trust me. I don't want that to happen, either. If she felt like this after one kiss, what damage could he do to her if things got serious? It was best to walk away. And it won't. After tonight, I'll never see him again. Even if her selfish lips and her stupid heart might want her to. On the way to her hotel, two hours later, Cheney sat alone in the back seat of the limousine. She was disappointed with Drake and with herself. He'd made a play for her, kissed her silly, made her believe in love, and think long-distance relationships, before dropping her to hang with the bimbo trio for the rest of the evening. Shame on him. And shame on her. Cheney stretched out her legs. The limousine seemed larger without Drake who had stayed at the party, to supervise cleanup. Better he was there than here. Yet she couldn't stop thinking about him. Before she left, she'd bumped into him on the dance floor. The moment was awkward and tense. His hand kept her upright, and her body had immediately responded to his touch. Physical attraction. Chemistry. Just like his kisses. That was all it was. All it could be. Cheney sighed. She wanted to believe in happily ever after, that a man could love her for who she was. Once again, Drake had proven he wasn't that guy. Well, I don't want Belle's love or anyone else's, so I don't have to worry about doing anything. His words at the castle should have warned her away from him. She leaned her head against the leather seat. Her cell phone rang. Drake? She wished her heart hadn't leaped at the thought. She pulled the phone from her purse and checked the number. Not Drake, her boss at the studio. It was afternoon in Los Angeles. Hello, Justin, she said, trying to sound cheerful. What's going on? I have some bad news, Cheney. Oh, no. Her heart sank even lower. I didn't get the promotion. No, you didn't, but it's more than that. He sighed. The studio is cutting the budget by 25% and requiring headcount reductions. While you've been away, we've been able to split your workload, so your position has been eliminated. 
She listened in disbelief, trying to process what he'd said. She'd been dumped. Again. Dumped by Drake and now, by her boss. All she needed was Tyler or Simone to call her, and Cheney would have a trifecta. But it wasn't funny. The past was repeating itself once again, and she hated that. Her chest tightened, matching her tense muscles. A lump burned in her throat. She took a deep breath, trying to force air into her lungs that no longer appeared to function correctly. But she couldn't give up. She had to fight for her job. Herself. But I completed my work before I left, so my leave of absence wouldn't overwhelm any of you. There wasn't anything to split unless something new arrived. It's a done deal, Cheney. She didn't hear any regret in Justin's voice. Why not? Wasn't she a good employee? Tears stung her eyes. So, just like that, I'm fired? Not fired, he corrected. Laid off. On Monday, return your keys and ID, HR will explain your severance package, retrieve your items from your cubicle, and perform an exit interview with you. Two years of hard work and loyalty, and this was her reward, a late-night call taking away the one thing that had been going right in her life, her job. It was the same thing that had happened when she'd had to leave her father's company because of Tyler and Simone. How had this happened again? Emotion clogged her throat. If you have anything at home, Justin continued. I trust you to turn it in. Trust. Cheney nearly laughed. She'd trusted Justin when he said the leave of absence was no problem, and she'd probably end up with a promotion when she returned. She'd also trusted Drake tonight when she'd kissed him back. Tell me one thing, please. She struggled to understand the logic of her boss's decision because she'd had good reviews and been called a model employee. She'd never been disciplined. Not once had she been warned about her work or behavior. Even Drake and the people she'd worked with on the three episodes had praised her. Being laid off made no sense. Did I ever have a real shot at the promotion? Her boss, whom she'd worked countless hours to make look good, didn't say a word. The silence on the line intensified, making her more uncomfortable. The same way she'd felt with Drake after he told her the kiss had been a mistake and then flirted with the three women during the rest of the party. Cheney wanted to sink low in the seat and disappear, but she forced herself to sit tall. Justin? HR will respond to your questions on Monday morning, he said. Good luck in the future, Cheney. He hung up. No, thank you. No, let's get everyone together for a goodbye drink. No answers. Tonight proved what she should have known before. She was a lousy judge of character. She picked the wrong job, the wrong men, and the wrong loyalties. Cheney stared at the cell phone in her hand. What was she going to do? Enjoy your flight, the customer service representative at the gate said the next morning at Heathrow Airport. Cheney adjusted the prescription sunglasses, hiding her puffy red and tired eyes. Last night, she'd tried to drown her emotions with ice cream. It hadn't helped. Thank you. Leaving London saddened her. Being laid off from her job stung. And losing Drake. She sucked in a breath. He was never hers to begin with. The sooner she accepted that, the sooner she would stop feeling as if she'd lost her best friend. Cheney boarded the flight and found her seat. Thank goodness she was next to the window. All she wanted to do was buckle her seatbelt and sleep for the next 11 hours. But each time she closed her eyes, she imagined Drake or the phone call from Justin or Drake again. Sleep would be futile, the same as it had been last night. She watched the in-flight movie instead. Just her luck. A romantic comedy with an impossibly perky heroine who never gave up and an improbable happy ending complete with the couple riding off into the sunset. Yeah, right. As the credits rolled, she closed her eyes, but once again, thoughts of Drake filled her mind. She remembered seeing him in the Great Hall at Abbotsford Castle. He'd had a beard and worn the knight's costume. She recalled when they'd sat in the library talking, munching on cookies, and drinking milk. 
she couldn't forget when he came to say goodbye to her with his rain-soaked hair curled into ringlets. And kissing him in the garden. Cheney squeezed her eyes shut, trying to stop the scene from replaying in her mind. It didn't help. At least she wouldn't have to keep seeing him the way she did with Tyler. And honestly, what had she and Drake shared except a few hours together and some fantastic kisses? Nothing. Once she was home, she would be too busy applying for jobs to think about him. The memories would fade. At LAX, she stood in the baggage claim area. You lost my luggage? Not lost, said a man wearing an airline's uniform. Misdirected. Once your bags arrive, we'll deliver them. Just what she needed to top off a terrible 24 hours. As Cheney walked outside to catch a shuttle, she turned on her cell phone. It beeped with a voice message. She hit play. Welcome home, sweetheart, her mother said. Call me as soon as you can. Don't make any plans for tomorrow night. We're having a dinner party. Everyone wants to hear about your trip. Her mom made it sound as if Cheney had been on vacation, not working her tail off and getting her heart bruised. She grimaced. Dealing with her family and their friends for an entire evening was so not what she needed. She glanced around at the passengers with suitcases and laptop bags. What Cheney needed was a knight in shining armor to whisk her away. An image of a bearded drake popped into her mind. Scratch that. What she really needed was a new life. Chapter 13 Drake wanted to get his life back to normal. Sitting in his limousine, he adjusted his tie. Tonight's gallery opening was the kind of event he enjoyed attending. Four of his favorite things would be there, art, food, wine, and women. A newer assistant on the 17th floor, a cheerful young woman with short, spiked hair, had invited him to her sister's first exhibit. Drake was happy to accept the invitation. His brief appearance at a new artist show would create buzz and bring much-needed publicity. It was the least he could do for his employee and her sister. Except. Making others happy made him feel good, too, but tonight didn't satisfy him as it should. Not the way surprising Gemma last night had pleased him. Maybe once he arrived at the gallery, that feeling would return. How much farther, Edward? Drake asked. We're almost there, sir. His long-time chauffeur yawned. No doubt, Edward was tired from working late last night. I appreciate you putting in the long hours yesterday. Go home after you drop me off at the gallery. Thank you, sir, the missus will appreciate that, but last night wasn't so bad. Easier for me than Miss Sullivan. Cheney. Drake straightened. In what way? That call from her boss. What call? Edward glanced in the rearview mirror. If she didn't say, it's not my place. If I know what happened, I can help her. Yes, sir. He signaled to change lanes. She received a call on the way to the hotel. Let go, she was. Drake swore under his breath. He leaned forward. Sacked? Edward nodded. Took me a minute to figure it out myself. Very professional, she was. I asked if she needed anything. She wanted ice cream, so I stopped at a Sainsbury's before dropping her off. Thank you. Drake took care of people and fixed things, yet Cheney hadn't called. That annoyed and upset him. He wanted to take care of the person who'd helped him and Gemma. If Cheney was paying the ultimate price, unemployment, because of the leave of absence from her job, Drake needed to do something. He brushed his hand through his hair. She should have called him. Except. She wouldn't have called, not after what happened in the garden. Guilt lodged in his throat. Things had gotten too personal between them. Which proved mixing work with pleasure was a bad idea. But Drake wouldn't allow Cheney's not calling to stop him. He needed to find her and fix this. Getting involved was a personal. Good bosses did that, and he would. Whether or not she wanted his help. On Sunday afternoon, Cheney sat on her couch with a robe wrapped around her and slippers on her feet. 
She held a pint of Ben and Jerry's New York Super Fudge chunk ice cream in one hand and a spoon with the other. Hi, Mom, Dad, everyone I've known my entire life. She practiced what she would say at her parents' dinner party tonight. No, I didn't bring a date, but since so many of you are afraid I've stopped liking men, you'll be happy to know I've been crushing on my boss, who thinks kissing me was a huge mistake. She ate a spoonful of ice cream. Oh, yeah, and the promotion I applied for at the studio? Didn't get it. Instead, I lost my job. That's right. I'm unemployed. She stabbed the spoon into the container and scooped another bite. And before I'll forget. I'm sorry for wearing sweatpants, but the airlines lost my luggage. Not that my clothes will fit after I've eaten nothing but ice cream for the past two days. Staring into the half-empty pint, she grimaced. Tonight will be a disaster, an epic failure by the daughter-voted girl most likely to succeed by her high school senior class. Simone will think it's Christmas. The doorbell rang. Cheney stood. Her luggage must have arrived from wherever it had been misdirected. With her pint of ice cream in hand, she padded to the front door and opened it. Drake. The air whooshed from her lungs. She opened her mouth to speak, but her tongue felt too thick, and no words would come out. Hello there, Cheney. His accented voice disarmed her. His casual clothes, a dark jacket, a striped button-down shirt, and black jeans, made her weak in the knees. The container of ice cream slipped from her hand. He caught the pint in midair and handed it to her. I'm a Cherry Garcia fan myself. In case she was dreaming again, Cheney blinked. When she opened her eyes, he was still there. She touched her unwashed hair and glanced down at her furry robe. She must look frightful. What are you doing here? I was in the neighborhood. She gave him a don't mess with me look. Concern filled his brown eyes. How are you? Cheney didn't want his pity. She pulled her robe tighter. Fine. Sick? No she should have said yes, because of wearing a robe in the middle of the day. But the ice cream was a dead giveaway, she wasn't ill. My driver said you lost your job, Drake admitted. I feel responsible. If you hadn't taken a leave of absence to help me out, things might have turned out differently for you. She winced before pulling herself back together, good practice for tonight. Thanks for your concern, but none of this is your fault. I wanted to gain production experience. No regrets about that. What she regretted was kissing him. She'd gotten caught up in the whole Lancelot fantasy. She wouldn't allow herself to believe it could be anything more. And that was when she realized. He no longer looked like a knight. Your beard is gone. He ran his hand over his smooth face. Halloween has passed. I packed the armor, too. If only she could tuck away her attraction as easily. She thought once he'd shaved his beard, erasing the whole night archetype and fantasy that had been brewing in her dreams, she would feel differently about him. She believed her attraction would disappear and so would her desire to kiss him again. But she didn't, it hadn't, and she still did. I have a proposal for you, he announced. Her heart lodged in her throat. A proposal, as in a marriage proposal? Okay, she realized a nanosecond later, that was a stupid thing to think. I'm listening. Come work for me. What? Be the show's associate producer during the final taping, he explained. Once we complete the episode, you can continue with the billionaire's playground while gems on maternity leave, or find a different position at the Dragon Channel or do something else within Dragon Lulin. I have offices around the world, so that will make the visa process easier if you choose to be in the UK at the corporate headquarters. If London is where you want to be, we'll pay extra for the priority service, so you don't have to wait long to start working. She stared at him in disbelief. You're offering me a job, just like that? We discussed my reasons for wanting to hire you at the castle. Cheney thought about the surprise party. The mix of emotions and memories clouded her brain. That was before you kissed me. His lips thinned. The kiss was no big deal, remember? 
I remember. No big deal, compared to a 7.0 earthquake. She'd been protecting herself when she'd said that, and with good reason. He'd called the kiss a mistake when she'd felt it was the most perfect thing in the world. I just want to make sure everything is out in the open and clear. That's usually my line. I'm a fast learner. I like that about you. Drake removed folded pieces of paper from his jacket pocket and handed them to her. Here. She opened it. A round-trip ticket from LAX to NAS. Los Angeles to Nassau. This has my name on it. Yes. She read the date. Leaving tomorrow. He nodded. You just made me the offer. I haven't said yes. Say yes, he urged. Nothing is stopping you. Oh, yes, there was. Cheney was stopping herself. I won't be rushed. As she'd rushed into that kiss. Weariness enveloped her. I don't want to rush you, but the taping is this week, he said. If you want to work on the episode, you must leave tomorrow. Cheney could understand schedules, but still. She didn't know if she could trust him or if she could trust herself. She'd misjudged people so badly before. She couldn't do it again. This is a great opportunity, but I need to think it over. Take all the time you need. Before tomorrow, that is. I want you in the Bahamas, but if you're not ready, you can forget about the taping and decide if you're interested in the rest of my offer, he said. I'd be a fool to lose someone so hardworking and talented to another company. For once, Cheney felt as though she held the higher ground with him. It was a good feeling. What does Gemma think about this? Cheney hadn't mentioned being laid off because she didn't want her friend to worry. Gem doesn't know I'm here or about your job. As far as she's concerned, there won't be an associate producer at the taping. Drake was protecting Gemma, too. Cheney appreciated his chivalrous behavior, but a question remained. Is this offer about making sure Gemma doesn't feel responsible for my being laid off? His gaze collided with Cheney's. Not at all. A connection that had nothing to do with friendship or working together drew her toward him. She forced her feet to remain where they were, on the tiled entryway of her apartment. You'll be an asset to the crew, the channel, and Dragon Llewellyn, he continued. I have no deadwood or extra layers of management to cost me money. I expect hard work, but I'll reward you for it. Your job will be secure. Cheney wanted to believe him. She needed a job, and she loved working on the show and with the crew. But spending more time with Drake would only intensify her attraction for him. An attraction that could go nowhere. Not only because he would be her boss, but also because they had opposite views of love. What if we set a trial period, she suggested. You can see if my performance is up to par. I don't need a trial period. I do. A vein pulsed at his jaw. Fine, you can have a trial period. Say the end of the taping. Yes. She felt the urge to pump her fist, but didn't. I may need longer. Set the timetable and tell me when you're ready to discuss staying on permanently. A man walked to the door of her apartment with her suitcases. Cheney Sullivan? Yes. Here are your bags. He placed them next to Drake. Sign here, please. By the time she returned the man's pen and thanked him, Drake had carried the luggage inside. He stood in her living room. Nice place. Thanks. Cheney felt rude for not inviting him in before, but he'd caught her off guard. He had a bad habit of doing that. She stepped inside and closed the door. He motioned to the empty ice cream pint sitting on the coffee table. Death by chocolate? Not a bad way to go. Especially if it keeps me from having to go out tonight. Cheney ate a spoonful of the ice cream in her hand. Would you like some? I have another pint in the freezer. No, thanks. His assessing gaze washed over her, making Cheney feel half a step above a bag lady. Cute bunny slippers. She wiggled her toes, so the floppy ears moved. 
The slippers were a Christmas present from my aunt Naomi. And the fuzzy lime green robe, he asked. A birthday present for myself. Interesting. Not really. Cheney glanced at what she was wearing. I love the color green, the fabric is soft, and the fit comfortable. He laughed. You're the only person I know who could make such an impractical-looking robe seem practical. She frowned. My practicality is an asset. It's what led me to accept the job on a trial basis, to make sure I'm a good fit for you, I mean, Dragon Lulin. He tipped his head. I apologize to your practicality. A beat passed and another. The atmosphere wasn't uncomfortable, but the underlying tension felt strange. Would you like to sit down, she asked, not knowing what else to say. Thanks. Drake Saturday I hope I'm not keeping you from anything. You mentioned going out, or rather not wanting to go out tonight. My parents are having family and friends over for dinner and invited me. I tried begging off, because of jet lag and a rotten mood, but no go. Which means I'll spend the evening listening to comments about my failures, starting with my dating status or lack of a date. She realized she was rambling, but couldn't stop herself. Of course, losing my job is bound to be mentioned by someone. Most likely Simone. She'd told her mom and dad the news in a phone call. Their sympathy had made Cheney drive to the store and buy more ice cream. Don't forget, you were only unemployed for a short time, Drake said. Tell them you work for Dragon Channel or Dragon Lulin. Take your pick. That's right. She brightened. Thanks to you. He smiled. Her breath hitched. I'd better put away the ice cream and try to make myself presentable for dinner. Let me help. Cheney stiffened. Get ready? He laughed. I'm better at messing up hair than fixing it. At least he was honest. Then what are you talking about? I'd be happy to accompany you as your date tonight if that would make the evening go smoother for you. Her gaze flew to his. You would do that? He nodded. I try to help my employees out if I can. And she was his employee now. At least on a trial basis. Bringing him along would make things easier, except. It's generous of you to offer, but if you came along, people might assume we were. Dating, he finished for her. Yes, and since you're my new boss. I'm not your boss until tomorrow. The gold flex in his eyes brightened. Let them think what they want tonight. We know the truth. That's all that matters. She listed the pros and cons. The pros were winning, but. We can take my limo. Yes. She avoided playing the one-upmanship game with Simone, but tonight, Cheney would take her turn. I think I'll enjoy the perks that come with working for you. Just wait. His charming grin curled her toes. You haven't seen anything yet. Chapter 14 Drake sat next to Cheney in the limousine while they rode toward a suburb of Los Angeles. He'd gotten more than he bargained for tonight, an associate producer for the final episode, a permanent employee if all went well with the trial period, and a date for tonight. But he was here to make amends for Cheney losing her job and for other reasons. He glanced her way. She looked beautiful in a brown skirt, lace-trimmed shirt, fitted jacket, and boots. Not that he minded what she'd had on before she changed. Wearing the Muppet Creature robe, Cheney with sad, vulnerable eyes and a smudge of chocolate ice cream on the corner of her mouth had almost made him take her in his arms and kiss her until she smiled. Almost being the operative word. She'd appealed to him on a different level today. He'd found her defensiveness adorable, not annoying. She showed him she wasn't so perfect and competent with everything in her life neat and tidy all the time. That Cheney he could handle. He could help her the same way he did others. She would get what she needed, and he would gain a grateful, loyal employee. Another win-win situation. Drake's favorite kind. We're almost there. She sounded nervous. The limousine turned onto a side street. Drake stared out the window at the large homes, big front yards, and tree-lined sidewalks. 
expensive SUVs and sports cars filled the driveways. This is where I grew up, she said. He'd seen a photo of her childhood house in Jackson's report but said nothing. Drake compared that image to the apartment over the garage where he'd lived. A far cry from her upbringing. Now he could afford to buy the entire neighborhood, but owning an expensive mansion didn't make a house a home, and it was too late for his mother to come back. I want to raise my family in a neighborhood like this, she continued. You said you weren't interested in settling down. Not now, but someday. That's right, he said, remembering. You're a romantic, one who believes in true love and prefers flowers to hearts and violins. It's good you remember those things if you're pretending to be my date. I am your date. She looked at him with her brows drawn together. Then if anyone asks, my favorite color is... Green. How did you know? You mentioned it. He thought about her robe again. But no one will interrogate me. I wouldn't put anything past Simone. Cheney pointed out a white colonial-style two-story house. That's my parents' house. The limousine pulled to the curb in front of a cascading fountain with a nicely trimmed lawn surrounding it. The engine stopped. A minute later, the chauffeur opened the door for them. Drake followed her out. Cheney stood on the sidewalk, staring at the front door with a hint of panic in her eyes. She nibbled on her bottom lip, appearing scared, not vulnerable the way she had earlier this afternoon. Drake wished she'd smile. He squeezed her hand. You have a new job and a date. That's all anyone needs to know. She laced his fingers with hers. For comfort or show, he didn't care. Even though he probably should. But tonight was for Cheney. She stared up at him through her eyelashes. I don't know how to thank you for coming with me. He could imagine a few ways, but none of those things would happen, given the circumstances. You helped me by filling in for Jem. You agreed to a trial period when you could have said no. Being here with you tonight is the least I can do. The gratitude in her eyes tightened his throat. Quid pro quo, she said. Not exactly. Still, Drake nodded. She exhaled. Well, we'd better get this over with. He kept his fingers entwined with hers as they walked up the brick pathway. He'd never been a hand holder, but he enjoyed the feel of Cheney's in his. They reached the front step. I guess this is it. Her lips parted, an invitation, almost a plea. One he couldn't ignore. Not when he was here to help her, to do whatever she needed him to do. Drake brushed his mouth over hers. Sweet. Like peppermint. He wanted another taste. Cheney gave him one. As she increased the pressure of her lips against his, he followed her lead by pulling her toward him. Her chest pressed against his. This time no armor got in the way. He enjoyed this, he enjoyed her. The kiss intensified. Drake trailed kisses along her jaw until he reached her ear. He nibbled on her lobe, getting her to arch even closer to him. Pleasure radiated outward. Her mouth sought his with an eagerness that surprised him. He was happy to oblige, recapturing her lips with his. A noise sounded. Footsteps. He was too busy enjoying kissing her to think about anything else. Cheney, a feminine voice asked. She jerked away from him so fast she nearly fell backward off the step. He tightened his hold on her. The front door was open, and two people he'd seen in photographs stood with wide eyes. Her mother was an attractive woman with brown hair and a wide smile. Her father had white hair and a cautious expression. M mom, D dad, Cheney stuttered. Her cheeks flushed. Hi. Welcome home, sweetie. Her mother wiped her hands on her apron and hugged Cheney. I heard a car pull up. We were hoping it was you. Her father's eyes left Drake's only long enough to check the limousine parked at the curb. Hello. This is Drake Lulin. Cheney sounded breathless, but as soon as she said his name, her father straightened. These are my parents, Barbara and Patrick Sullivan. Drake extended his arm. It's nice to meet you, mister. Patrick is fine. Her father's handshake was firm. 
Nice of you to join us tonight. Barbara nodded. We're delighted to meet you, Drake. The pleasure is mine. He found it amusing her parents were diehard horror movie fans. They looked more like bridge players or foodies. Cheney talked about you when she was in London. Only good things, I hope, Patrick teased. Of course, honey. Barbara patted his arm. It's Cheney. She's a good girl. Drake agreed. She was a good worker, friend, and kisser. And not in that particular order. I should have called and let you know I was bringing a guest. The words spewed from Cheney's mouth like water over a crumbling dam. Her nerves seemed to get to her. But. I flew in unannounced this afternoon and surprised your daughter, Drake interrupted to take some pressure off Cheney. I hope my being here isn't an inconvenience. None at all. Barbara's green eyes twinkled. Any friend of Cheney's is more than welcome. Thank you. He had no trouble imagining the woman baking cookies and cupcakes daily. Though with her thin build, he doubted she sampled many of her creations. He would guess her husband did all the taste tests around here. Patrick motioned them into the house. Come inside and meet everyone. Drake placed his hand at the small of Cheney's back. After you, darling. Her mom and dad exchanged pleased-looking glances. Two down, and the rest of the family to go. Drake wasn't concerned. The chemistry between him and Cheney was obvious to anyone who saw them together. He followed her inside. The scent of basil and garlic filled the air. The interior of the house reminded Drake of a home magazine layout. Every piece, each accessory, coordinated, nothing out of place or mismatched. The decor and neutral palette were similar to Cheney's apartment except for the horror movie posters hanging on the walls. You have a lovely house. Thank you. Barbara's grin widened. I love decorating. I did Cheney's apartment. So that explained the similarities. After seeing Cheney's robe, Drake would have expected her place to have more color. I hope you like Italian food, Barbara said to him. He flashed her his most charming smile. It's one of my favorites. Barbara beamed. I bake biscotti, too. Chocolate. Cheney must love those, Drake said. She does. Barbara's eyes danced with excitement. Which is why I made them. They entered a large, crowded room connected to the kitchen. Cheney and Drake are here, Barbara announced. She made them sound like a couple which, he realized, was the point of all this. During introductions, he tried to keep track of who was who. Many of the women looked alike with similar haircuts and highlights. The men played the who has the harder handshake game. Through it all, murmuring sounded in the background. Is that who I think it is? Let's hope she has better luck holding on to him. Isn't he that billionaire on TV? It'll never last. Did you hear the studio fired her? I bet Tyler's relieved he married Simone instead. Who are these people? Drake stared at their judgmental faces. But Cheney was the one who surprised him the most. Her smile never faltered. It wasn't genuine because it didn't reach her eyes or bring out a hint of her dimple. How did she put up with this? Her parents seemed nice but oblivious to the pain they were putting their daughter through tonight. No wonder Cheney hadn't wanted to come. No doubt, she'd heard the unkind whispers and mumbles before, or she wouldn't be so adept at ignoring them. He would see that she escaped this toxic environment. Drake made the rounds with her, learning names and being friendly the way a good boyfriend would. He ended up near a table covered with appetizers, antipasto, vegetable crudite, bruschetta, and mini pizzas, with a couple he recognized from Jackson's report. They were the two who had broken Cheney's heart. Drake, I want you to meet my sister, Simone, and her husband, Tyler, Cheney said. Drake reminded himself to be civil. For her sake. Hello. Nice to meet you. Simone gave a half-smile and appeared unimpressed. She was the stereotypical high school cheerleader, short, bubbly, busty, the type of girl that appealed to 16-year-old boys. She stared at Cheney with disdain. We were wondering if you would show up. 
I told you she'd be here. Tyler picked up a pizza. He had the all-American jock look some women found appealing, but his hair was thinning on top. Cheney never lets anyone down. Unlike you, Drake thought. It's my fault we're late. I surprised her with a visit today. Simone smirked. That's nice of you to offer a shoulder to cry on. What do you mean by that? Cheney asked her sister. Mom told me you lost your job, Simone said gleefully. That has to suck since work is your entire life. Meow. Simone needed to put away her claws and grow up. The job was holding Cheney back. Drake placed his arm around her. He liked how she fit tucked against him. It's worked out for the best. I agree. Cheney leaned into him. It's definitely for the best. I'm Tyler Wincroft, the extern brother-in-law idiot said. I enjoy your show. It's a nice hobby, and it brought Cheney and me back together, so I have no complaints. Drake kissed the top of her head. What do you do? I work for Patrick. I'm a financial analyst. Nothing like the job security of working for your wife's father, eh? Drake asked. Laughter lit Cheney's eyes. As Tyler reached for another pizza, Simone flipped her hair behind her shoulder. Barbara and Patrick came up to the couple. One big, happy family. Drake was glad he only had his dad. So what brings you to Los Angeles? Patrick asked him. Cheney. Barbara added a second platter of bruschetta to the table. Will this be a short visit? Yes, since Cheney's flying out tomorrow. You just got home. Simone's panicked gaze darted between her sister and Drake. Where are you going now? Drake set his jaw. Cheney is. She placed her hand on his arm. He gave a slight nod. I'm flying to the Bahamas after I drop off a few things and pick up my severance pay at the studio. The noise in the room dropped to a few whispers. Others at the party appeared to be eavesdropping. That didn't surprise Drake since somehow Cheney had become everyone's punching bag. He had a feeling her sister had something to do with that. What are you going to do in the Bahamas? Simone sounded shrill. Cheney raised her chin. Work as the associate producer on the billionaire's playground. Simone pouted. Tyler stared at the buffet table. Barbara hugged Cheney. That's wonderful news, sweetheart. How long will you be gone? Patrick asked. That was Drake's cue. He wrapped his arms around Cheney, so her back was against his chest. The position felt natural and comfortable, surprisingly so. I hope she won't be back except to visit. He didn't want Cheney here. He wanted her with him. For work. The lines around Barbara's mouth deepened. Why is that, Drake? Because I'm hoping to convince Cheney to move to London. Again, not a lie. She would thrive at the company headquarters. Plus, Gemma lived there. The two were close. Tyler held a half-eaten carrot stick in his hand. What's so great about London? Once again, Drake deferred to Cheney. A warm smile, complete with her adorable dimple, brightened Cheney's entire face. Drake lives in London. Chapter 15 After the dinner party, Cheney stood at her apartment's door with Drake. She debated inviting him in and kissing him. To thank him. He'd offered her a job, pretended to be her date, and saved her from appearing like a total failure. Quid pro quo. She owed him. Big time. Thanks. You went above and beyond at my parents' house. Talk about being such an awesome boyfriend. I was happy to do it. He spoke as if he'd merely held open a door for her, not protected her from a living nightmare. I appreciate it. You, I mean. You made tonight so much easier. Easier, perhaps, but even if I hadn't been there, you wouldn't have failed. Oh, yes, I would have. She stared at the welcome mat. It wouldn't have been pretty. Well, you looked pretty tonight. Thank you. You know, they might be your family, but you don't have to define yourself by their terms and pretend just so you get along. 
you are perfect exactly the way you are. His words wrapped around her heart like a big, cozy hug. She stared at him, amazed, unsure, grateful. No one's ever said that to me before. It's true. He sounded genuine. She bit her lip. I want to believe you. Then do. You make it sound so simple. It is. No reason to complicate it. A little late for not complicating things. Right now, Cheney wished he could be her real boyfriend. She sighed. The warmth in his eyes blanketed her like a quilt. Wrapping herself up in him sounded pretty good. I'll try. That's my girl, he said with that lovely accented voice of his. Your family cares about you, even if they have a funny way of showing it. Your father pulled me aside for a chat. Drake had been at her side most of the time. Somehow, I missed when that happened. You were in the kitchen with your mother. Cheney remembered. That's when my mom asked for the lowdown on you. Your father wanted the same from me, Drake said. He even poured me a brandy. No fair, Cheney teased. I only got another biscotti. He laughed. I would have preferred a cookie. What did my dad say? He told me a change of scenery would do you good and London agreed with you. Then he asked what my intentions were toward you. He didn't. He did. Oh, no. That must have been awkward and... Charmingly old-fashioned, Drake said softly. I respect a man who cares so much about his daughter's welfare and happiness. Curiosity got the best of her. What did you tell my dad? The truth. That you weren't my date? No, Drake said. That I had only your best interests at heart and didn't want to see you get hurt. Her heart melted. His words echoed what she hoped a man would say if she were interested in pursuing a relationship with him. You've got this boyfriend, I mean, boss thing down. He tucked a strand of hair behind her ear. The intimate gesture sent her pulse racing. Tonight, I wasn't your boss. She stared at him with anticipation, hoping he didn't want to be her boss just yet. He ran the side of his fingertip along her cheek. I enjoyed being your date. Cheney leaned toward him. Her lips longed for another kiss. Me, too. And since this is a date, the night should end with one of these. The feel of his lips moving over hers sent tingles of pleasure shooting through Cheney. If this wasn't real, she didn't care. It felt real. That was all she needed to know. His touch caressed. His taste satiated. She kissed him back. Not only with her lips, but her heart, too. Cheney didn't want to think about tomorrow or five minutes from now. Only this moment with his lips pressed against hers mattered. As she relaxed against him, he slowly pulled away from her. She looked up at him, wanting to understand, seeking reassurance. What she found in his eyes was regret. Not again. A weight settled at the center of her chest. We can't forget, he said gently. I'll be your boss again. I always like to make sure and remove any doubt. It saves me from misunderstandings down the road as well as missed opportunities. He'd drawn the line. A much-needed one, if Cheney admitted the truth to herself and her heart. She swallowed a sigh and attempted a smile. It wasn't easy. Disappointment mixed with relief. She concentrated on the latter. Her heart didn't want to get hurt. She couldn't forget that no matter how good his kiss made her feel or how great a future with him might seem. She straightened. And I'll be your associate producer. Her gaze met his in understanding. Thanks for a wonderful evening, Cheney. Thank you for helping me out tonight. The words sounded so formal, so wrong. Even though they stood inches away from each other, the distance between them seemed to grow, pushing them farther apart. Cheney didn't know how to stop it. If she could, or if she should. A beat passed. Tension crackled in the air. Drake started to speak, but then stopped himself. Don't forget to pack sunscreen. He sounded like one of her parents. Or a, boss. 
I won't. Good night, he said. I'll see you in the Bahamas. Cheney nodded, but apprehension nodded her. You are perfect just the way you are. He liked her as she was. And he had hired her to be his associate producer. Whatever she pretended to her family, she couldn't fool herself. Drake Llewellyn would never be more than her boss. With sugar white sand beneath his bare feet, Drake walked along the beach with his father. The blue sky stretched to the horizon, providing the perfect backdrop for a seagull's acrobatics. A breeze carried the scent of salt. Home. His little piece of heaven usually filled him with peace, but not today. Something kept him preoccupied. Cheney. For the past two days, she'd been on his mind, in his thoughts, and haunting his dreams. He wanted only to see her, to remind himself that things had to remain professional between them if she was to stay with Dragon Lulin. Mixing business with pleasure had proved problematic with Cheney. She'd allowed their interactions, okay, kisses, to get in the way. That kept her from asking for his help when she'd lost her job. He wouldn't make the same mistake again. His cat, Elliot, sprinted onto the beach. He must have followed them from the house. The feline, a rare male tortoiseshell tabby, loved playing on the fine sand. His father breathed in deeply. It's good to be home. A lot warmer than London, that's for sure. His dad took shorter steps and moved slower than he had during their holiday in Scotland. Maybe Drake should have brought his father back to the island sooner instead of letting him venture off on another golf vacation alone. You seem tired today, Dad. Jet lag and too many rounds of golf, that's all. Not all of us have the energy you do. I'll call the doctor. The cat pounced. Sand flew into the air. You'll do no such thing. His dad brightened. The kick to his step returned. Who is that breathtaking siren playing in the water? Drake looked to the shore, where Cheney waded through the turquoise water in a red and black one-piece swimsuit. His gaze zeroed in on her with the precision of a high-powered telescope. Every nerve ending stood at attention. He stopped walking. She was perfect just the way she was. He blew out a puff of air. With her wet hair slicked away from her glowing face, she looked like a siren ready to lure a man to see. Drake looked at Elliot, who pawed at the sand. That's my new associate producer. Now I know why you were thinking about her instead of golf. His dad laughed. And why you enjoy hosting the show so much. Drake took another peek at Cheney as she jumped over a wave. His mouth went dry. I've never had an associate producer who looks so good in a swimsuit. She's gorgeous. Don't let those long legs of hers fool you. She's as capable as she is. Sexy, his father offered. The adjective was spot on. Drake had always preferred bikinis, but he would have to rethink his opinion regarding the appeal of one pieces now. She's an employee. Not my employee. Mine. Drake couldn't forget that if he wanted to help Cheney get her career back on track. His dad patted him on the shoulder. There's nothing wrong with looking, son. Except Drake wouldn't mind touching, too. But doing so would be wrong on so many levels. Time to pull himself together. Cheney isn't a woman who flaunts her attractiveness so men look at her. Cheney. That name sounds familiar. His father looked up as if someone had written the answer in the sky. She's a former intern of yours. An American. Drake stared, dumbfounded. How? You mentioned her. Though it's been some years now. He didn't know why he would have told his dad about her. It's been five years since she was an intern. Looks like she's all grown up. No kidding. As Cheney waded to shore, desire rocketed through Drake. Elliot ran to him and meowed. Needing a distraction, Drake picked up the tabby, pulled out a treat from his pocket, and fed it to the cat. But his attention immediately returned to Cheney. The waves lapped at her legs. Their gaze connected for an instant before she looked away. She pressed her lips together and crossed her arms over her chest. Was she trying to cover herself? 
the self-conscious act made her more appealing. As she walked toward him, a strange feeling grabbed hold in his stomach. He understood the attraction, but this felt like something else. Something more. Something different. He'd missed her. You made it, she said, her gaze not meeting his. Yes. Water ran down her right leg. He focused on her face. Excuse my son's sudden lack of manners. His dad extended his arm to her. I'm Reese Lulin. Drake's father. Cheney Sullivan. She shook hands and then picked up a colorful piece of fabric lying on a beach towel. It's so nice to meet you. The pleasure is all mine. She wrapped the sarong around her hips and tied a knot at her waist. And who is this beautiful kitty? The cat soaked up the attention. This is Elliot, Drake said. She rubbed under the cat's neck. Such a handsome fellow. What do you think of the island? Drake asked. It's perfect. I couldn't imagine a place I'd rather be than here. Neither could he. Her cheeks and nose looked sun-kissed. She was so, lovely. Cheney sighed. If I lived here, I wouldn't want to leave. That's what I tell my son every time he packs up to fly to London, his father said. The only thing that would make the island more perfect is a golf course. Elliot jumped out of Drake's arms and chased a butterfly across the sand. Once the hurricane season is over, construction will start on your golf course. Realization dawned on Cheney's pretty face. You own this island? Yes, Drake admitted. My father lives here year-round with Elliot. I stop by when I can. So the time you had cookies. Here. Is Elliot your cat? She asked his dad. No, his father gazed fondly at the feline. But he tolerates me when Drake's away. Don't you, boy? She studied Drake with a questioning look in her eyes. You have an island and a cat? Yes. You're just full of surprises, Drake Lulin. So was she. His gaze drifted lower. Cheney in a sarong was almost criminal. He reminded himself she wasn't trying to torture him. She was here to do her job. Speaking of which, how has the taping been going? The crew was ready to go after their break. The island has so many photo opportunities for beauty shots we're ahead of schedule. That's why I could squeeze in a swim. She picked up her beach towel. We've been waiting for you to arrive so we can shoot a couple of stand-ups. Tomorrow we'll do the wraparounds and interviews and, of course, a spin in the personal submarine. Drake loves his toys, his dad said. Most men do. She smiled at his father. I bet even you. His dad's grin took years off his weathered and wrinkled face. That I do. The way she stood there in her wet swimsuit and sarong with water beating on her smooth skin made her look like a model, but none of the ones Drake had dated over the years could charm his father, make his cat purr like an idling engine, and keep a production crew in check. His respect grew, as did his attraction. According to the house manager, a storm is forming in the Atlantic, Cheney said. I wonder if we should try to tape a lead-in at sunset tonight. Just in case the weather changes. If Drake thought of her as anything other than his associate producer, he would cross a line he shouldn't. Too much was at stake, especially during this trial period. Besides, she deserved better from him. Taping a lead-in tonight is fine. Great. Her dimpled smile pleased him. Seeing her happy made him happy. I'll head up to the main house and prepare for the shot. She turned to his dad. Nice meeting you. You, too. Cheney gave Elliot another pat and looked at Drake. See you later. With that, she walked away. Sand-caked feet carried her across the beach and up the path at a quick pace. Forget about her being your employee, his father said, sounding more serious than light-hearted. I say fire her and go for it. I can't do that, Dad. Even if Drake might want to, he couldn't. He'd promised her a secure position and wouldn't go back on his word. No way would he disappoint Cheney after so many others had. But most of all, Drake knew what would happen if she wasn't his employee. 
and that made one thing as clear as the sea in front of him. Drake might not want to be Cheney's boss, but he couldn't afford not to be. Chapter 16 Professional Be Professional The mantra helped Cheney survive tonight's taping, but barely. Drake's island paradise made being professional difficult, and so did he. The setting sun dropped lower into the horizon, painting the sky with a beautiful palette of reds, pinks, and yellows, the perfect background for the wraparound shot and for, romance. No. Romance wasn't in the script. It couldn't be part of the shooting schedule. Or her life. We can't forget, I'll be your boss again. Mustn't forget that. And she hadn't. But the way Drake had stared at her on the beach hadn't been boss-like. His appreciative gaze had unnerved her, making her more self-conscious than usual wearing a swimsuit, especially after the pints of ice cream she'd been gorging on lately. Standing in the water, wet and in a swimsuit, had brought to mind what he'd said to her the other night. You are perfect just the way you are. Thinking the words gave her a chill, the good kind. Pathetic. Another sign Cheney needed to get a life. At least she had a job. On the deck, she sat at a table, picked up her clipboard, and reviewed tomorrow's script. A red dot on the terrace below captured her attention, but when she looked closer, it was gone. She blinked. Nothing there. Cheney's eyes were playing tricks on her. The red circle reappeared. The dot of light moved randomly. What was it? With her clipboard in hand, she rose and descended the steps. Halfway down, she stopped. Drake sat on the edge of a large hammock. He wore a pair of khaki shorts, a plain white t-shirt, and no shoes. In his right hand, he held a laser pointer. Elliot ran across the stone-tiled terrace, trying to pounce on the rapidly moving pinpoint of red. Catch the dot, boy. A huge grin lit up Drake's face. Then you can have another treat. Her breath caught in her throat. She'd never seen him look so relaxed and carefree. Starting at her heart, before pinging off her brain and toes and making U-turns, attraction ricocheted through Cheney. He'd worn casual clothes during the taping, but those were from a designer brand that had a product placement agreement with the show. Maybe these pieces were from a designer, too, but the clothing made him appear more approachable. Not good. Approachable was the last thing she wanted Drake, her boss, to be. She retreated up the steps carefully so he wouldn't notice her. A creak splintered the quiet. Cringing, Cheney froze. Hello there, he said. Her knees wobbled. His deep voice did it to her each time. Hi. He waved the laser pen for Elliot. This is his favorite toy. Elliot appears to be enjoying himself. You, too. Drake nodded. Come down here. She descended the rest of the way. He patted the spot next to him. This hammock is big enough for two. No, it wasn't. She held the clipboard in front of her like a shield. I don't mind standing. Suit yourself. The cat chased the light. Your idea for shooting the wraparound tonight was brilliant. Even Milt was impressed, and that's difficult to do. Cheney lowered the clipboard. Thank you. You have an eye for what works on camera. She stood taller. It's challenging to figure out what will work and what won't. I enjoy that. It shows. He flicked off the laser light. Have you considered whether you want to continue working after the taping? I. Elliot meowed. Drake reached into his pocket, pulled out a treat, and tossed it to the cat. The trial period just started, she said. You said you enjoy the work. Yes, she admitted. I appreciate this opportunity. Then, stay on. Since dinner at her parents' house, Cheney had thought more about Drake as a man than him as a boss. She bit her lip to keep from saying something she might regret. Let me know what it will take. Money, stock options, vacation time, car allowance. He tossed Elliot another treat. When you're ready to discuss a permanent position, I'm open for negotiations. 
Don't you mean if I'm ready? Mischief lit his eyes, reminding her of a child with a secret he didn't want to share. But there was nothing childish about Drake. I prefer when. Elliot trotted over and rubbed against her. The cat's loud purring sounded like a machine. Cheney knelt and patted his soft fur. So sweet. He likes you. Elliot likes anyone who rubs him. He doesn't approach the crew like that, and they've been here longer than you. She shrugged. Maybe they aren't cat people. Elliot rolled on his back. He loves to have his stomach rubbed, Drake said. I can tell. She petted the cat's round belly. Have you had him long? Since he was about four weeks old. That's young. I found him in a paper sack near a dumpster. He wouldn't stop meowing. He was a scrawny thing. Ugly, but I couldn't leave him there, to die. Her heart sighed. A man abandoned by his mother wouldn't ignore a deserted kitten. He had saved the tiny cat. Of course, you couldn't. He's a handsome chap now. As if on cue, Elliot rose to all fours and made a running leap onto Drake's lap. The cat rubbed its head against his face. Emotion clogged Cheney's throat. She swallowed. Very handsome and lucky to have a dad who loves him so much. Drake winced. I'm not his dad. Could have fooled me, she thought. My father calls himself our dog's dad. That's because he's already a dad. Elliot is my first pet. As Drake stared at the cat, his gaze softened. We didn't have any animals when I was growing up. Not enough space or money. She knew about his past, but after seeing how far he'd come and all he had now, that humble, poor beginning seemed impossible. But if I had kids, his voice trailed off. Hearing Drake say that was huge. He'd mentioned not wanting a family, yet his almost wistful tone yanked at her heartstrings. She took a step toward him. What? He shook his head. I don't know why I said that. I've never considered having kids. But if you did, I'd want them to have pets. She stared at Elliot. A cat? Cats, dogs, hamsters, ponies. Whatever they wanted. She could believe it. Drake generously gave those he cared about whatever they wanted. How would the children's mother react to this menagerie? Drake fed Elliot a treat from his pocket. Hypothetically, you mean. I don't see children or ponies running around here. As long as she wasn't allergic to any animals, there shouldn't be a problem. You should ask any woman you want to date that question straight away. Question, he asked. If they are allergic to any animals. He shifted in the hammock. I don't know why we're discussing this. I don't have time for a family, so asking, that is unnecessary. Except he had a family, Reese and Elliot. Drake made time for them. Someday, he would want a bigger family, maybe even a wife. Hope filled her. She pictured him with a child on his lap, a son with dark curly hair and soulful eyes. Her heart beat in double time. It's a hypothetical question. He shrugged. So, are you allergic to animals? No, she replied with a smile. But hypothetically, I have a strong aversion to snakes. Good to know, his mouth slanted into a lopsided grin. For future shoots. Chapter 17 as rays of sunlight streamed into Cheney's room, an early morning breeze blew through the open windows. The billowy white curtains looked more like sails luffing in the wind than drapes. Lying in bed, she inhaled the salty air and glanced at the time on her cell phone, 5.28 a.m. A long day of taping awaited her, but sleeping more wouldn't be smart. Sleep led to dreams. She didn't want to dream about Drake again. Thinking about him nonstop was bad enough. She'd thought once she set to work on the island, things would be different. But he was on her mind more than ever. Granted, she spent most of her time with him, during the taping at sunset and then at the delicious alfresco dinner by the pool with the crew and Reese. Eating, drinking, and laughing while a steel drum band played hadn't felt like work, 
but Drake had treated her professionally and with respect, the way he had with the entire crew. He'd acted like her boss, yet he'd shown an appreciation for not only what she did, but also who she was. She'd never received that attention from anyone else in her life, including her parents. Cheney sighed. Drake Llewellyn was so much more than she'd imagined he could be, and she'd imagined a lot with her crush five years ago. He might be a globetrotting, play-to-win billionaire who claimed not to want love or a family, but his generosity, how he helped those around him, forced her to look beyond his words to his deeds and the man he was inside. To the thoughtful, strong, giving, caring man. Affection bubbled and overflowed from her heart. She could imagine a life with him, a fulfilling, lovely life in London, or here, or anywhere, as long as they were together. With Reese. With Elliot. With, children. Drake had jolted her biological clock out of hibernation and into overdrive. Settling down didn't seem like such a far-off idea anymore. If only she knew what to do about it, about him. Cheney tossed back the duvet, crawled out of bed, and put on the thick, white terry cloth robe she'd found hanging in her closet. She walked out to her balcony and stood at the railing. The sun spilled its golden light into the ever-changing sky. The glass-like infinity pool surface appeared to run to the edge of a cliff before cascading over the rocks to the turquoise sea below. The sight gave her an idea because the taping didn't begin for an hour and a half. A quick swim would clear her head. She had time. Someone entered the pool area. A man. She peered closer. Drake in swim trunks. He had a killer body. Trim and fit with the perfect amount of muscle definition. A guy didn't get such a physique from sitting behind a desk or attending social events. It took discipline and regular workouts to have an athletic body like Drake's. He worked hard at his business, but his jet-setting ways and partier reputation suggested a disciplined lifestyle didn't rank high on his list of virtues. Elliot rubbed against his leg. Drake placed the cat on a comfortable-looking chaise lounge before walking to the edge of the pool. He dove in, barely making a splash. He swam a lap, did an underwater turn, and swam another. Back and forth, he continued. The rhythm of his freestyle strokes mesmerized her. Good morning, Reese said from the balcony next to hers. You're up early. I was thinking about going for a swim, she explained, embarrassed he'd caught her staring at his son like a lovesick teenager or a stalker. But I don't want to bother Drake. He won't mind. But Cheney did, because her daydreams seemed all too real. She needed distance, so she shrugged. Be patient with him, Reese said. I don't have to be patient with Drake. He's an easy boss to work for. Reese sighed her curiously. I've worked for many bosses over the years, and I never watched them swim. Heat flooded her cheeks. I'm sorry. He smiled. I didn't mean to embarrass you. I only met you yesterday, but I like you, Cheney. You care about Drake. That much is obvious to me. And I think you're what my son needs. I'm his associate producer. Reese's eyes softened. Drake needs more than that, but he might not admit it since he's your boss. She stared at the man in the pool swimming laps as if he were training for the next summer games. He's an excellent boss. The words sounded stupid. She cringed. I'm sure he is very good at what he does, Reese said. He's better at giving than receiving. She glanced at the older man. I don't know what you mean. Think about it, and you will. Go swim. Before it's too late. Cheney stiffened. Too late for what? Her and Drake? No, Reese probably meant before she ran out of time, because of today's taping schedule. Still, she quickly changed into her swimsuit, put her robe back on and followed the steps down the hill. Bursting in every shade of green imaginable, plants lined the serpentine path. Explosions of pink and red blossoms added bursts of color. The scents of flowers and saltwater permeated the air. At the pool, she petted Elliot. The sound of churning stopped. Drake swam to the edge. 
Good morning. Hi, Cheney said. His wet hair formed dark curls all over his head. Water dripped down his cheekbones. Gorgeous, yes, but he was more than a pretty face. He understood her. She wanted to understand him. A beautiful morning for a swim, she added. Dive in. Cheney normally used the steps to get into pools, but she wanted to be strong and brave like him. An equal. I will. He'd seen her in her swimsuit, but she was still embarrassed as she removed her robe. She placed it on another chaise lounge. All the while, she felt his gaze on her and forced herself not to cower. As she walked to the edge of the pool, Cheney kept her head high. She breathed deeply and dove into the crystal water. Warm. Refreshing. Wet. She swam to the opposite end and back again. Once she'd completed a lap, she stopped and pushed the wet hair back from her face. Drake sat on the edge, his feet in the water, watching her with his dark, intense eyes. Want to race? I saw how fast you swim. I'll give you a head start. No, thanks. Slow and steady. That's my motto. Nothing wrong with that, but everyone needs to shake it up sometimes. I'm not a shaker-upper. She stared at the sky so the sun could warm her face. The truth is, I don't like a lot of change. Everything changes. Yes, and every time there's a big change in my life, I've lost something. Her gaze met his. I'm tired of losing. His eyes softened. I'll let you win. You would do that even though you like to win? Drake nodded. If it would make you feel better. Her heart bumped. If we know the outcome, we don't need to race. How you reach the finish line can be just as fun. I don't know about that. He slid into the water. Come on. They swam side by side. Not a heated race, but Drake never passed Cheney even though he could have overtaken her. They continued swimming laps, but each time she touched the edge first. Cheney didn't know how long they'd swum, but her legs ached and so did her arms. She was out of breath, but the physical activity cleared her mind. For that, she was grateful. Ouch. Her calf. A knot. She reached for the side of the pool and rubbed her leg. Drake swam to her. You're faster than you think. You let me win. Only the first lap, he said to her surprise. We were even the rest. A good match. His words filled her with pride. And hope. The pain in her leg intensified. She winced. Concern clouded his eyes. What's wrong? A leg cramp. She tried not to grimace as she flexed her foot against the wall of the pool to stretch out the muscle. My left calf. A charley horse. Cheney gritted her teeth. Want help? he offered. The pain intensified. Her fingers gripped the pool's edge. Please. He reached under the water and touched her leg gently. Tell me where it hurts. His fingers hit the spot. She squeezed her eyes, closed for a second. There. Drake increased the pressure of his hands. Slowly, he massaged her calf. Relax. Easy for him to say. Harder for her to do. Especially when she was trying to remember if she'd shaved her legs yesterday. You're tensing up, he said. As she held on to the edge, her knuckles turned white. It hurts. Let go. Sit on my knee. Her brain short-circuited at the thought. I. He peeled her fingers off and floated her closer to him. The hair on his legs brushed her thighs. She sat on his bended knee. Hold on to me, Drake said. Oh, boy. But she had no other choice under the circumstances. As Cheney wrapped an arm around his shoulders, her hand slid across his wet skin. His muscles bunched underneath her palms. The position was awkward, uncomfortable, and, except for the pain, a complete turn-on. He rubbed and kneaded. If you relax, this will be easier for you. I'm trying. 
His fingers worked their magic on her tight, aching muscle. Drake's face was right next to hers. If she turned just so. No. She couldn't do that. Cheney closed her eyes, before taking a deep breath and exhaling slowly. It was either concentrate on her breathing or kiss him. Good, he encouraged. You're very good. Her eyelids flew open. Heat flooded her cheeks. I mean, your hands. My hands are at your command. Her awareness of him blasted into overdrive, so did her heart rate. You can stop now. He didn't. I want to make sure it's all gone. A few more minutes with his hands all over her leg, kneading, pressing, and rubbing, and she'd be the one who was all gone. A warning shot straight to her heart. Too late. She wasn't falling for Drake. She'd fallen right into the deep end. Oh. It's better now, she said. Really? He removed his hands from her leg. She slid off his thigh and reached for the edge of the pool. Thank you. His gaze met hers. Anytime. And she knew he meant that. He would help her anytime. With anything. Others, like Gemma, or the crew, too, if he could. But would he have come to their rescue in the pool and rubbed their legs? That didn't seem like boss behavior. Far from it actually. Cheney thought about what Reese had told her. He's better at giving than receiving. You always help people, she said. I enjoy doing that for those who work for me. Employees deserve rewards for their loyalty and hard work. Yes, but you do more than a typical boss, like give leg massages. You needed it. True. But she wanted him to admit he saw her differently from the company's other employees. Would you have done that for someone else? I do what I need to do, he answered in a matter-of-fact tone. Dragon Llewellyn has one of the lowest employee turnover rates in the industry. Pride laced his words. It also has the highest job satisfaction rate. What you do works, but you gave me a job, a costume, a night pretending to be my boyfriend, and a leg massage. What do you get from helping me? A hard-working associate producer, he said, not missing a beat. Is that all you want? It's all I need. She didn't want to accept that. A bird sang from somewhere nearby, the cheerful song a stark contrast to the tension building between them. Who helps you when you need something, she asked. I, he furrowed his brow. I need little help. Everyone needs help. I suppose if I need something outside of the office, I pay to have it done. That was so sad, but exactly as she'd thought. I know. He brightened. You helped me by filling in for Jem so I could go on holiday with my father. Cheney tread water. You paid me. I did. And he was paying her now. She took a deep breath. Down below the pool, the surf washed against the shore. Who helps you out? Drake asked. She rarely asked anyone for help either. Not her parents, because she didn't want them to worry. Not Simone or Tyler, just because. Yet she was here because of helping Gemma. And? You, Cheney said. You helped me by offering me this job. Perhaps we're more alike than we realized. Maybe we are. And maybe Reese was right about Drake needing her. She wet her lips. What if we promise to ask for help the next time we need it? He shrugged. Okay. Promise me. Drake studied her. Are you always this, challenging? No, you bring it out for some reason. You didn't promise me. On the side of the pool, he used his arms to raise himself out of the water. The chef has something special planned for breakfast this morning. You're changing the subject. I'm the boss. A wry grin curved his lips. I can do what I want. Drake needed someone who didn't work for him. Someone he couldn't buy with jobs and benefits and perks and help. Someone who would help him because they cared for him, not because he'd bought their loyalty. The way he was trying to buy hers. A weight pressed against her shoulders, 
and she forced herself not to slump. Come with me, he said with a hopeful gleam in his eyes. And Cheney knew. As long as she worked for Drake, she could never be more than his employee. She could never give him what he needed. And, she realized with a pang, he could never give her what she needed back. Cheney stared up at him with longing and, love. What was she going to do? Chapter 18 What should I do about Cheney? Weaving his way through Dragon Island, Drake hiked along the path lined with thick ferns and lush trees. Some trails led to secluded crescents of untouched white sand. Others ran into the hilly interior like the one he walked on now. He forced himself not to glance back at Cheney and Tony, who followed her. Drake didn't want the cameraman to see him so distracted. Ever since this morning's swim, she'd been on his mind. Not surprising given the sweet torture of having her sit on his thigh. He wasn't sure how he'd survived. And now. He wanted to touch her entire body the way he'd touched her leg. He missed the taste of her lips and the feel of her hair in his hands. Worse, he wanted more than the physical with her, which was contrary to his usual M.O. Cheney had done what others had failed to do. She made him want to give and take. The only problem? Taking more would hurt her. And if he came to depend on her, she could devastate him. Are we almost there? Tony asked. Drake kept moving. It isn't much farther. Tony blew out a puff of air. You said that an hour ago. Come on, Cheney teased. The camera can't be that heavy. You want to carry it? Tony asked. No, thanks, she replied. Tony groaned. If I'd known it was such a trek, I might have opted for the boat tour with Jesse and sent Kyle with you instead. Trust me. You picked the right destination today. Drake took a left where the trail forked. This is one of my favorite spots on the island. What's it called? Cheney asked. Lover's Lagoon. Though the spot hadn't lived up to its name. At least not with him. We've hosted a few weddings, and this is where the newlyweds spent their wedding night. Tony snickered. Quite a walk for a couple buzzed from champagne toasts and eager to get on with their honeymoon. There's a more direct way to reach the spot if you take a boat, Drake said. Now he tells us, Cheney quipped. Drake glanced over his shoulder. You're complaining, too? She looked cute in her shorts, a tank top, and a baseball cap. Her tanned skin gleamed with sweat. No. Good, because I thought you two might want interior beauty shots. A lovely, soft smile graced her lips. Great idea. Thanks. His chest tightened. You're right. I've been taking some. Tony moved at a slower pace than before. But I'm sending you the bill for my massage. You'll get one when we return to the house. Drake's gaze returned to Cheney. You, too. You are the man. Tony shouted. Drake laughed. No more Charlie horses for my associate producer. She mouthed a thanks. You're welcome, he mouthed back. Once she saw the perks a job with his company brought, she would accept a permanent position after the trial period ended. Maybe he would impress her enough she would agree sooner. Cheney appeared to be softening. She'd admitted after her parents' party she liked what he could do for her. she told him she enjoyed working for him. She'd also liked it when they kissed. Him, too. If only he could give her more of those, but he wanted to keep their relationship professional. That was best for her. The trail crested a small incline and then dropped into a tropical oasis with a waterfall-fed stone pool, a hot tub, a two-person chaise lounge, and a luxurious bungalow with thick wood beams, a vaulted roofline, and long, flowing white curtains. She gasped. Oh, my. Tony sighed. Wow. Both stood with wide eyes and open mouths, a typical reaction when people saw this place. Welcome to Lover's Lagoon. He pointed to the trail between torchlights. That path leads to a secluded beach where a boat can drop off or pick up passengers. Tony checked the lighting. This will be a killer part of the episode. I told you the hike was worth it, Drake said. The cameraman nodded. 
Sorry I complained. Drake smiled. No apology necessary, but a boat will meet us at the beach so we won't have to walk back. Tony flashed him a thumbs up. I'm checking out the bungalow. He disappeared inside. Cheney went to the double chaise lounge and ran her fingertips over the overstuffed cushion. The entire island is idyllic, but this place feels more pristine, special. This spot, when it was undeveloped, convinced me to buy the island. The location isn't convenient to London. Why did you buy it? Because I could. He laughed. The real reason is, my dad wanted to live in a warmer climate. I wanted a place that was all mine. Somewhere private. To drop in and out as my schedule permitted. This island allows you to do that. Drake nodded. My ultimate playground. Or your sanctuary. Cheney stared at the water cascading down into the pool. She closed her eyes. Listen. He would rather watch her. The serene expression on her face captivated him. This is so lovely, she said. Relaxing. Drake was far from relaxed, but the beautiful view of her was worth it. She opened her eyes. What's it like at night? Peaceful. He smiled, remembering. Except. What? The first time I wanted to spend the night here, I got lost. I must have taken a wrong turn because I wandered alone in the pitch black for hours. I finally made it, relieved, exhausted, and in desperate need of a shower. You came alone? I don't bring others here. Two lines formed above her nose. Why not? As you said, it's a special spot. Few women had come with him to the island. None had visited this place. He wanted to wait for the right moment with the right one. His gaze met Cheney's. Someone who would understand how special this place was to him. She smiled. He smiled back. And just like that, he slipped into her eyes, into her heart, into her. Forget his world. He wanted to be a part of hers and follow her siren's call wherever it might lead him. Tony exited the bungalow. Well, I know where I want a honeymoon now. Drake looked away from her, breaking the spell she had over him. You're engaged? Cheney asked. Nope. Tony shook his head. But if I got married? She smiled. It's good to have goals. Drake had goals, big ones that made a difference in the world and brought him a tremendous amount of money. With her pretty face, sharp mind, and challenging questions, Cheney messed with his goals by keeping him preoccupied, distracted, unprofessional. He didn't like that. Goals, right. Tony fiddled with his camera gear. Are you planning to honeymoon here, Drake? He had a wild impulse to ask Cheney what she thought about honeymooning here. Oh. That wasn't good. It was bad and needed to stop immediately. No. Have some place even better in mind? Tony asked. Drake didn't need to glance at Cheney. He felt her eyes on him and sensed her anticipation from ten feet away. Sticking her name in the same sentence as honeymooning wasn't at all boss-like. And that was when he knew for sure. His affection for her was more serious and substantial than he'd realized. He cared for her more than was reasonable, given the circumstances, and needed to put an end to it. For both their sakes. He raised his chin. I'm never getting married. Something flashed in Cheney's eyes. She pressed her lips together before staring at the ground. Tony glanced his way. A confirmed bachelor, huh? Drake shrugged. What woman would have me? Yeah, right. Tony laughed. What woman would want to marry a good-looking billionaire under forty? Exactly. As Tony went toward another path, Drake ignored the urge to talk to Cheney. He went to the edge of the pool. What do you mean what woman would have you? Cheney asked. He should have known she would question him. If my mom didn't even want me, Drake tried to sound lighthearted as if it didn't matter, but he had a feeling Cheney would see through him the way she always did. Her sharp gaze pinned him. You're afraid of letting anyone get close. He rolled his shoulders uncomfortably. 
I prefer to call the shots in my relationships. Even with me? Especially with you. He smiled, trying to tease but not sure if he pulled it off. That's why I hired you. Cheney had to quit. That was the only way to get what she wanted. As she stood on the white sand of a secluded cove with Tony and Drake, a boat motored to shore. If she worked for him, he would call the shots, and she would always be his underling. They couldn't have a relationship. Things would never be equal between them. But could she do it? Could she quit without knowing how he felt about her? Questions swirled. But how could she become a permanent employee of his company knowing how she felt about him? She would need to hide her feelings, and that would be, impossible. Quitting would be a huge move, one very much unlike her. But Cheney had played it safe for years, her entire life, if she was honest with herself. Playing it safe, however, hadn't gotten her what she wanted. Her former fiancé had been a safe choice, but Tyler hadn't been what she wanted. Not really. She'd picked a safe job. Only that hadn't turned out so well, either. Whichever way she looked at it, safe wasn't working for her. So why not try something different? Logically, it made sense. Except Drake wasn't a safe choice. He was a dangerous one. She sneaked a peek at him, standing tall and proud, his lips pressed together and his jaw set. So handsome. So strong. So giving. She wanted to give him what he needed, what he deserved. If he would have her. A big if. Fear coated her mouth. Her insides trembled. Cheney tried to push her doubt away. The opportunity for a wonderful future was in front of her. All she had to do was muster her courage and take a risk, gamble on a chance at happiness. At love. She took a breath. And another. The boat's captain cut the engine. If Cheney didn't take a chance now, she would regret it for the rest of her life. She knew that with pulse-pounding certainty. She straightened. I'm hiking back, instead of taking the boat. Tony wiped his brow. Are you crazy? Only time would tell. Cheney shrugged. It's not every day a person has an island to themselves. I'm sure I can find my way. I'll go with you, Drake said, as she knew he would. Have fun sweating on the trail, kids. Tony headed to the boat with his camera gear. I'll think of you while I enjoy my massage. She waved and hiked up the trail to the lagoon. Drake followed her. I'll grab water bottles from the house. Cheney sat on a chaise lounge, watching the water gushing down into the pool. A honeymoon here would be perfect. Someday. Less than two minutes later, Drake handed her a bottle. Thanks. She scooted over. Have a seat. The cushion sank from his weight. He twisted open the bottle cap. Cheney did the same and drank. It was now or never. I've been thinking about your proposal and the trial period we agreed to. He took a swig. Working on the billionaire's playground has been challenging, rewarding, and fun, she continued. A great experience. There are more experiences ahead. She inhaled deeply. I want more. A lot more. His features relaxed. His mouth curved into a smile. Cheney clutched the water bottle. But I don't want to work for Dragon Lulin. There. She'd said it. Put it out there. Taken the risk. Now she would have to see if her gamble paid off. Cheney held her breath. His smile disappeared. His eyes darkened. I don't want to lose you. Relief flooded her. Her heart felt as buoyant as a helium-filled balloon. She'd thrown the dice and come up with a winning roll. You don't have to lose me. Tell me what it'll take. A few dates would be nice. Dinner and a movie. A walk along the beach at sunset. And kisses. Lots and lots of those. Romantic images of the two of them swirled in her mind. To keep you at Dragon Lulin, he added. Don't be shy. You're a valuable employee. 
her heart deflated. I don't want to be an employee. Of course, you do. I don't want to be your employee, she clarified. I'm a good boss, he countered. I'll make it worth your while to stay. Name your price. Her price. Heartbroken, Cheney stared at him. You don't get it. She wondered if he ever would. Probably not. Her shoulders sagged. She'd taken a chance, but her dream required two people, her and Drake. Unfortunately, he could never give her what she wanted, what she needed, because he didn't know how to love people. He bought them instead. She balled her hands. Get what, he asked. Emotion tightened her throat, making it difficult to breathe. This was a test. Her voice cracked. And you passed it, he said. I want to hire you. She raised her chin. I passed, because I took a risk. Lines creased his forehead. I don't know what you're talking about. He didn't, and that hurt, badly. I'm not for sale. I'm not trying to buy you. She almost laughed. Just call all the shots so you don't get hurt like your mother hurt you. His jaw tensed. Don't try to analyze something you know nothing about. I'm going by what you told me. Cheney blinked, trying to stop the stinging in her eyes. But it's true. I don't know you, not the way I thought I did. Or hoped I might. I can give you anything you want. You don't even see what you're doing. She sighed. The high salaries, the wonderful benefits, all the out-of-this-world perks. I don't want them. I don't want the job. None of those things are as important to me as, you. Confusion filled his eyes. You mean more to me than any job, Drake. That's why I don't want to work for you, she admitted. If you're my boss, nothing can ever happen between us. I thought if I quit, the obstacles would disappear, but I see now I was wrong. Tell me what you want from me. Love, Drake. That's what I want. He flinched and then scooted away, putting space between them. Love is overrated. It doesn't last. Says who? As she stood, her water bottle thudded against the ground. I want to be loved, not bought. I want your heart, not things. I want you. I've given you everything you asked for, everything I have to give. She shook her head. It's not enough for me. I want. More. Yes, I want more from you. I deserve more. His nostrils flared. When are you leaving? Wait. Cheney hadn't mentioned leaving. What? If you no longer want the job, I need to arrange for your departure and find someone else to fill in for Jem. Arrangements. Replacement. Work. A flash of pain ripped through her. She might have been a valuable employee to him, but that was all she was. She'd talked about loving him, and he was more concerned with finding someone to take her place. Her lungs seized. She struggled to breathe. He'd said she was perfect just the way she was, but Drake only wanted her if she would do as he asked, the same as every other person in her life. Her heart withered, like a flower left out too long in the sun. Tears welled in her eyes, but she wouldn't give him the satisfaction of seeing her cry. He wanted everything to be professional between them. Fine. She could do professional. And would. I said I'd be the associate producer for this final episode, and I'll stay until the taping is over. Cheney stared down her nose at him. As for my travel arrangements, I'll leave when the crew leaves. Chapter 19 Drake stood next to the storm window protecting his office from the driving rain and hurricane-force winds that had battered the island for days. But out, Dad. I just asked what Cheney has been up to, his father said. We haven't seen her much since the storm hit. A palm frond blew across the deck and smashed into the house. The weather matched Drake's mood, stormy. His feelings for Cheney had only intensified. Not seeing her, talking to her, touching her these past two days was driving him crazy, especially knowing she'd wanted him. I have no idea what she's been up to, okay? 
his father raised an eyebrow. A little touchy, are we? Drake grimaced. His dad was playing him. He should have kept his mouth shut, but he allowed his father to see the effect she was having on him instead. Cheney is leaving Dragon Lulin. Good for her. He pressed his lips together in irritation. Thanks a lot, Dad. Rain pelted the windows. Excitement filled his father's eyes. Now that Cheney's not working for you, you can make your move. I'm not making any moves. Cheney wasn't trying to manipulate him, but Drake wouldn't give her what she wanted, a fantasy, only to have her walk out the door six months later. If she lasted that long. You know women. They always take off eventually. Not all women. Only the ones who count, like mom. Oh, son. His father shook his head. Your mother, God rest her soul, left a bad marriage. Not you. The reasons don't matter. You said it was best to keep the past in the past. I was wrong. Regret filled his father's voice. Dad, you've always done your best. With you, not your mother. A faraway look filled his father's eyes. When I met her, it was an exciting, wild time. I was older and should have known better, but I got caught up in the whirlwind of emotions, too. We eloped without a thought to the future or that we came from different worlds. Turns out, she wasn't strong enough to deal with the life she'd married into, and I wasn't responsible enough to support a family. We were both at fault. Not just her. She's the one who left. Yes, except. You're too young to remember, but there was a time I didn't come home, he said. The only reason the marriage lasted as long as it did was because of you. I thought about trying to make a go of it again, but I decided not to when your mother said she wanted to return home and start over with a clean slate. She was better off with her family than me. We were her family. For a time, yes, his father agreed. But your mother came for money. Being poor and in love was a romantic notion, but the reality was much harsher. Emotionally, she wasn't strong enough to endure poverty. And physically, a piece of her died when she walked away from her family to marry me and then again when she left us to return to them. I believe she never recovered from that. Drake's mom had died from pneumonia after catching the flu. A private investigator had told him that years ago. She could have reached out. Sent a card or called. I'm sure her family convinced her not to contact you. They still hate me for stealing their little girl. You loved her. The words shot from Drake's mouth. I did. A part of me will always love your mom because she gave me you. His father smiled warmly at him. You, son, are my family. All I have ever wanted, and that's why I never regretted loving or marrying her. Elliot appeared from under the desk and brushed against Drake's leg. She was a beautiful woman, but your mother didn't know how to face challenges. Obstacles stopped her dead in her tracks, and she relied too much on others for help, his dad continued. She wasn't the woman Cheney is. You don't know Cheney all that well. No, but you've spoken about her enough, and I've seen her in action here on the island, his dad said with no hesitation. She seems like a special woman. A keeper. A keeper? His father nodded. When you find one of those, you should hold on tight and not let go. Was mom a keeper? I hope she was, but it turned out she wasn't. Emotion crossed his face. Your mother and I shared something precious for a time. I'd hate for you to lose your chance at experiencing that because you're too scared. A pressure built in Drake's chest, threatening to explode. I'm scared, right? It takes two people to screw things up, son. Just look at your mother and me. His dad spoke in a matter-of-fact tone. And it takes two people to make things work. I tried to make it work with Cheney. She was the one leaving, all in the name of, love. Drake set his jaw. Did you now? He nodded. She wasn't interested in what I was offering. Tell me what you offered her. A job. A job, you say? His father laughed, much to Drake's annoyance. I hear that's a sure way to win a woman's heart. 
Drake gritted his teeth. I wasn't trying to win Cheney's heart. Then why are you so upset, stalking around here like a caged tiger ready to bite whoever comes near? He didn't, couldn't, answer. You know, son, hiring another associate producer will be easy. His dad picked up a meowing Elliot. But finding one who looks as good as Cheney in a swimsuit may be a challenge. The next day, patches of blue poked through the steely gray sky. The airport would reopen later tonight. Cheney and the crew could finally fly home tomorrow. But she didn't feel any relief packing her suitcase. No boyfriend. No job. No prospects. This latest turn of events would thrill Simone. Except, Cheney no longer cared what her sister thought. She wondered why she had in the first place. Others' thoughts and opinions didn't matter because they had nothing to do with who she was. That was all on her. She folded a pair of shorts and placed them in the suitcase. So what if she found herself in a similar position to where she'd been two years ago after Tyler dumped her? This time was different. Back then, she'd been more embarrassed than heartbroken because she hadn't loved him. With Drake, she loved him. She'd taken a chance and lost, but she'd experienced love, real love. Loving someone was a good thing, even if it hurt. She'd taken a step in the right direction. Loving Drake showed Cheney what she wanted, no, needed. She wouldn't settle for being loved for what she did. She wanted to be loved for who she was. Granted, she might not gamble on love again for a while, but she would. Someday. Cheney wouldn't give up on the love she wanted and the respect she deserved. Somewhere out there was a man who wasn't afraid to love. He wouldn't hide behind a fat bank account and dole out dollar bills and job perks as if they were kisses. I've given you everything you asked for, everything I have to give. Not everything. Not his heart. Her splintered more. All she had to do was hold herself together until she arrived home. Cheney closed her suitcase and locked it. The other items would fit in her carry-on bag. Tomorrow was a new day. The storm had passed and the blue sky had reappeared finally. It would be a new beginning for her. But tonight she had a party to attend, and she would enjoy herself at the wrap party. She'd earned it. At Lover's Lagoon, Drake cleared storm debris. Sweat ran down his back, reminding him of when he was a kid and earned money doing yard work for neighbors. He enjoyed the physical labor. It felt good using his muscles this way after being cooped up in the house while the winds raged. He pulled a palm frond from the water and tossed it onto the ground. Cheney had stood in this spot and told him she wanted more. He skimmed the water with a net, scooping out leaves. More. Cheney had attempted to dictate the terms of their relationship by telling him what she wanted and what she would accept. She should have done that with her family to get the love she desperately craved from. I want to be loved, not bought. I want your heart, not things. I want you. Her words echoed in his head. She wanted him. She wanted his love. And he wanted. Her. Not as his associate producer. Not as his employee. Not as anything other than his love. Love. The realization hit like Cupid's arrow to his heart. She'd spelled out her wants and her feelings, opening herself up to him, taking a risk, and getting hurt. Drake hadn't listened. He hadn't wanted to listen because her words, the emotions behind them, had made him vulnerable. Afraid. He sat on a rock. He'd spent his entire career, practically his whole life, taking risks to reap the rewards. But taking a chance on love. The odds weren't in his favor. It takes two people to screw things up, son. And it takes two people to make things work. He'd never done that kind of work. That kind of work didn't carry a guarantee of success or a material payoff, which frightened him. That kind of work wasn't about keeping score. Except. He stood and tossed the net onto the ground. His father had been correct. Cheney Sullivan was a keeper. A future with her would be the biggest reward of them all. And that was what he wanted. 
her, her love, everything she had to give. Drake hadn't been able to see it before, but like the storm that had passed leaving blue skies and calm waters in its wake, so had his blindness to the situation. Stepping over branches and palm fronds, he made his way to the trail. Cheney hadn't wanted to leave him. She'd wanted to stay with him. Not because of what he could do for her or give her, but because she loved him. He'd been too scared to accept it. Accept her. No longer. Drake would show Cheney he felt the same way and hope her feelings for him hadn't changed. He would show her he could risk as much as she had and be as brave as she'd been. That he could give her what she wanted. The fantasy. Even a happily ever after. And he would. Drake just needed help to pull it off. And he knew who to call. Jogging down the trail, he dialed his father's cell phone. Dad, I need you to do something for me. Chapter 20 A million stars twinkled, and a half-moon lit the night sky above the island. To the completion of another successful season. Milt raised his flute of champagne. May the billionaire's playground be our playground for many years to come. Cheney lifted her glass along with the rest of the crew seated at the table on the deck. The only person missing from the rap party was Drake. No one knew where he was, which was strange. Reese had told them his son had left the island but would return later. Later. Just like the final night at the castle, but her days of sharing cookies and milk and conversation with him were over. Everything was. Cheney took a deep breath. She needed to hold herself together. A gentle wind blew off the water, carrying the scent of the sea. The flames of the surrounding torchlights danced, casting shadows on faces. Hurricane glasses protected the lighted candles on the table, illuminating the food and adding to the atmosphere of the tropical paradise. Everything appeared normal. To everyone else, tonight was business as usual, but not for her. Cheney hoped she found her new normal soon. As she sipped the champagne, the bubbles tickled her nose. This time tomorrow, she'd be in Los Angeles. If not for the storm, she would be there now. She would have said goodbye to the crew, Reese, Elliot, and Drake. At the thought of leaving the island, her stomach churned. Going home held no appeal. Cheney enjoyed being here. She glanced around the table at the people she'd gotten to know over the past month. Staying awake during middle-of-the-night shots, trudging through lousy weather or terrain to reach the perfect location, putting out fires, both figurative and real ones, and having a good time when the long hours were over for the day had brought them all closer. She might not be happy about the way things turned out with Drake in her personal life, but professionally, she couldn't have asked for a better job. If all went well, the experience would help her find a new position on a different show. And if it didn't? No, she wouldn't go there. Not yet, anyway. Thank you all for showing me the ropes, Cheney said, her throat dry. Even though she hadn't been part of the show long, the crew had accepted her and become her friends. Taping four episodes with you guys taught me more about television than working two years in the finance department. They probably paid you better in finance, Tony joked. Russell nodded. And didn't force you to wear a low-cut, tight-fitting medieval gown. Or capture every minute on tape in hopes of a wardrobe malfunction, she teased back. Laughter filled the air. Cheney joined in, but she felt as if she were walking along a narrow edge, trying to balance the fun of the rap party with her broken heart. I wish I could intern again next year. Jessie blinked back tears. The young woman had been sad all day. This is the best job ever. The longing in her voice reminded Cheney of her internship five years ago. She'd left London disillusioned and in a rush, eager to prove herself. This time, however, had been different. Through her job, she'd found herself and knew what she wanted. No more rushing. No more having to prove herself or anything else. She'd come full circle. Your internship is only the beginning of your career, she said, hoping to provide Jessie with some perspective. It's the first of many jobs. Liz nodded. Who knows, Jessie? You might work for the Dragon Channel permanently someday. 
just like Cheney. That would be so wonderful. Jessie sighed. Her gaze focused on the empty chair at the table. I hope I get to say goodbye to Mr. Lulin. Drake told me he'd be back. He will be, Milt said with confidence. Though he'd better have a solid excuse for missing this party. Or a good story, Tony joked. Jessie smiled, seemingly appeased. Cheney had avoided Drake, for days, to make things easier on both of them. Now, she wasn't sure what she wanted to say to him. Thanks for the job, but it sucks, you broke my heart and dashed my dreams again. Still, have a nice life. Perhaps a simple goodbye would suffice, or, better yet, not a word, but a wave as she left. To be honest, the thought of saying anything to him shattered her. His not being here tonight was for the best. She sipped from her glass. The cold water refreshed her dry throat. Cicadas chirped. Below them, waves rolled to shore. Another delicious smelling course arrived, a medley of fresh seafood with a cream sauce, carried by the ever amenable wait staff. As people finished eating, Tony stood and then readjusted a camera he'd set up by the table. Why are you filming? Cheney asked. Milt wants some tape from tonight. It's for the network. Maybe outtakes if they put the show out on DVD, she offered. That could be it. He returned to his seat. A different noise caught her attention. Not insects. A helicopter. Drake. Her muscles nodded. She closed her eyes, mustering courage and strength to survive his appearance without making a scene. The sound of the rotors grew louder, drew closer. The helicopter appeared over a rise on its approach to the helipad. Jessie straightened in her chair, before smoothing her hair. That must be Mr. Lulin. Milt nodded. He'll be here as soon as he can. Raw and jagged pain sliced through Cheney at the thought of seeing Drake. The only thing left for them to do was say goodbye, forever. It was what she needed to do. The only thing she could do. And would. She blew out a breath. Tony returned to the camera. Another breeze rustled the palms. Would the sound of that always remind her of this island and Drake? She wasn't sure she wanted to know the answer. Someone touched Cheney's shoulder, and she looked over. Maybe we could get together when we're in L.A., Liz suggested. Go shopping. Have coffee. Try to meet some nice guys. Cheney liked Liz and could see them being friends outside of work. I'd like that a lot. Liz grinned. I'll be in touch once we're home. Sounds great. And it did. Cheney needed new friends to go along with her new self. The breeze picked up, blowing through the fronds and bushes. A light floral fragrance hung on the air, reminding Cheney of the flowers Drake had sent her. Ugh. She wanted to stop thinking about him. Distance would help. At least, she hoped so. Something clicked. She glanced around but couldn't tell what it might have been. Reese's big grin, however, took years off his face. Music played. The speakers must be hidden somewhere, most likely in the bushes. The melody sounded vaguely familiar. She listened closer. Oh, no. Apprehension coursed through her. It was the song she and Drake had danced to at Gemma's Halloween party. Cheney shifted in her seat before clutching the cloth napkin on her lap. No big deal. Isn't this a UB40 song? Kyle asked. Elvis sang it first, Milt said. Jesse's eyes widened. Elvis Costello? Milt shook his head. Kids these days. Cheney tried not to listen to the lyrics, but she couldn't help herself. As each word slammed into her, grief tore at her heart. She swallowed around the lump in her throat. Cheney, Drake said from somewhere, behind her. She inhaled deeply before glancing over her shoulder. He wore khaki pants and a navy polo shirt. Nothing fancy, but he appeared photoshoot ready. The tenderness in his eyes squeezed her already aching heart. They're playing our song. He extended his arm. May I please have this dance? 
Each beat of her heart, each breath, pummeled her. Frustration welled inside because she wanted to dance with him. Even knowing he could never give her what she wanted, Cheney still wanted him. Yet she remained frozen in her chair, unable to move. Go on, Liz urged. It's not every day you get to dance with a billionaire. The rest of the table encouraged Cheney. Jessie motioned her forward with her hands. Go dance with him, or I will. Torn by conflicting emotions, Cheney hesitated. None of the people egging her on knew the significance of this song. Only her, and... Drake. She couldn't believe he was trying to hurt her on purpose. Please. His dark eyes implored her. One dance. Like their one kiss? She couldn't help but be cynical. Tony pulled out her chair. Don't disappoint the boss. The boss had already disappointed her. Feeling utterly miserable, she rose and went toward Drake. She positioned herself between his feet, placed one hand on his shoulder, and the other in his hand. His familiar scent surrounded her, affecting her more than the champagne she'd drunk. This time, no armor separated them, only air and fabric. Much too thin fabric. As Drake took the first step, his thighs brushed against hers. Cheney could barely breathe. Being so close to him, touching him was difficult for her to handle. Her heart was breaking even more. Something she hadn't thought possible. I can't do this, she whispered. Yes, you can. He led her around the deck, as smoothly and effortlessly as before, only this time her feet didn't cooperate. She stumbled and missed steps, but he didn't allow her clumsiness to stop him. He continued dancing as if she were Ginger Rogers and he Fred Astaire. Cheney tried to regain control by pretending she was with someone else. She stared at the moon's reflection on the water, anything to keep from looking at Drake. That helped. She might survive the dance without tripping or losing it. I should have listened closer to the song's lyrics the first time we danced together, Drake whispered. She hated how good his warm breath felt against her neck. Why is that? Because despite my efforts, to the contrary, I couldn't help myself from falling in love with you. Cheney's gaze snapped to his. It's true. He gazed into her eyes. I love you, Cheney. Her heart reeled. She'd longed to hear those words from him. Only from him. He loved her. She had to be dreaming, a fairy tale of a dream with a handsome prince. If that was the case, she never wanted to wake up. You are the one who read my number, he continued. Who saw me, the real me, not just the billionaire, seeking his next playground. You didn't want to be my employee. You wanted to be my equal, my partner, and that scared me. You don't seem scared now. I'm terrified. The vulnerability in his eyes tugged at her heart. She'd felt that way herself, but no more holding back and playing it safe. It was time to leap. Will you feel better if I say I love you, too? His expression of relief answered her. It's true, she admitted. I love you, Drake. A wide grin lit up his entire face. I'll want to hear you say that over and over again. She wanted to believe, but. Is that an order? A request. He spoke fast. No more orders. I don't want to be your boss. Tingle shot through her. I can live with that. Good. He spun her around the deck. You're the most amazing, intelligent, beautiful woman, Cheney. You don't let me do what's comfortable. I can't control you the way I do everyone else. You demand more from me and won't settle for what I can do or buy for you. And? She listened, tongue-tied but thrilled. It's what I needed. Need. The love in his eyes brought a sigh to her heart. You challenge me to be a better man. I'm sorry for letting you down, disappointing you, but I would be grateful for a second chance. His words reassured her and erased her doubts. Cheney forced herself to breathe. A second chance sounds wonderful to me, but you have to know I let you down, too. You showed me what I needed. You made me want to be more and have more. 
There's nothing wrong with that, darling. Except I took all you had to give. It was all about me. We kept talking about quid pro quo, but I didn't consider you or your needs. He ran his finger along the line of her jaw. My father told me it takes two people to screw things up. And it takes two people to make it, us, work. We'll both have to work at this. I'm game. Me, too. The pitter-patter of her heart seemed to sing its own love song. The only thing I need is you. Affection gleamed in Drake's eyes. I need you in my life, Cheney. I'll do whatever it takes to make it work. If you'll have me. Her heart soared. Love is always a gamble, but someone once told me you can't win if you don't play. I wonder what fool said that, he teased. The fool who's ready to rush in? That would be me. Laughter spilled out. And me, too. I thought I needed everything laid out, all neat and tidy, before I could give my heart. But all I need is to be loved, loved for who I am. No conditions, no qualifications, no expectations. Sounds good to me. He spun her around again. I love you, Cheney Sullivan. I love you, Drake Lulin. Joy flowed through her. Five years ago, I had a crush on you, but even then, I'd wanted you to be my Prince Charming. And now I know for certain you're my one true love. And you're mine. My dad said you were a keeper, and he's right. He kissed her until her knees went weak. Applause sounded. Cheney blushed. I forgot we weren't alone. Me, too. Drake focused his attention on her. But in a few minutes, they'll be preoccupied if my father pulls off his second assignment for the evening. Your father? You told me to ask for help the next time I needed it, so I asked him. A satisfying feeling settled over her. I saw your dad right before the music played. Turning on the sound system was his first task tonight, Drake said. You'll have to wait for the second. No hints? His smile crinkled the corners of his eyes. It's a surprise. Coming from you, that could mean anything. You know me too well. She touched his face. And you me. The song, their song, ended. The crew applauded once again. Milt and Tony didn't look surprised, but everyone else did. Surprised, but happy. Not as happy as Cheney, though. She was floating and didn't care if her feet touched the ground again. I guess this means we have to postpone getting together if you won't be heading back to L.A. Liz raised her glass to them. But when we meet up, we'll limit our outing to shopping and coffee since you found a nice guy. Cheney looked at Drake. They had said they loved each other, but she didn't know if that meant a long-distance relationship or what. He'd swept her off her feet. She was taking a risk. Okay, the biggest gamble of her life. But without a doubt, this was the right thing, the only thing, to do. She was following her heart. Drake's love was enough for her. Do you want me to stay or go home or? You are home. He knelt next to her, to the delighted gasps of everyone. Five years ago, I asked you to stay with me. I don't blame you for saying no then, given the offer I made, but I'm asking you again. Stay with me. Not as my employee, not as my girlfriend, but as my wife. I love you, and I don't want to let you go. Cheney blinked. A tumble of emotions, shock, joy, anticipation, love, ran through her. She forced herself to breathe. He took her trembling hand. Cheney Sullivan, will you marry me? She stared at him through the tears of happiness in her eyes. Yes, yes, I'll marry you. The crew hooped, cheered, and clapped. My heart is yours. Only yours. Drake removed a diamond solitaire engagement ring from his pocket and placed it on her finger. A perfect fit. It always will be. And mine yours. Cheney had found the love she'd dreamed of finding. A peace settled around her heart. This ring. Is that why you left the island today? As he stood, he nodded. I wanted you to have the whole fairy tale. 
she stared at the beautiful diamond. Thanks. It's stunning, but please know, as long as I have you, I'll have everything I ever need. Something whooshed up into the air and exploded over the water. Colorful fireworks lit up the black sky. The crew oohed and awed. Surprise, Cheney, he whispered into her ear. Life with him would always be full of risks and surprises. She couldn't wait. Thank you. She rose on tiptoe and kissed him on the lips. And your father, too. Drake kissed her again, a slow kiss full of love, the joy of today, and the promise of tomorrow. Fireworks exploded. She grinned. You were that confident I'd say yes? Hopeful. He touched her dimple with his fingertip. If you said no, I figured I might as well go down in flames for all to see. What happened to the man who prefers better odds? He realized he could be safe and have everything in the world except for what he really wanted, what he really needed, or he could risk it and have it all. You play to win. This time, I won the biggest and the best prize of them all. He kissed the top of her head. And one who isn't allergic to animals. Elliot will want a lot of siblings. Four-footed and two-footed ones. No snakes allowed. I love you, Drake. Her heart was ready to burst with happiness. You're a dragon, knight, beast, and prince charming all rolled up into one. You claim not to be adventurous, but you're braver than me, my love. That's because you made me want to be brave. She noticed Tony taping the sky. Now I see why you wanted a camera set up. It's part of the episode, Drake said. And I know the title. She leaned into him, soaking up his strength, his warmth, and his love. What's that? Laughter lit the gold flecks in his eyes. The billionaire's proposal. Epilogue. Six months later. At Lover's Lagoon, Cheney stretched out on the chaise lounge. She'd lost all sense of time, but the sun sinking lower in the sky told her dinner would arrive soon. That must be why Drake had hiked to the beach. Not that she was hungry. The bungalow's kitchen had their favorite snacks, including a freezer full of ice cream. A good thing calories didn't count on honeymoons. At least that was what Jem had said. Grinning, Cheney held out her left hand to admire the engagement ring and diamond-encrusted wedding band. Colorful prisms reflected on the water, the bungalow, and the plants. Mrs. Drake Lulin. Dreams do come true. Hers had, and based on what her husband had said, so had his. As water cascaded over rocks into the nearby pool, a bird sang a sweet tune. Both provided a beautiful soundtrack to the lovely lagoon. Contentment settled over her. The way it had for months, but two days ago, Everything had fallen into place when she and Drake exchanged vows and said, I do. The wedding was an intimate affair, with bare feet, more flowers than she ever imagined, a decadent, delicious chocolate cake, and a limited guest list, her parents, Reese, Gemma, Oliver, baby Silas, Milt and his wife, Liz, and Tony. Of course, Elliot had been there, too. Most were still on the island for an extended vacation, courtesy of Drake. After they'd announced their engagement, Simone had made snide comments about how the wedding would never happen. She said Cheney wasn't good enough for a man like Drake, so expect to be dumped again. Even after their parents intervened, Simone wouldn't stop. She went as far as to imply Cheney would lose her new job as an associate producer when they broke up. Cheney didn't want her sister and brother-in-law at the wedding, and Drake supported her 100%. Her mom and dad weren't happy, but they understood and accepted her decision. Something rustled nearby. Hello? she asked. Drake appeared between the unlit torchlights on each side of the path. He wore shorts and flip-flops and carried dinner and a present wrapped in silver foil and tied with a white bow. Food and a gift from Tony. Tony had brought a camera to the wedding. She wiggled her toes. I wonder if it's our ceremony. He could have emailed it. True. She stood. Let's see what it is. Drake glanced at the food in his hands. What about dinner? We can do both. 
He laughed, the sound wrapping around her heart like a warm hug. I love how you multitask. You love everything about me, she teased. I do. He headed toward the bungalow. And I love you more each day we're together. The feeling was mutual. That gave Cheney an idea. How about we skip dinner and go straight to dessert? He glanced over his shoulder. That sounds like one of my lines. In fact, I believe I have said that. Last night. She followed him inside. It was a great suggestion then, too. And now, but we need to eat something besides sweets, or we'll offend the chef. Fine. She helped him set up the meal on the dining table. But I want an extra dessert tonight. There's plenty of ice cream. She flashed him her most charming smile. I meant you. I'm completely on board with that, Mrs. Lulin. Thank you, Mr. Lulin. After plating the food, they sat. Cheney handed him the gift. Open it. He positioned the present between them. Let's open it together. And they did. Inside was a tablet with a note that read Push Play. Drake did. A video of the two of them at Abbotsford Castle appeared. That's from the first night. Cheney recognized what she was wearing and his armor. I don't remember Tony or Kyle filming behind the scenes. Me, either. Drake's gaze narrowed. We keep staring at each other. I thought I was more subtle. Me, too. He raised her hand to his mouth and kissed it. We wasted time fighting our attraction. She nodded. Yes, but we have the rest of our lives to be together now. The video showed them at different locations at the castle and also in London at Gemma's Halloween party. As they danced, the chemistry sizzled between them. Drake raised his wine glass. To my beloved Guinevere. As Cheney tapped her glass to his, the chime hung in the air. I'm still crushing on Lancelot. Next came a shot of them in Gemma's backyard. Someone had filmed them through the window. Cheney's lips parted. Our first kiss. I thought it would be our last. He set his glass on the table and held her hand. I'm relieved I was wrong about that. Me, too. They came together for a brief kiss until the sound of waves separated them. She stared in disbelief at what the camera had captured between her and Drake. This is from the final episode of the season. We appear to have had a stalker in the shadows. The two of them appeared at Lover's Lagoon. That was when they knew who the cameraman, rather, culprit, was. Tony, they said at the same time. Questions sprang to her mind, but she wanted to watch the video. She had a feeling what was coming, Drake's proposal, and the fireworks. The video didn't disappoint Cheney. I remember the camera at the rap party. Me, too. Seeing Drake on his knee, professing his love, and asking her to marry him sent tingles shooting through her. I'll never forget that night. And now we can watch it whenever we wish. As she nodded, the beach with an arch covered with flowers came into view. Watching the wedding ceremony from this point of view brought tears to her eyes. This is the best gift ever. He squeezed her hand. You're the best, but this is a close second. Third, she corrected. After Elliot. They both laughed. Scenes from the reception, including dancing to their song and cutting the cake played. And then Tony and Milt appeared on the screen. Congrats, you too, Tony said, a big loopy grin on his face. When I noticed the sparks flying between you at the castle, I taped some footage. After I saw it, I told him to keep it up, because watching the two of you fall in love is ratings gold. Milt laughed. Which means we have enough for a segment of the show. Maybe even an entire special episode, if you two agree. If not, and we understand if you want to keep this private, you'll have this to look back on and show your kids, Tony said without missing a beat. Milt nodded. Think about it while you're on your honeymoon. And don't do anything I wouldn't do. Tony winked. The screen went blank. Wow. Heart pounding, she stared at the tablet. 
watching that made me fall in love with you all over again. I'm so glad we have that video. Drake pulled her closer to him. Same here. Milt's right, she admitted. It's ratings, gold. Yes. The show brought us together again, but let's wait until we're in London before deciding. She nodded and then brushed her lips over his. You know what this means? His brows furrowed. What? It's time for our first dessert. A second will follow. He kissed her. How did I get along without you? I have no idea. She kissed him. But now you're stuck with me. Happily. Cheney rested her forehead against his. Happily ever after. Thank you for listening to The Boss. A Keeper at Heart Romance, Book 3. Written by Melissa McClone. Text Copyright 2020 by Melissa McClone. Production Copyright 2023 by Melissa McClone.